This is Audible. Highbridge, a division of recorded books, presents The Dark Angel, The Complete Tales of Jules de Grandin, Volume 3, by Seabury Quinn, read by Paul Woodson. The Ghost Helper No, my friend, I mean it, Jules de Grandin persisted. You Americans are a gloomy people. Even in your pleasures, you are melancholy. I grinned at him despite myself. The Chez Pontoufle Doré certainly showed no signs of melancholia which I could see. Waiters scurried here and there between the rows of softly illuminated tables. The air was heavy with the odor of well-cooked food, warm, perfumed woman flesh, and the smoke of excellent tobacco. The muted clatter of china and table silver mingled with the hum of conversation, lilting flirtatious laughter, and the syncopated overtone of the jazz band's throbbing appeal to elemental passion. Not much evidence of gloom here, is there? I queried, attacking the Welsh rabbit the waiter placed before me and decanting a mugful of illegal but most enjoyable ale. But yes, he nodded, that is what I mean précisément. "'Observe these people. They are typical. "'How is it your popular song says, "'I dance with the tear in my eye? "'That is it. "'The gaiety is forced, unnatural. "'They are like a group of pole-bearers "'telling each other funny stories "'while they ride to the cemetery, "'like little boys whistling to tell themselves "'how brave they are "'as they walk quick past the graveyard after dark. "'See us,' they say. "'We are devils of fellows, "'gay, carefree, debonair. We care for nothing, we fear nothing. But always they look fearfully across their shoulders, and always in the shadows behind they see the hovering, disapproving ghosts of Calvin, Knox, and Wesley, of Cotton Mather and William Jennings Bryan. So they are triste. Yes. Take those ones by example. He nodded to the tenants of a table somewhat to our left. C'est un couple bien assorti, n'est-ce pas? They should have every mark of happiness upon them, and yet observe, is not discomfort, even fear, written in their faces? I think yes. Que diable! Is that the way of joyousness? Waiting a decent interval, I turned my head and followed his critical glance. The man was tall, slender, stoop-shouldered, and studious-looking. A perfect example of American gentleman with generations of Anglo-Saxon heritage behind him. His duplicate could be found on all our college faculties, in half our law offices and experimental laboratories, in many of the higher branches of our government departments. Calm, level-headed and efficient, but without the blatant hallmark of the go-getter on him, he showed the ideal combination of seriousness and humor, which has enabled science and the arts to keep alive amid the hustle of our new world tempo, and to find practical application in the usages of business. His companion was a sight to draw the eye in any company. Long-bodied and long-limbed in build, graceful as a panther, with a small proud head crowned with a skull-cap of close-cut hair the shade of ripened maize, long insolent eyes of darkest blue, set under almost horizontal brows of startling blackness, straight-nosed, firm-chinned, thin-lipped, her skin as white as pearl and seemingly almost transparent. She too was eloquent of breeding, but her ancestors had bred their womenfolk for physical appeal. However fine her mind might be, no man could forget her brilliant body and allure even for a moment, and though she might show gentleness at times, I knew it would be but the mildness of a cat-creature whose claws are only thinly masked in velvet paws. I took them in with one swift glance, then turned back to de Grandin. "'Why, it's Idris Breakstone and his wife,' I said. "'You know them?' "'I know him. I ought to.' I helped bring him to Harrisonville thirty-six years ago, and I'd treated his parents for five years before that. The woman I don't know. He married her out of town. She's his second wife, and— Hm? His murmured comment cut me short. And is that look, that air of malaise which he and his so charming lady display, entirely natural to them? I looked again. 
The little Frenchman was right. In both Idris's face and that of his companion there was a look of vague fear, a sort of haunted expression which a fugitive from justice might wear when strangers were about, and any moment might bring the tapping hand and grim announcement of arrest. No, I answered slowly. I don't think it is. Now you mention it, they do look ill at ease, but perhaps that one is to blame. De Gronda cast his glance beyond the breakstones table to a man sitting alone. He looks like Nemesis his twin, or Satan's. Observe how he regards the lady. Pardieu, were she a mouse and he a cat, I should not dare to undertake ensuring her life. I followed the direction of his gaze. Seated in an angle of the wall was a man of slight, boyish build, with almost feminine, delicate hands, idly toying with his watch-chain in a listless, indolent fashion. His old face, long, hard-shaven like a priest's or actor's, was in odd contrast to his youthful body, and in the aged, wrinkle-etched countenance there burned a pair of great, sorrowful eyes. Eyes like Lucifer's, as he broods upon the high estate from which he fell, which gazed steadfastly and unchangingly at the smoothly brushed blonde hair above the nape of Mrs. Breakstone's creamy neck. I shook my head and wrinkled my brow in distaste. It seemed to me that every atom of liquor-heated masculine desire in the room had been merged into the fixed, unwavering stare of those two sad, yet pitiless eyes, set in that old wicked face which topped the lithe, incongruously youthful body of the stranger. "'What do you make of him?' de Grandin prompted as I held my peace. I shook off the sort of trance which held me. For a moment I had been deaf to the café's clatter, blind to its softly glowing lights, unmindful of the food which cooled before me as a single thought desire seemed to overwhelm me, an almost uncontrollable desire to rise and cross the floor and dash my knotted fist into that old and sinful face, bruise those sorrowful, steadfast eyes, and trample that frail, boyish body underfoot. Eh? I returned, as I emerged from my fog of primordial fury like a sleeper coming out of sleep. Oh, excuse me, I was thinking... Exactement. I know your thoughts. I have the same, de Gronda answered with a laugh. But dare we give way to desire and slay that unclean-looking person? Tell me what you think of him. Is he the cause of Monsieur and Madame Breakstone's perturbation? No, I returned. I do not think so. I doubt if they realize he's here. If she did, she'd surely tell her husband. And if Idris saw him looking at his wife that way... Well, I think our impulse would be translated into action, and without much delay. The little Frenchman nodded understandingly. I agree, he told me. Come, let us eat and go, my friend. If we remain much longer, I shall most certainly do that one an injury. And I have no desire to be embroiled with the police so late at night. The numbing cold of the evening had abated somewhat, and a fine, crisp snow had fallen, covering streets and lawns with an inch or so of gleaming veneer. But the snow had ceased, and the moon had risen and silvered the sleeping city with an overlay of nacre, when the shrilling of my bedside telephone summoned me from sleep. The biting caress of the light, early morning wind, filtering through the stripped trees, made me shiver as I snatched up the instrument and growled a sleepy, Hello? Idris Breakstone speaking, Dr. Trowbridge, the caller responded. Can you come over? Muriel, my wife, she's... Uh, please hurry. This is urgent. It had better be. I murmured grimly as I reached for the clothes, which a lifetime of experience as a general practitioner had taught me to keep in order on the bedside chair, against such emergencies as this. Confounded nuisance, knocking a man out of bed like this. Why, what is it, my friend? Wrapped in a mauve silk dressing gown, purple kid slippers on his womanishly small feet, a pink and lavender muffler about his throat, Jules de Gronda appeared at the bedroom door. All trace of sleep banished from his little round blue eyes as he surveyed me with an elfish grin. 
Oh, it woke you too, eh? I countered, jamming my foot into a shoe and fumbling with the lacings. Well, misery loves company. No, I doubt it's important. It's Muriel Breakstone. The girl we saw in the nightclub, you know. Her husband just phoned and... I tied the knot of my second shoe and drew on my waistcoat and jacket. And she's probably got indigestion from too much rich food, or some of that funny liquor they serve there. Little fool, if she'd had sense enough to stick to good, wholesome beer. Await me, my old one. I hasten, I rush, I fly. De Grandin interrupted as he swung about and raced down the hall toward his room. The lady will surely not expire if you delay until I dress, and I damn think anything concerning her should interest us. Oh, undoubtedly, yes. He was dressed in less time than it took me to go to the garage for my car, and was waiting, my medicine kit beneath his arm, as I drove round to the front door. I gave him a curious sidelong glance as we swung out into the quiet, snow-muffled street. What's up? I asked. I know you can smell a mystery as far as a Scotsman can scent a bargain, but, alas, I cannot tell you with assurance, he replied. I have only what you call a hunch to go on. But this so attractive lady with her ill at ease manner, and that old young one who watched her so intently, they intrigue me. I damn think we shall hear more of them, and meantime I would keep in touch with the situation. Well, here's your chance, I interrupted as I brought the car to a halt. Here we are. The wide front door of Breakstone's house swung back as we mounted the porch steps, letting a path of warmth and lamplight stream out across the snow. Idris himself let us in and hurried us across the hall with its pavement of turf-soft rugs. It happened half an hour ago, he told us, and from the way his lips trembled and his firm deft chin quivered, we could see that panic fear was tugging at his nerves. We were out late tonight and stayed up talking after we got back. We went to bed only a little while ago, and I don't think either of us had more than just gone to sleep when... Come up and see her, gentlemen. Do what you can for her. Then I'd like to talk with you. I glanced curiously at his stooped shoulders as we followed him up the stairs. I'd known Idris from his first second of life, and this nervous, trembling, incoherent man was a stranger to me. A bando of black lace held Muriel Breakstone's smoothly shingled and marcelled blonde hair in place, and her diaphanous black lace and chiffon night robe disclosed low breasts and arms and shoulders white and dimpled as a baby's. I bent to feel her pulse, and noted with a start that it was weak and feeble. Her flesh was cold as clay, despite the double blanket of thick camel's hair and the down-filled comforter upon the bed and all along her hands and forearms there showed the tiny hummocks of her repilation. Her eyes were wide and glassy, and about her nose, where it joined the cheeks, were the faint-drawn lines of exhaustion. As I leaned forward to listen at her heart, her breath struck my cheek, cold and damp as a draught from a cellar or a mausoleum. Pain, I asked sententiously, laying my left hand palm down across her right iliac fossa and tapping its back gently with the fingers of my right. To de Grandin I muttered, Subnormal temperature, light increased pulsation, low vitality. Almost too soon for para-appendicitis, but no, the patient answered feebly, fumbling listlessly with the hem-stitched edge of the pale pink linen sheet. I'm not suffering any, only terribly frightened, doctor. Please. Her voice trailed off to an inaudible whisper, and again a light shudder ran through her while the goose flesh on her arms became more pronounced. She woke up screaming, something at her by the throat, Idris broke in. At first she was hysterical, but she's been like this since just before I called you, and— Get me an electric pad, or a hot water bottle if you haven't that, I interrupted. What do you say to Gronda? Shock? Mais oui, he agreed with a nod. I concur. External heat, a little ether, some brandy later, perhaps, then a sedative. Undoubtedly it is shock, as you say, my friend, yes. We gave our treatment quickly, 
and when the patient rested in a light, calm sleep, trooped down the stairs to the library. Now what's the cause of this? I asked as Idris preceded us into the luxurious room and switched on the lights. What did she eat at the Pantoufle Doré tonight? I'm convinced this comes from a nightmare induced by indigestion, though I'm willing to admit I found no evidences of dyspepsia. Still, Zut, my old one, we are here to listen, not to talk, de Grandin reminded. Then to Idris. You wish to speak with us, monsieur? The young man took a turn across the room, lighted a cigarette, crushed its fire out against the bottom of a cloisonné ashtray, then snapped his lighter as he set a second one aglow. Dr. Trowbridge, he began, expelling a twin column of smoke from his nostrils. Do you believe in ghosts? Eh, do I believe in— <laughs> Lord bless my soul, I answered. Monsieur, de Grandin added, despite the admonitions of the elder churchman, that man is a fool who states his implicit belief in anything. Likewise, his unqualified disbelief. We have the open mind. What is it you would tell us? Idris tossed his cigarette aside, half smoked, then mechanically lit another. He studiously avoided glancing at us as he replied slowly, I think this house is haunted. Eh? de Grandin answered sharply. Do you say it? Nonsense, I scoffed. That's just silly, boy. For one thing, the place isn't old enough. It hasn't been finished more than half a year, has it? All right, the young man answered, with a trace of dogged stubbornness in his voice. Let's put it another way. Suppose I say we, Muriel and I, are haunted. Oh, I began, but Jules de Grandin's quick reply cut through my mocking rejoinder. How is that, monsieur? We are interested. Tell us everything. There are no unconsidered trifles in cases such as this. Idris dropped into an easy chair, crossed his left knee over his right leg, then his right knee over his left lifted the top from a cigarette box and replaced it slightly awry, then straightened it with meticulous care. Do you remember Marjorie? he asked irrelevantly. Huh, I grunted. Was I likely to forget the sweet old-fashioned girl he married on his return from France, the joy I'd wished them on their wedding day, and the pang his marriage to the exotic creature lying upstairs had caused me when all my skill proved unavailing to keep Marjorie alive. Yes, I remember her, I answered shortly. And who was she? de Grandin asked, leaning slightly forward in his chair and fixing a level, unwinking stare on Idris. My wife. Ah, huh? and? Anything I say tonight is told you under the seal of your profession? Idris asked. But certainly, in strictest confidence. Say on, monsieur. Marjorie Denham and I were born within a city block and a single month of each other. Right, Dr. Trowbridge? You ought to know you officiated at both our— Get on with it, I ordered with a curt nod. You're right. We grew up together, he continued listlessly. Made mud pies together, played together. I never teased her or pulled her hair or hurt her in any way, for even as a savage little brat of a boy I was too fond of her for that. We went to school together, and I carried her books back and forth. We went to our first party together, and it was I she went out with when she wore her first long dress and put her hair up for the first time. She never had a beau. I never had a sweetheart. We weren't lovers, you see, just good, intimate friends, but each filled the other's needs for comradeship so fully that the want of other companions never seemed to enter our thoughts. I joined up early, when the war broke out, made the first train in camp, and went across in the fall of seventeen. Marjorie came round to the house to see me off, and brought me a sweater and helmet. She cried a little, and I was pretty close to tears myself. But we didn't kiss. It just didn't occur to us to me at any rate. Every mail, every mail that was delivered, that is, brought me news of home from Marjorie. They weren't love letters, just good long gossipy letters of happenings around town, and they were like visits home to me. I got it in the lungs at St. Miel when we wiped out the salient, good stiff dose of chlorine gas that almost did me in. 
It put me in hospital and a convalescent home at Biarritz for almost a year. They thought I'd turn out to be a lunger after all, but I fooled them, worse luck. It was while I was convalescing at the home I heard, through Marjorie, of course, of my parents' death. Flu sent Dad west just after the armistice, and Mother went early in nineteen. Broken heart, I guess. There are such things, you know. There wasn't any reception committee or brass band waiting at the station when I came back to Harrisonville. Everybody was too busy making money while the chance was good to care about a demobbed soldier then. And besides, no one knew I was coming, for I hadn't written. The camp surgeon's office out at Dick's didn't make up its mind to give me a discharge till the last minute, and I didn't know whether it would be Harrisonville, New Jersey, or Nogales, Arizona I'd be headed for an hour before my papers came through the personnel adjutant's office. I was in civvies, and no one seemed to notice me when I got off the train. You can't imagine how strange the town where I'd been born seemed as I stood in the station that afternoon, gentlemen. He continued, and when I realized my home was closed and no one there to welcome me, I felt like lying down and crying right there on the platform. Mon pauvre, de Grandin murmured sympathetically. Idris turned his head aside and winked his eyes several times, as though to clear them of a film of tears. There was just one place I wanted to go, one place that seemed like home, he continued, lighting a cigarette and puffing it slowly. That was our family plot in Shadow Lawns, so I jumped in a taxi and went out there. It was something after four o'clock in a November afternoon, and dusk was already settling when I walked up the drive, leading to their graves, my father's and mother's. I wanted to tell them, I'm here at last, dear old people, and maybe kneel in the grass and whisper something intimate in mother's grave. But, uh... He paused again and drew a handkerchief from the pocket of his lounging robe, dabbed unashamed at his eyes, and continued. But there was someone already there when I arrived. It was Marjorie, and she'd brought two bouquets of fresh-cut flowers, one for Mother's grave, one for Dad's. Then, gentlemen, I knew, just as Saul of Tarsus saw the light when the scales dropped from his eyes at the house of Judas in the street called Straight, I saw Marjorie as she really was. I'd always thought her a nice-looking girl with fine eyes and a clear skin, but from that moment she seemed beautiful to me. All the happiness I'd had from her companionship, all the unvarying kindness she'd shown me throughout our lives, all the dear things she'd meant to me since we were babies, suddenly came home to me as I stood beside my parents' graves that afternoon. There wasn't any formal proposal. I just opened my arms to her and said, My dear, and... I've always loved you, Idris, and I always shall, she told me as I held her in my arms, and she turned her lips up to mine, and gave and took the first kiss of her life, the first kiss she'd ever had from any man outside her family. We were married the next week, you remember, Dr. Trowbridge. Poor Marjorie. I hadn't much but love to give her. The war that made most everybody rich had ruined my father. He was an importer of aniline dyes, and war with Germany killed his business. All he left me, except a few receipted bills, was something like a hundred dollars cash and a formula he'd worked out for making dyes. He'd died just after perfecting it. They said he'd have had more chance with the flu if he hadn't weakened himself working nights in his little laboratory on that formula. I got a job, and Marjorie and I set up housekeeping. Dad's old place had been sold to pay his debts, so we started living in a three-room flat. Between times... When I wasn't working in the company's laboratory, I tried to market Dad's dye formula, but nobody seemed interested. The German patents had been sequestered anyway, and with the treaty signed, new importations were coming in from Europe, so no one had much time for homemade products in the dye industry. Then the baby, little Bobby named for Dad, you know, came and we had it harder than ever. Marjorie, God rest her soul, even took in sewing to help ends meet, but well, you know what happened, Dr. Trowbridge. Tuberculosis wouldn't touch these gas-burned lungs of mine, but it fastened on my wife like a wolf upon a lamb. Sending her away was out of the question. We didn't have car fare to take us west of Camden. Marjorie wouldn't hear of leaving me anyway. 
We've waited so long for each other, Idris, she told me. Please let me have you till the last moment. We'd been married with a double ring ceremony, and on the inside of her ring and mine was engraved forever. A few days before she died, she asked me, Idris, dear, you'll always love me, always love me more than anyone, and never, never forget me. I could hardly answer for the sobs that filled my throat, but I put my lip against her ear and told her, Always, dear love, always and forever. You know what happened, Dr. Trowbridge. All my love and all hers and all your years of experience couldn't keep her. So she left me, and her last words were, Promise you'll remember, Idris. The irony of it. Marjorie had hardly been buried in the Breakstone plot. Certainly the funeral bill was nowhere near paid when I struck it. The Clavender Company, that had turned me down cold two years before, bid in my patent formula and gave me such a royalty contract as I'd never had the nerve to think of asking. I've had more money than I've known what to do with ever since. And when Bobby grows up, he'll be one of the richest young men in the state. And half, a tenth, a twentieth of the money I get for doing nothing every half year now would have kept her with me. I haven't known what to do with either my money or myself these last few years. I've given away more than I ever hoped to own, splashed it around like dishwater, squandered it. Still, it kept coming in faster than I could spend it. I bought a hundred thousand shares of Wildcat mining stock at two dollars. The stuff looked so worthless it wouldn't even do for wallpaper. I forgot it, but it didn't forget me. Within a year it shot up to a hundred, and of course I sold. Next month the bottom fell out and the stock became utterly worthless, but I'd made a fortune in it. That's the sort of luck I've had, now that it doesn't matter any more. Last winter I met Muriel Maidstone on a Mediterranean cruise. You've seen her, you know her appeal. I was lonesome as Lucifer cast out of heaven. And, uh, well, we were married, that's that. It wasn't long before I realized what a fool I'd been. She came from a good southern family. Poor as church mice, like so many old families with fine traditions and scarcely any money to carry them on, they'd come to worship wealth as deity. The mere possession of money seemed to them, and her, an end in itself. Wealth was its own justification, and luxury the only thing worthwhile. A racketeer with unlimited money at his disposal was greater in their estimation than Galileo and Darwin and Huxley altogether. Fool! I married her because she set my blood on fire and stole my thought and made me forget the emptiness of life with her Circe lure. I learned later I could have had all she had to give, to sell, rather, without the formality of marriage, provided I'd been willing to pay enough. It was for that I took off the little, cheap, plain gold ring with forever written in it that Marjorie had put upon my finger when we married. God pity me. I said money was Muriel's gold, but that's only half the truth. Money's first, of course, but power's a close second. When her arms are round a man, she can make him swear his soul away and never know it. And she loves to use that power. She kept at me everlastingly, making me vow my love for her, swear I loved her more than anything. Finally, declare I loved her above everything in this world or the next. I haven't had a moment's peace since I took that perjured oath. My conscience has tormented me unceasingly, for I've felt I've been untrue to Marjorie. And Marjorie knows. I felt her near me, felt her presence, just as I used to in the old, poor, happy days together, while I shave or dress or sit here reading in the library, and Muriel's felt it too. She says the house is spooky and uncanny and wants to sell it, but she feels a queer pursued sensation even when she's away. It's always with her. It's almost always with me. Muriel hasn't much use for Bobby, you know. She hardly ever sees him and never speaks a word to him when she can avoid it. Two nights ago we went out, and though I didn't know it, she gave the servants the night off. Bobby was left here alone. I was nearly frantic with remorse when we got back and rushed up to the nursery to apologize to him and say I hadn't realized he was deserted that way. Oh, that's all right, Daddy, he answered. Mother's been here. She often is. No amount of argument could make him change his story. I tried to tell him Mother was in heaven 
and folks up there don't come back to earth. But he persisted. She comes to see me nearly every night, he said. Sometimes she holds me in her lap and sings to me. Sometimes she just sits by the bed and holds my hand until I go to sleep. One time a noise outside frightened me, and I cried, and she bent over me and smoothed my hair and kissed me and told me, Don't be afraid, Bobby comes. Mother won't ever let anything hurt you. Anything or anyone. I didn't tell you this upstairs. I couldn't. But tonight, when we came home from the theater and the supper club, Bobby was restless. He called me several times, and finally I went into the nursery and sat with him. Muriel was furious. She called me once or twice, then came after me. When Bobby protested at my leaving, she slapped his face. An hour later, she woke up screaming something had her by the throat, went into hysterics, then fell into that semi-coma in which you found her. No, Dr. Trowbridge, he concluded. It wasn't anything she'd eaten that caused that nightmare fright. I know what, who it was. So does Muriel. I forbore to look at Idris. Obviously the youngster was convinced of everything he told us, and to remonstrate with him would have been as unkind as arguing a child out of his belief in Santa Claus. Jules de Grandin suffered no such reticence. What you tell us is entirely credible, my friend, he assured young Breakstone. As to any dereliction of faith on your part, do not reproach yourself too harshly. The weakness of men where women are concerned is equaled only by the weakness of women where men are involved. Madame, your ci devant wife, she understands and makes allowances, I am sure. Love may transcend death, but jealousy? I do not think so, for perfect understanding and jealousy cannot exist together. No. The next day was a busy one for me. The customary gluttony attendant on the Christmas season produced its usual results, and I nearly suffered writer's cramp, penning prescriptions for bismuth salicylate and magnesium calcinate. I was dog-tired by dinner-time and ready for bed at nine. How long I lay in the quiet slumber of exhaustion I do not know, but that I sat bolt upright in my bed, all vestiges of sleep departed, I well remember. I had not dreamed. I know that, yet through the muffling curtains of sleep I had distinctly heard a voice which called me by name to rise and dress and go somewhere, although the destination was not plain. Now that I was awake the summons still persisted, though it was no longer an actual oral order, but rather a voice heard inside my head, as one is conscious of the phrasing of a thought or of that subjective sound of ringing bells in the ears which follows an overdose of quinine. What? I asked, as though an actual voice addressed me. Eh, you have heard it too? De Grandin's query came from the darkened hall. Then it is an actuality. What do you mean? I asked, snapping on the bedside light and blinking at him. A moment hence, he replied. I woke from sleep with the strong impression that someone, a woman by the voice, called me and urgently requested that I proceed forthwith to 195 Light Street. Is there perhaps such an address? Oh, yes, I answered. There's such a number, and it's a pretty shabby neighborhood, too, but— And did you wake in similar circumstances? he interrupted. Yes, I did, I admitted. But then there are no buts, my friend. Come, let us go. Go? Where? Where in Satan's name but to that Light Street address? He returned. Come, make haste. We must hurry. Grumbling, I heaved myself from the bed and began to don my clothes, the little Frenchman's admonitions to speed ringing in my ears. Light Street, as I had told him, was a shabby neighborhood. Once, years ago, it had been fashionable. Now it was like an old duchess in poverty. Drab, Dismal rows of shabby old houses faced it north and south, their broken windows and weather-scarred, almost paintless doors like roomy eyes and broken teeth in old and hopeless faces. Damp, bleak winds blew through the narrow thoroughfare from the bay, bearing a freight of dust and tattered newspapers and the heavy, unwholesome smell of coarse and poorly cooked food.
the cheap boarding-house smell, redolent of human misery and degradation as the feeder from a jail or madhouse. Before the old decrepit houses stood low, rust-bitten iron fences enclosing little yards once used as gardens, but barren of any vegetation save the hardiest of weeds for many years. Somehow they reminded me of the little fences one sometimes sees about old, neglected graves in country churchyards. Of all the melancholy houses in the melancholy, shabby genteel street, 195 seemed most wretched. A small, fly-specked sign displayed behind the cracked panes of its French windows advised the passer-by that lodgers were accommodated there, and a flickering gas flame burned anemically in the shelter of a cracked red-glass globe in the shabby hall behind the shabby vestibule. We halted before the decrepit gate while de Grandin viewed the place reflectively. Of all the crazy, crack-brained things— I began indignantly, but he cut me short with a quick gesture. A light burns yonder, he whispered. Let us investigate. Fearing the rusty hinges of the gate might give warning of our entrance, we stepped across the yard's iron fence and tiptoed toward the tall windows which lighted the English basement. Shades were lowered behind the panes, but a wrinkle in the linen made a tiny opening at one side, through which one might look into the room by applying his eye to the glass. Protesting, I followed him, paused at the tiny areaway before the window, and looked round guiltily while he bent forward shamelessly to spy into the house. Ah? I heard him murmur. Ah! See! Look, observe, friend Trowbridge, what is it we have here? Reluctantly I glued my eye to the chink between the blind and window frame, and looked into the room. The contrast between the drab down-at-the-heel exterior of the house and the apartment into which I gazed almost took my breath. A bright fire blazed behind polished brass fire-dogs in the open fireplace, an oriental rug of good quality was on the floor, the furniture was substantial and expensive, well-rubbed mahogany, tastefully upholstered. A fine Winthrop desk, a table spread with spotless linen and glistening with silver and cut glass. Most incongruous of all, a silver girandole with a bouquet of fresh-cut flowers. Half facing us, but with his odd, sad eyes steadfastly fixed on Muriel Breakstone, sat the queer, old young man we had noticed in the supper club the evening before. As he came into my line of vision, he was in the act of pouring some colorless liquid into a small phial. His lips moved, though no sound came to us. Muriel, her pale, clear-cut face a shade paler than usual, faced him. Her eyes were wide with fear, but the man's long, deeply wrinkled countenance betrayed no more emotion than if it had been graven out of stone. I turned to Jules de Grandin with a question. But the words died stillborn on my tongue, for— "'Here, here, now, what are you two guys up to?' demanded a truculent voice, as the street lamp's rays glistened on the polished shield and buttons of a policeman. The little Frenchman leaped back from the window as though its glass had suddenly become white-hot, then turned to the patrolman. "'Monsieur,' he began, but paused with a quick smile of recognition. "'Ah! Is it truly you, my friend?' he asked, advancing with extended hand. "'Why, it's Dr. de Grandin!' Officer Hornsby exclaimed with an answering grin. "'I didn't recognize you, sir. What's doing? Can I help you? Detective Sergeant Costello told me the other night that if he ever called on me for help, twas just the same as if he'd done it himself.' The Frenchman chuckled. "'It is well to be so highly thought of by the force,' he answered. Then, "'Advance, my friend,' but cautiously, for we must not advertise our presence. Look through the gap in yonder curtain, and tell me who it is you see. That man, you know him, perhaps. Holy Mike, I'll say I know him, Patrolman Hornsby ejaculated, backing away from the window and fumbling for his gun. That's Poker Face Lewis, the quickest shooting racketeer in the game. He's been hiding out these last three weeks, count of a little shooting bee he had with some state troopers. Wanted for murder and a few other things, that bird is. Well, well, so this is his hideout, eh? You just wait here, sir, while I go get a couple of more boys to help me run this baby in. 
Someone's going to get hurt before we finish the job, but why go for help? I am here, de Grandin answered. Let us take him here and now, my friend. Think of the admiration you will receive for such a feat. Well, obviously, Officer Hornsby wavered between desire for praise and the likelihood of coming out of the encounter with a bullet in him. All right, sir, I'm game if you are. But we saw that man last night in a supper club, I protested. Surely if he's been wanted by the police, he wouldn't dare. You don't know poker face, Dr. Trowbridge, sir, Hornsby interrupted. Putting stockings on an eel is a cinch compared with trying to arrest him. Of course he has seen him in a club. He's got half the waiters in town on his payroll, and they slip him through the back doors and out the same way the moment anything that looks like a policeman comes in sight. Already, sir? he asked de Grandin. In a moment, the other answered, stepped back to the boundary of the yard, and pried a piece of paving stone from the loose earth beneath the iron fence. A moment later he heaved it through a window letting out of the front parlor which occupied the building's front door, and as the glass fell crashing before his missile, leaped forward with Officer Hornsby, straight at the shaded window of the room where Poker Face Lewis and Muriel Breakstone sat. Cap pulled down, overcoat collar up about his neck to fend off flying glass, Hornsby crashed through the window like a tank through barbed wire, Jules de Grandin at his elbow. Poker Face leaped from his seat with the agility of a startled cat, and thrust one hand into his dinner jacket. But before he could snatch his weapon from his shoulder holster, de Grandin's deadly little automatic pistol was thrust against his temple. Hands up, and keep them there, if you please, petit porc, the Frenchman ordered sharply. Me, I do not greatly admire that face of yours. It would require small inducement for me to change its appearance with a bullet. "'Examine him, friend Hornsby. "'Unless I miss my guess, he wears an arsenal on him.' "'He did. "'Under Hornsby's expert search, a revolver, two automatic pistols, "'and a murderous double-edged stiletto were removed from the prisoner's clothes. "'Why, you damned dirty little frog, you—' "'The captive began. "'But, softly, my friend, there is a lady present, "'and your language is not suited to her ears.' de Grandin admonished, as Hornsby locked handcuffs on the prisoner's wrists. Madame, he turned toward Muriel's chair, I much regret our so unceremonious intrusion, but, mon Dieu, she's gone. Taking advantage of our preoccupation with her companion, Muriel Breakstone had vanished. After her friend Trowbridge, he cried, hasten, rush, fly, we must overtake her before she reaches home, we must. "'What's it all about?' I panted as we reached my car and set out in pursuit of the vanished woman. "'If—if if we are too late, I shall never cease reproaching myself,' he interrupted. "'Can you not see it all? Madame Breakstone is enamoured of this criminal. It is not the first time that gently brought-up women have succumbed to such fascinations. No, she is tired of her good, respectable husband, and thinks only of getting rid of him.' Ha! Ah, and that one with the unchanging face, he is not averse to helping her. That liquor we saw him give her undoubtlessly was poison. Could you not read fear of murder in her face, as she received the bottle from him? But that will not deter her, no, like a pantheress she is, cruel and passionate as a she-cat. Unquestionably she will administer the drug to Monsieur Idris, unless we can arrive in time to warn him and— Dear, 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 is Satan in league with them? The warning clang-clang of a locomotive bell sounded as he spoke, and I clapped my brakes down sharply, stopping us within two feet of the lowered crossing gate as a seventy-car freight train rumbled past. De Grandin beat his knuckles on the windshield, pulled at his moustache till I thought he would tear hair and skin away in one tremendous tug, and swore venomously in mingled French and English while the train crawled past. When the gates were finally raised, we had lost the better part of fifteen minutes, and to make matters worse, a broken bottle tossed in the street by someone who had patronized a neighboring bootlegger with more generosity than wisdom cut our front tire to ribbons as I put on speed. Taxicabs were non-existent in that poverty-stricken neighborhood, and no service station was available for half a mile. We limped along on a flopping ruined tire— 
finally found a place where a new one could be had, but lost three quarters of an hour in the search. It is hardly worth while hurrying now, de Grandin told me with a fatalistic shrug as we resumed our way. However, we might as well continue. Monsieur Martin, the coroner, will be pleased to have us sign some sort of statement, I suppose. Lights blazed in Breakstone's house when we drew up before the door, and servants followed each other about in futile hysterical circles. Oh, thank God you've come, sir, the butler greeted us. I telephoned you immediately it happened, but they told me you were out, and Dr. Chapman was out too, so— Ha! Ah, it has occurred, then, de Grandin cut in sharply. Where is he? The servant gazed at him in awe-struck wonder, but swallowed his amazement as he turned to lead us to the library. Idris Breakstone lay supine on the leather couch, one hand trailing to the floor, the other folded peacefully across his breast. A single look confirmed our fears. No need to tell us. Death's trademark cannot be counterfeited, and physicians recognize it all too well. His eyes were partly closed and brilliant with a set, fixed, glassy stare. His lips were slightly parted, and light flecks of whitish foam were at the corners of his mouth. The Frenchman turned from the body almost indifferently, took up the empty glass upon the table and held it to his nose, sniffing lightly once or twice, then passed it to me with a shrug. Faint but still perceptible, the odor of peach kernels hung about the goblet's rim. Hydrocyanic acid, he pronounced. Less than one grain is fatal, and death is almost instantaneous. They were stupid, those two, for all their fancied cleverness. A child could not be deceived by this, and— But see here, I remonstrated. You're set on the theory of murder, I know— but there's a slim chance this might be suicide, de Gronda. We know Idris was, well, talking strangely, to say the least, last night, and we know he was a broken-spirited, disillusioned man. He might have done this thing himself. Plain justice demands we take that into consideration. It's true we saw that queer-faced man give Muriel something in a bottle, but we didn't hear what they said, and we don't really know it was poison, so... Precisément, he nodded grimly. You have right, my friend. We do not yet know it was poison he gave her, or that she administered it. So we shall interview Madame Breakstone and hear the truth from her lovely, guilty lips. Come, we are not men dealing with a woman now, but agents of justice with a criminal. He strode to the door, flung it open, and beckoned to the butler. Your mistress, he ordered curtly. Take us to her. Yes, sir. She's upstairs, sir. I thought you'd like to see her as soon as you were through with the master. Will you come this way, sir? Assuredly, the Frenchman agreed, and fell into step beside the servant. No noise, he warned in a threatening whisper. If you advise her of our coming. Sir? the other interrupted with a shocked expression. Exactly, precisely, quite so. I have said it, de Grandin returned sharply. Your hearing is of the best, my friend. Proceed. The sound of a woman sobbing softly came to us as we approached Muriel's bedroom door. Tiens, madame, tears will avail you nothing, the Frenchman muttered. Justice knows neither sex nor gallantry, neither does Jules de Grandin in such a case as this. He rapped sharply on the white enameled panels, then, as the door swung back, Grand Dieu, what is this? he asked in blank amazement. Upon the bed lay Muriel Breakstone, a coverlet drawn over her, leaving only her quiet face exposed. A maid, red-eyed with weeping, rose from her chair and motioned us toward the still form. "'You're the doctors,' she queried between sobs. "'It's awful, gentlemen. I was down the hall by Master Bobby's door when I heard Mrs. Breakstone come running upstairs and into a room as if someone was after her. She screamed once, and I came as quickly as I could, but when I got here she was... Oh, I was so scared I didn't know what to do. I, I couldn't even scream for a minute. I got her to the bed and drew the cover over her, then got her smelling salts, but... Precisément, it was useless. I perceive. De Grande I interrupted. You did your best, mademoiselle, 
and as your nerves have had a shock, I suggest you go below stairs and give yourself a cup of tea. You will find it restful. He motioned toward the door, and as the trembling girl crept out, he turned down the coverlet and stared intently in the dead woman's face. And what do you make of this, friend Trowbridge? he asked, tapping Muriel's throat with the tip of a well-manicured forefinger. Upon the right side of the smooth, white neck was already forming an elongated patch of discoloration, while the left side showed four long, parallel, reddish lines, reaching toward the back from a point midway between the tip and angle of the jaw. Why, uh, I began, but he waved me to silence, took my hand in his, and pressed my first two fingers against the neck in the receding angle below the chin. Only soft flesh opposed the pressure. You see, he remarked, the right horn of the hyoid bone is fractured. It is often so in cases of strangulation, throttling by the hand. Yes, of course, I have seen it more than once in the Paris morgue. But, but who did it? Who could have done it? I stammered. Do you suppose Idris could have been seized with a fit of homicidal madness? Strangled Muriel? Then, returning to sanity and realizing what he'd done, committed suicide. Zit! he exclaimed impatiently. Your question slanders the helpless dead, my friend. That poor one downstairs was murdered, foully murdered. As to who performed the deed for this one, one wonders. But from the expression on his face, I knew he had arrived at a decision. He was strangely silent on the homeward drive nor would he respond to any of my attempts at conversation. They buried Idris and Muriel Breakstone on New Year's Eve. The coroner's jury returned a verdict of suicide while of unsound mind in Idris's case, and of murder by throttling at the hands of some person or persons unknown in the case of Muriel. At de Grandin's request, Coroner Martin in his private and unofficial capacity of funeral director, saw that the little plain gold ring with forever engraved on its inner surface was slipped on the third finger of Idris's hand before the body was placed in the casket. The tall, grey-haired mortician and the little Frenchman were fast friends, and though the coroner asked no questions, he nodded sympathetically when de Grandin gave him the ring and asked that he see it was put on the body. Darkness had fallen, and the old year was dying in a flurry of light, feathery snow, when Jules de Grandin and I stopped at Breakstone's house, the Frenchman with a great bundle of toys and a gigantic box of chocolates under his arm. "'I bring them for petit monsieur Bobby, le pauvre enfant,' he told the child's grandmother, who, with her husband, had agreed to occupy the house until Idris's estate could be settled and permanent arrangements made for the little boy. Your daughter, Monsieur Breakstone's first wife, she would have wished that you take charge of her little one in such circumstances, de Grandin whispered as he ascended the stairs to the nursery. It is well that you are here. We shall not waken him if he is sleeping, he added as we halted before the nursery door. But I should like to look at him, if I may, and leave these gifts where he can find them when he rises in the morning. However, if you think... He broke off abruptly while he and Mr. Denham and I stared at each other in blank amazement. From the darkened nursery there came to us distinctly the sound of voices, happy voices, of a child's light laughter, the deeper laugh of a man, and the soft, lilting laughter of a woman. Then, Good night, little son, happy dreams, sleep tight, a woman said, and Good night, a childish treble answered. Mr. Denham pushed back the door and stared about the room. Save for the little boy, snugly cuddled in his crib, the nursery was empty. Why, the grandfather began, I thought, Hello, Grandpa, the youngster greeted sleepily, smiling at the old gentleman. Mother's been here, and Daddy, too. They told me good night just a moment. Why, Bobby, that can't be, his grandfather cut in. Your mother and daddy are... Say it, monsieur, de Grandin challenged fiercely, his little round blue eyes glazing as they rested on the older man. Say it, 
and parbleu, I shall pull your nose. To Bobby he announced, Of course they were here, mon petit, and they shall come to you many, many more times in future, and he who says otherwise is a foul, depraved liar. Moreover, he must fight with Jules de Grandin, who would tell you they may not come. Yes, I have said it. He bent and kissed the youngster on the brow, then laid his gifts upon the table. They are for you, my little cabbage, he said. Tomorrow, when you rise, you shall have them all. And my love to your dear parents when next they come to you, my little one. I wonder what it was we heard in there, I asked, as we drove home from the theater some hours later. I could have sworn we heard a man's voice, and a woman's too, but that's impossible. You could have sworn, he interrupted, something like incredulity in his tone. Pardieu, I shall swear it. I have sworn it. Upon a pile of holy scripture as high as that Monsieur Woolworth's so beautiful tower, I will affirm it, before all the world. Whom did we hear, you ask? Bob d'Anchoufleur, who should be in the little man's nursery at sleepy time but those who loved him in life? Who but she who summoned us to witness the perfidy of the false wife and her paramour, and to learn the truth about the poison which took Monsieur Breakstone's life? Who but the one who wreaked swift vengeance on the false-hearted murderess, even as she gloated over her success? Who indeed, Pablo? Death is strong, but love is stronger, my friend, and woman fights for the man she loves. The false one had but short time to enjoy her triumph, while as for her lover, ha, did not the spirit of dear Madame Marjorie, which led us to that house in Light Street, indirectly cause his apprehension, and must he not now answer for his misdeeds before the bar of justice? But certainly. Attend me, my friend. Women, children, and dogs know their friends instinctively. So it would seem do disembodied spirits. When Madame Marjorie sought one on this earthly plane to help her in her work, whom should she choose but Jules de Grandin? In times gone past, he has been known as a ghost-breaker. These last few nights, I damn think, he has essayed a new role, that of ghost-helper. Yes, par la barbe d'un taureau, and it is a role he has liked exceedingly well. But see here, I expostulated. You don't seriously believe that Marjorie's spirit was responsible for all this? Across the city, down by the waterworks, a whistle hooted hoarsely, Another took up the cry. In a moment the night was full of shrieking, cheering whistles and clamoring bells. The carillon in St. Chrysostom's belfry began to sing a joyous peal. Ring out the false, ring in the true. Ring happy bells across the snow. Jules de Grandin removed the white silk handkerchief from the left cuff of his dinner jacket and wiped his eyes upon it, unashamed. My friend he assured me solemnly. I do believe it. I believe it with all my heart. Come, let us hurry. Why, what's the hurry now? The old year dies. I would greet the new year fittingly. With a drink, he answered. Satan's Stepson One, the living dead. Horns of a little blue devil. Jules de Grandin bent his head against the sleet-laden February wind and clutched madly at my elbow as his feet all but slipped from under him. We are three fools, my friends. We should be home beside our cheerful fire instead of risking our necks going to this sacré dinner on such a night. Comment ça va, mon Jules? demanded Inspector Renoir. Where is your patriotism? Tonight's dinner is in honor of the great General Washington, whose birthday it is. Did not our own so illustrious Marquis de Lafayette? Monsieur le Marquis is dead, and we are like to be the same before we find our way home again, de Grandin cut in irritably. As for the great Washington, I think no more of him for choosing this so villainous month in which to be born. Now me, I selected May for my debut. Had he but used a like discretion... Misère de Dieu, see him come. He is a crazy fool, that one, Renoir broke in, pointing to a motor-car racing toward us down the avenue. 
We watched the vehicle in open-mouthed astonishment. To drive at all on such a night was risking life and limb, yet this man drove as though contending for a record on the racing track. Almost abreast of us he applied his brakes and swerved sharply to the left, seeking to enter the cross street. The inevitable happened. With a rending of wood and metal the car skidded end for end and brought up against the curb, its right rear wheel completely dished, its motor racing wildly as the rimless spokes spun round and round. Mon Dieu, you are suicidal, my friend, de Grandin cried, making his way toward the disabled vehicle with difficulty. Can I assist you? I am a physician, and I— A woman's hysterical scream cut through his offer. Help! Save me! There— Her cry died suddenly as a hand was clapped over her mouth, and a hulking brute of a man in chauffeur's leather coat and visored cap scrambled from the driver's cab and faced the Frenchman truculently. "'Ye cat, be off!' he ordered shortly. "'We need no help, and don't parley with him, Dimitri,' a heavy voice inside the tonneau commanded. "'Break his damned neck, and—' "'Crenon, with whose assistance will you break my neck, cochon?' de Grandin asked sharply. "'Name of a gun, make but one step toward me, and—' The giant chauffeur needed no further invitation. As de Grandin spoke, he hurled himself forward, his big hands outstretched to grasp the little Frenchman's throat. Like a bouncing ball, de Grandin rose from the ground, intent on meeting the bully's rush with a kick to the pit of the stomach, for he was an expert at the French art of foot-boxing. But the slippery pavement betrayed him. Both feet flew upward, and he sprawled upon his back, helpless before the larger man's attack. "'A moi, mon Georges!' he called Renoir. Je suis perdu. Practical policeman that he was, Renoir lost no time in answering de Grandin's cry. Reversing the heavy walking stick which swung from his arm, he brought its lead-loaded crook down upon the chauffeur's head with sickening force, then bent to extricate his friend from the other's crushing bulk. The car, into the moteur, my friend, de Grandin cried. A woman is in there, injured, perhaps. Perhaps together they dived through the open door of the limousine's tonneau, and a moment later there came the sound of scuffling and mingled grunts and curses as they fought desperately with some invisible antagonist. I rushed to help them, slipped upon the sleet-glazed sidewalk, and sprawled full length as a dark body hurtled from the car, cannoned into me, and paused a moment to hurl a missile, then sped away into the shadows with a mocking laugh. Quick, friend Trowbridge, assist me, Renoir is hit. De Grandin emerged from the wrecked car, supporting the inspector on his arm. Zit, it is nothing, a scratch, Renoir returned. Do you attend to her, my friend? I can walk with ease. Observe. He took a step and collapsed limply in my arms, blood streaming from a deeply incised wound in his left shoulder. Together de Grandin and I staunched the hemorrhage as best we could, then rummaged in the ruined car for the woman whose screams we had heard when the accident occurred. She is unconscious, but otherwise unhurt, I think, de Grandin told me. Do you see to Georges? I will carry her. Pre Dieu, do not slip and kill us both. But what about this fellow? I asked, motioning toward the unconscious chauffeur. We oughtn't leave him here. He may freeze or contract pneumonia. Eh bien, one can but hope, de Grandin interrupted. Let him lie, my friend. The sleet may cool his ardour, he who was so intent on breaking Jules de Grandin's neck. Come, it is but a short distance to the house. Let us be upon our way. Allez-vous-en. A rugged constitution, and the almost infinite capacity for bearing injury which he had developed during years of service with the gendarmerie, stood Inspector Renoir in good stead. Before we had reached the house, he was able to walk with my assistance. By the time he had had a proper pack and bandage applied to his wound, and absorbed the better part of a pint of brandy, he was almost his usual debonair self. Not so our other patient. Despite our treatment with cold compresses, sal volatilis, and aromatic ammonia, it was nearly half an hour before we could break the profound swoon in which she lay. And even then— she was so weak and shaken we forbore to question her. 
At length, when a slight tinge of color began to show in her pale cheeks, de Gronda took his station before her, and bowed as formally as though upon a ballroom floor. Mademoiselle, he began, some half an hour since we had the happy privilege of assisting you from a motor wreck. This is Dr. Samuel Trowbridge, in whose office you are. I am Dr. Jules de Gronda, and this is our very good friend, Inspector Georges Jean-Jacques Joseph-Marie Renoir of the Sûreté Générale, all of us entirely at your service. If Mademoiselle will be so kind as to tell us how we may communicate with her friends or family, we shall esteem it an honour. Donald, the young woman interrupted breathlessly. Call Donald and tell him I'm all right. Avec plaisir, he agreed with another bow. And this Monsieur Donald, he is who, if you please? My husband. Perfectly, madame, but his name? Donald Tannis. Call him at the Hotel Avalon and tell him that I—that Sonia is all right, and where I am, please. Oh, he'll be terribly worried. But certainly, madame, I fully understand, he assured her. Then, you have been through a most unpleasant experience. Perhaps you will be kind enough to permit that we offer you refreshment, some sherry and biscuit, while monsieur your husband comes to fetch you. He is even now upon his way. Thank you so much. She nodded with a wan little smile, and I hastened to the pantry in search of wine and biscuit. Seated in an easy chair before the study fire, the girl sipped a glass of Duff Gordon and munched a pilot biscuit, while de Gronda, Renoir, and I studied her covertly. She was quite young, not more than thirty, I judged, and lithe and slender in stature though by no means thin, and her hands were the whitest I had ever seen. Ash blonde her complexion was, her skin extremely fair, and her hair that peculiar shade of lightness, which, without being grey, is nearer silver than gold. Her eyes were bluish-grey, sad, knowing, and weary, as though they had seen the sorrow and futility of life from the moment of their first opening. "'You will smoke, perhaps?' de Grandin asked as she finished her biscuit. As he extended his silver pocket-lighter to her cigarette, the bell shrilled imperatively, and I hastened to the front door to admit a tall, dark young man, whose agitated manner labelled him our patient's husband even before he introduced himself. "'My dear!' he cried, rushing across the study and taking the girl's hand in his, then raising it to his lips while de Grandin and Renoir beamed approvingly. Where? How? He faltered in his question, but his worshipful glance was eloquent. Donald, the girl broke in, and though the study was almost uncomfortably warm, she shuddered with a sudden chill. It was Constantine. What? What? He stammered in incredulous, horrified amazement. My dear, you surely can't be serious. Why, he's dead. No, dear, she answered wearily. I'm not jesting. It was Constantine, there's no mistaking it. He tried to kidnap me. Just as I entered the hotel dining room, a waiter told me that a gentleman wanted to see me in the lobby. So, as I knew you had to finish dressing, I went out to him. A big, bearded man in a chauffeur's leather uniform was waiting by the door. He told me he was from the Cadillac Agency, said you had ordered a new car as a surprise for my birthday, but that you wanted me to approve it before they made delivery. It was waiting outside, he said, and he would be glad if I'd just step out and look at it. His accent should have warned me, for I recognized him as a Russian, but there are so many different sorts of people in this country, and I was so surprised and delighted with the gift that I never thought of being suspicious. So I went out with him to a gorgeous new limousine parked about fifty feet from the Porte Cochere. The engine was running, but I didn't notice that till later. I walked round the car, admiring it from the outside. Then he asked if I'd care to inspect the inside of the tonneau. There seemed to be some trouble with the dome light when he opened the door for me, and I was halfway in before I realized someone was inside. Then it was too late. The chauffeur shoved me in and slammed the door, then jumped into the cab and set the machine going in high gear. I never had a chance to call for help. 
It wasn't till we'd gone some distance that my companion spoke, and when he did, I almost died of fright. There was no light, and he was so muffled in furs that I could not have recognized his face anyway, but his voice, and those corpse hands of his, I knew them. It was Constantine. Jawohl, meine liebe Frau, he said. He always loved to speak German to torment me. It seems we meet again, nicht wahr? I tried to answer him, to say something, anything, but my lips and tongue seemed absolutely paralysed with terror. Even though I could not see, I could feel him chuckling in that awful, silent way of his. Just then the driver tried to take a curve at high speed, and we skidded into the curb. These gentlemen were passing, and I screamed to them for help. Constantine put his hand over my mouth, and at the touch of his cold flesh against my lips... I fainted. The next I knew I was here, and Dr. de Grandin was offering to call you, so... She paused and drew her husband's hand down against her cheek. I'm frightened, Donald. Terribly frightened, she whimpered. Constantine. Jules de Grandin could stand the strain no longer. During Mrs. Tannis's recital, I could fairly see his ungovernable curiosity bubbling up within him. Now he was at the end of his endurance. Pardonnez-moi, madame, he broke in. But may one inquire who this so offensive Constantine is? The girl shuddered again, and her pale cheeks went a thought paler. He is my husband, she whispered between blenched lips. But madame, how can it be? Renoir broke in. Monsieur Tannis, he is your husband. He admits it. So do you. Yet this Constantine, he is also your husband. No, my comprehension is unequal to it. But Constantine is dead, I tell you, her husband insisted. I saw him die. I saw him in his coffin. Oh, my darling, she sobbed, her lips blue with unholy terror. You saw me dead, coffined and buried too, but I'm living. Somehow, in some way, we don't understand. Come on! Inspector Renoir took his temples in his hands as though suffering a violent headache. Jules, my friend, tell me I cannot understand the English, he implored. You are a physician. Examine me and tell me my faculties are failing, my ears are betraying me. I hear them say, I think... That Madame Tanis has died and been buried in a grave and coffin, yet there she sits and... Silence, Monsange. Your jabbering annoys me. De Grandin cut him short. To Tanis he continued. We should be grateful for an explanation, if you care to offer one, for Madame's so strange statement has greatly puzzled us. It is perhaps she makes the pleasantry at our expense, or... It's no jest, I assure you, sir. The girl broke in. I was dead. My death and burial are recorded in the official archives of the city of Paris, and a headboard marks my grave in Saint Sebastien. But Donald came for me and married. Eh bien, madame, either my hearing falters or my intellect is dull, de Grandin exclaimed. Will you repeat your statement once again, slowly and distinctly, if you please? Perhaps I did not fully apprehend you. 2. Inferno Despite herself, the girl smiled. What I said is literally true, she assured him. A pause, then. We hate to talk of it, for the memory horrifies us both. But you gentlemen have been so kind, I think we owe you an explanation. My name was Sonia Malakov. I was born in Petrograd, and my father was a colonel of infantry in the Imperial Army. But some difficulty with a superior officer over the discipline of the men led to his retirement. I never understood exactly what the trouble was, but it must have been serious, for he averted court-martial and disgrace only by resigning his commission and promising to leave Russia forever. We went to England— for father had friends there. We had sufficient property to keep us comfortable, and I was brought up as an English girl of the better class. When the war broke out, father offered his sword to Russia, but his services were peremptorily refused. 
and though he was bitterly hurt by the rebuff, he determined to do something for the Allied cause, and so we moved to France, and he secured a non-combatant commission in the French army. I went out as a VAD with the British. One night in sixteen, as our convoy was going back from the advanced area, an air attack came and several of our ambulances were blown off the road. I detoured into a field and put on all the speed I could. As I went bumping over the rough ground, I heard someone groaning in the darkness. I stopped and got down to investigate and found a group of Canadians who had been laid out by a bomb. All but two were dead, and one of the survivors had a leg blown nearly off. But I managed to get them into my van with my other blessés and crowded on all the gas I could for the dressing station. Next day they told me one of the men, the poor chap with the mangled leg, had died. But the other, though badly shell-shocked, had a good chance of recovery. They were very nice about it all, gave me a mention for bringing them in and all that sort of thing. Captain Donald Tannis, the shell-shocked man, was an American serving with the Canadians. I went to see him, and he thanked me for giving him the lift. Afterward they sent him to a recuperation station on the Riviera, and we corresponded regularly, or as regularly as people can in such circumstances, until— She paused a moment and a slight flush tinged her pallid face. "'Bien oui,' de Grandin agreed with a delighted grin. "'It was love by correspondence, n'est-ce pas, madame? And so you were married, yes?' "'Not then,' she answered. Donald's letters became less frequent, and—and, and of course, I did what any girl would have done in the circumstances, made mine shorter, cooler, and further apart.' Finally our correspondence dwindled away entirely. The second revolution had taken place in Russia, and her new masters had betrayed the Allies at Brest-Litovsk. But America had come into the war, and things began to look bright for us, despite the Bolsheviks' perfidy. Father should have been delighted at the turn events were taking, but apparently he was disappointed. When the Allies made their July drive in eighteen, and the Germans began retreating— he seemed terribly disturbed about something, became irritable or moody and distray, often going days without speaking a word that wasn't absolutely necessary. We'd picked up quite a few friends among the émigrés in Paris, and father's most intimate companion was Alexis Constantine, who soon became a regular visitor at our house. I always hated him. There was something dreadfully repulsive about his appearance and manner. His dead white face, his flabby fish-cold hands, the very way he dressed in black and walked about so silently. He was like a living dead man. I had a feeling of almost physical nausea whenever he came near me, and once when he laid his hand upon my arm, I started and screamed as though a reptile had been put against my flesh. When Donald's letters finally ceased altogether, though I wouldn't admit it even to myself, my heart was breaking. I loved him, you see, she added simply. Then one day father came home from the war department in a perfect fever of nervousness. Sonia, he told me, I have just been examined by the military doctors. They tell me the end may come at any time like a thief in the night. I want you to be provided for in case it comes soon, my dear. I want you to be married. But, father, I don't want to marry, I replied. The war's not over yet, though we are winning, and I've still my work to do with the ambulance section. Besides, we're well off enough to live. There's no question of my having to marry for a home, so— But that's just it, he answered. There is. That is exactly the question, my child. I— I've speculated— speculated and lost. Every kopeck we had has gone. I've nothing but my military pay, and when that stops it must stop directly the war is won. We're paupers. I was surprised but far from terrified. All right, I told him. I'm strong and healthy and well educated. I can earn a living for us both. At what? he asked sarcastically. Typing at seventy shillings a week. As nursery governess at five pounds per month with food and lodging. No, my dear, there's nothing for it but a rich marriage, or at least a rich marriage with a man able to support us both while I'm alive and keep you comfortably after that. 
I thought I saw a ray of hope. We don't know any such man, I objected. No Frenchman with sufficient fortune to do what you wish will marry a dowerless girl, and our Russian friends are all as poor as we, so— Ah, but there is such a man, he smiled. I have just the man, and he is willing, no anxious, to make you his wife. My blood seemed to go cold in my arteries as he spoke, for something inside me whispered the name of this benefactor even before father pronounced it. Gaspardine Alexis Constantine. I wouldn't hear of it at first. I'd sooner wear my fingers out as seamstress, scrub tiles upon my knees, or walk the pavements as a fille de joie than marry Constantine, I told him. But though I was English-bred, I was Russian-born. And Russian women are born to be subservient to men. Though I rebelled against it with every atom of my being, I finally agreed, and so it was arranged that we should marry. Father hurried me desperately. At the time I thought it was because he didn't want me to have time to change my mind, but it was a queer wedding day, not at all the kind I'd dreamt of. Constantine was wealthy, father said, but there was no evidence of wealth at the wedding. We drove to and from the church in an ancient horse-drawn taximeter cab, and my father was my only attendant. An aged papa with one very dirty little boy as acolyte performed the ceremony. We had only the cheap silver-gilt crowns owned by the church, none of our own, and not so much as a single spray of flowers for my bridal bouquet. The three of us came home together, and Constantine sent the concierge out for liquor. Our wedding breakfast consisted of brandy, raw fish, and tea. Both father and my husband drank more than they ate. I did neither. The very sight of Constantine was enough to drive all desire of food away, even though the table had been spread with the choicest dainties to be had from a fashionable caterer. Before long both men were more than half tipsy, and began talking together in low drunken mutterings, ignoring me completely. At last my husband bade me leave the room, ordering me out without so much as looking in my direction. I sat in my bedroom in a sort of chilled apathy, I imagine a condemned prisoner who knows all hope of reprieve is past waits for the coming of the hangman as I waited there. My half-consciousness was suddenly broken by father's voice. Sonia, Sonia, he called, and from his tone I knew he was beside himself with some emotion. When I went into the dining-room my father was trembling and wringing his hands in a perfect agony of terror, and tears were streaming down his cheeks as he looked imploringly at Constantine. "'Sonia, my daughter,' he whispered, "'plead with him. Go on your knees to him, my child, and beg him. Pray him as you would pray God to—' "'Shut up, you old fool,' my husband interrupted. Shut up and get out. Leave me alone with my bride. He leered drunkenly at me. Trembling as though with palsy, my father rose humbly to obey the insolent command, but Constantine called after him as he went out. Best take your pistolet, mon vieux. You'll probably prefer it to le peloton d'execution. I heard father rummaging through his chest in the bedroom and turned on Constantine. What does this mean? I asked. Why did you say he might prefer his own pistol to the firing party? Ask him, he answered with a laugh. But when I attempted to join my father, he thrust me into a chair and held me there. Stay where you are, he ordered. I am your master now. Then my British upbringing asserted itself. You're not my master. No one is, I answered hotly. I'm a free woman, not a chattel, and— I never finished. Before I could complete my declaration, he'd struck me with his fist and knocked me to the floor, and when I tried to rise, he knocked me down again. He even kicked me as I lay there. I tried to fight him off, but though he was so slightly built, he proved strong as a prize fighter, and my efforts at defence were futile. They seemed only to arouse him to further fury, and he struck and kicked me again and again. I screamed to my father for help, 
but if he heard me he made no answer, and so my punishment went on till I lost consciousness. My bridal night was an inferno. Sottish with vodka and drunk with passion, Constantine was a sadistic beast. He tore, actually ripped my clothing off, covered me with slobbering drunken caresses from lips to feet, alternating maudlin obscene compliments with scurrilous insults and abuse, embracing and beating me by turns. Twice I sickened under the ordeal, and both times he sat calmly by. "'drinking raw vodka from the bottle and waiting till my nausea passed, "'then resumed my torment with all the joy a medieval Dominican might have found "'in torturing a helpless heretic. "'It was nearly noon next day when I woke from what was more a stupor of horror and exhaustion than sleep. "'Constantine was nowhere to be seen, for which I thanked God, "'as I staggered from the bed and sought a nightrobe to cover the shameless nudity he had imposed on me. I'll not stand it, I told myself, as, my self-respect somewhat restored by the garment I'd slipped on, I prepared a bath to wash the wounds and bruises I'd sustained during the night. Then all my newfound courage evaporated as I heard my husband's step outside, and I cringed like any odalisk before her master as he entered, groveled on the floor like a dog which fears the whip. He laughed and tossed me a copy of the Paris edition of the Daily Mail. You may be interested in that obituary, he told me, the last paragraph in the fourth column. I read it, and all but fainted as I read, for it told how my father had been found that morning in an obscure street on the left bank. A bullet wound in the head pointed to suicide but no trace of the weapon had been found, for thieves had taken everything of value and stripped the body almost naked before the gendarmes found it. They gave him a military funeral and buried him in a soldier's grave. His service saved him from the potter's field, but the army escort and I were his only mourners. Constantine refused to attend the services and forbade my going till I had abased myself and knelt before him. "'humbly begging for permission to attend my father's funeral, "'and promising by everything I held sacred "'that I would be subservient to him in every act and word "'and thought forever afterward, "'if only he would grant that one poor favour. "'That evening he was drunk again, and most ill-natured. "'He beat me several times, but offered no endearments, "'and I was glad of it, for his blows, painful as they were, were far more welcome than his kisses. Next morning he abruptly ordered me to rejoin my unit and write him every day, making careful note of the regiments and arms of service to which the wounded men I handled belonged, and reporting to him in detail. I served two weeks with my unit. Then the commandant sent for me and told me they were reducing the personnel, and as I was a married woman, they deemed it best that I resign at once. And by the by, Constantine, she added as I saluted and turned to go, you might like to take these with you, as a little souvenir, you know. She drew a packet from her drawer and handed it to me. It was a sheaf of fourteen letters, every one I'd written to my husband. When I opened them outside, I saw that every item of intelligence they contained had been carefully blocked out with censor's ink. Constantine was furious. He thrashed me till I thought I'd not have a whole bone left. I took it as long as I could. Then, bleeding from nose and lips, I tried to crawl from the room. The sight of my helplessness and utter defeat seemed to infuriate him still further. With an animal snarl, he fairly leaped on me and bore me down beneath a storm of blows and kicks. I felt the first few blows terribly. Then they seemed to soften, as if his hands and feet were encased in thick, soft boxing gloves. Then I sank face downward on the floor and seemed to go to sleep. When I awoke, if you can call it that, I was lying on the bed, and everything seemed quiet as the grave and calm as paradise. 
There was no sensation of pain or any feeling of discomfort, and it seemed to me as if my body had grown curiously lighter. The room was in semi-darkness, and I noticed with an odd feeling of detachment that I could see out of only one eye, my left. He must have closed the right one with a blow, I told myself, but queerly I didn't feel resentful. Indeed, I scarcely felt at all. I was in a sort of semi-stupor, indifferent to myself and everything else. A scuffle of heavily booted feet sounded outside. Then the door was pushed open and a beam of light came into the room, but did not reach to me. I could tell several men had entered, and from their heavy breathing and the scraping sounds I heard, I knew they were lugging some piece of heavy furniture. "'Has the doctor been here yet?' one of them asked. No, someone replied, and I recognized the voice of Madame Lespard, an aged widow who occupied the flat above. You must wait, gentlemen, the law. A bar the law, the man replied. Me, I have worked since five this morning, and I wish to go to bed. But, gentlemen, for the love of heaven, restrain yourselves, Madame Lespard pleaded. La pauvre belle créature may not be... No fear, the fellow interrupted. I can recognize them at a mile. Look here. From somewhere he procured a lamp and brought it to the bed on which I lay. Observe the pupils of the eyes, he ordered. See how they are fixed and motionless even when I hold the light to them. He brought the lamp within six inches of my face, flashing its rays directly into my eye. Yet though I felt its luminance, there was no sensation of being dazzled. Then suddenly the light went out. At first I thought he had extinguished the lamp, but in a moment I realized what had actually happened was that my eyelid had been lowered. Though I had not felt his finger on the lid, he had drawn it down across my eye, as one might draw a curtain. And now observe again, I heard him say, and the scratch of a match against a boot sole was followed by the faint unpleasant smell of searing flesh. Forbear, monsieur, old Madame Lespard cried in horror. Oh, you are callous, inhuman, you gentlemen of the pompe funèbre. Then a horrifying realization came to me, a vague, phantasmal thought which had been wafting in my brain, like an unremembered echo of a long-forgotten verse, suddenly crystallized in my mind. These men were from the Pompe Funèbre, the municipal undertakers of Paris. The heavy object they had lugged in was a coffin. My coffin. They thought me dead. I tried to rise, to tell them that I lived, to scream and beg them not to put me in that dreadful box. In vain, although I struggled till it seemed my lungs and veins must burst with effort, I could not make a sound could not stir a hand or finger, could not so much as raise the eyelid the undertaker's man had lowered. "'Ah, bonsoir, monsieur le médecin,' I heard the leader of the crew exclaim. "'We feared you might not come tonight, and the poor lady would have to lie uncoffined till tomorrow.' The fussy little municipal doctor bustled up to the bed on which I lay, flashed a lamp into my face, and mumbled something about being overworked with la grippe killing so many people every day. Then he turned away, and I heard the rustle of papers as he filled in the blanks of my certificate of death. If I could have controlled any member of my body, I would have wept. As it was, I merely lay there, unable to shed a single tear for the poor unfortunate who was being hustled, living, to the grave. Constantine's voice mingled with the others. I heard him tell the doctor how I had fallen head first down the stairs, how he'd rushed wildly after me and borne me up to bed, only to find my neck was broken. The lying wretch actually sobbed as he told his perjured story, and the little doctor made perfunctory clucking sounds of sympathy as he listened in attentively and wrote the death certificate, the warrant which condemned me to awful death by suffocation in the grave. I felt myself lifted from the bed and placed in the pine coffin, heard them lay the lid above me, and felt the jar as they drove home nail after nail. At last the task was finished. The entrepreneurs accepted a drink of brandy and went away. 
leaving me alone with my murderer. I heard him take a turn across the room, heard the almost noiseless chuckle which he gave whenever he was greatly pleased, heard him scratch a match to light a cigarette. Then of a sudden he checked his restless walk and turned toward the door with a short exclamation. Who comes? he called as a measured tramping sounded in the passageway outside. The military police, his hail was answered. Alexis Constantine, we make you arrested for espionage. Come. He snarled like a trapped beast. There was the click of a pistol hammer, but the gendarmes were too quick for him. Like hounds upon the boar they leaped on him, and though he fought with savage fury, I had good cause to know how strong he was. They overwhelmed him, beat him into submission with fists and sabre hilts, and snapped steel bracelets on his wrists. All fight gone from him, cursing, whining, begging for mercy, to be allowed to spend the last night beside the body of his poor dead wife. They dragged him from the room and down the stairs. I never saw him again, until tonight. The girl smiled sadly, a trace of bitterness on her lips. Have you ever lain awake at night in a perfectly dark room and tried to keep count of time? she asked. If you have, you know how long a minute can seem. Imagine how many centuries I lived through while I lay inside that coffin, sightless, motionless, soundless, but with my sense of hearing abnormally sharpened. For longer years than the vilest sinner must spend in purgatory, I lay there thinking, thinking. The rattle of carts in the streets and a slight increase in temperature told me day had come. But the morning brought no hope to me. It meant only that I was that much nearer the Golgotha of my Via Dolorosa. At last they came. Where to? A workman asked as rough hands took up my coffin and bore me down the stairs. Saint Sébastien, the premier ouvrier, returned. Her husband made arrangements yesterday. They say he was rich. Eh bien, it is likely so. Only the wealthy and the poor dare have funerals of the third class. Over the cobbles of the streets, the little one-horse hearse jolted to the church, and at every revolution of the wheels, my panic grew. Surely, surely I shall gain my self-control again, I told myself. It can't be that I'll lie like this until... I dared not finish out the sentence, even in my thoughts. The night before the waiting had seemed endless. Now it seemed the shambling, half-starved nag which drew the hearse was winged like Pegasus and made the journey to the cemetery more swiftly than the fastest airplane. At last we halted, and they dragged me to the ground, rushed me at breakneck speed across the cemetery, and put me down a moment while they did something to the coffin. What was it? Were they making ready to remove the lid? Had the municipal doctor remembered tardily how perfunctory his examination had been, and conscience-smitten rushed to the cemetery to snatch me from the very jaws of the grave? We therefore commit her body to the earth, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The priest's low sing-song came to me, muffled by the coffin walls. Too late I realised, the sound I heard had been only the knotted end of the lowering rope falling on the coffin top as the workmen drew a loop about the case. The priest's chant became fainter and fainter. I felt myself sinking as though upon a slowly descending lift, while the ropes soared and rasped against the square edges of the coffin, making noises like the bellow of a cracked bass viol, and the coffin teetered crazily from side to side and scraped against the raw edges of the grave. At last I came to rest. A jolt, a little thud, a final scraping noise, and the lowering ropes were jerked free and drawn underneath the coffin and out of the grave. The end had come. There was no more. A terrible report, louder than the bursting of a shell, exploded just above my chest, and the close confined air inside the coffin shook and trembled like the air in a dugout when hostile flyers lay down an air barrage. A second shock burst above my face. 
Its impact was so great I knew the coffin lid must surely crack beneath it. Then a perfect drum-fire of explosions as clod on roaring clod struck down upon the thin pine which coffined me. My ears were paralysed with the continuous detonations. I could feel the constantly increasing weight of earth pressing on my chest, my mouth, my nostrils. I made one final effort to rouse myself and scream for help. Then a great flare, like the bursting of a star-shell, enveloped me, and the last shred of sensation went amid a blaze of flame and roar of thunder. Slowly I fought back to consciousness. I shuddered as the memory of my awful dream came back to me. I'd dreamed that I was dead, or rather, in a trance, that men from the Pont Funèbre came and thrust me into a coffin and buried me in Saint Sébastien, and I had heard the clods fall on the coffin lid above me, while I lay powerless to raise a hand. How good it was to lie there in my bed and realise that it had only been a dream. There, with the soft, warm mattress under me, I could lie comfortably and rest till time had somewhat softened the terror of that nightmare. Then I would rise and make a cup of tea to soothe my frightened nerves, then go again to bed and peaceful sleep. But how dark it was! Never, even in those days of air raids when all lights were forbidden, had I seen a darkness so absolute, so unrelieved by any faintest ray of light. I moved my arms restlessly. To right and left were hard, rough, wooden walls that pressed my sides and interfered with movement. I tried to rise, but fell back with a cry of pain, for I had struck my brow a violent blow. The air about me was very close and damp, heavy, as though confined under pressure. Suddenly I knew. Horror made my scalp sting and prickle and the awful truth ran through me like an icy wave. It was no dream but dreadful fact. I had emerged from the coma which held me while preparations for my funeral were made. At last I was awake, mistress of my body, conscious and able to move and scream aloud for help. But none would ever hear me. I was coffined, shut up beneath a mound of earth in saint Sebastian Cemetery, buried alive. I called aloud in agony of soul and body. The dreadful reverberation of my voice in that sealed coffin rang back against my ears like thunderclaps tossed back by mountain peaks. Then I went mad, shrieking, cursing the day I was born, and the God who let this awful fate before me. I writhed and twisted, kicked and struggled in the coffin. The sides pressed in so closely that I could not raise my hands to my head, else I had torn my hair out by the roots and scratched my face to the bone. But I dug my nails into my thighs, through the flimsy drapery of my shroud, and bit my lips and tongue until my mouth was choked with blood, and my raving cries were muted like the gurglings of a drowning man. Again and yet again I struck my brow against the thin pine wood, getting a fierce joy from the pain. I drew up my knees as far as they could go and arched my body in a bow, determined to burst the sepulchre which held me or spend my faint remaining spark of life in one last effort at escape. My forehead crashed against the coffin lid. A wave of nausea swept over me, and faint and sick, I fell back to a merciful unconsciousness. The soft, warm sunlight of September streamed through an open window and lay upon the bed on which I lay, and from the table at my side a bowl of yellow roses sent forth a cloud of perfume. I'm surely dead, I told myself. I'm released from the grave at last. I've died and gone... where? Where was I? If this were heaven or paradise, or even purgatory, it looked suspiciously like earth. Yet how could I be living, and if I were truly dead, what business had I still on earth? Listlessly I turned my head. There, in American uniform, a captain's bars, gleaming on his shoulders, stood Donald, my Donald, whom I'd thought lost to me forever. My dear, I whispered, but got no farther, for in a moment his arms were round me and his lips were pressed to mine.
Sonia paused a moment, a smile of tenderest memory on her lips, the light that never was on sea or land within her eyes. I didn't understand at all, she told us, and even now I only know it second hand. Perhaps Donald will tell you his part of the story. He knows the details better than I. 3. La Morte Amoureuse The leaping flames behind the andirons cast pretty highlights of red and orange on Donald Tannis and his wife, as they sat hand in hand in the love seat beside the hearth rug. I suppose you gentlemen think I was pretty precipitous in love making, judging from the record Sonia's given, the young husband began with a boyish grin. But you hadn't watched beside her bed while she hovered between sanity and madness as I had, and hadn't heard her call on me and say she loved me. Besides, when she looked at me that afternoon and said, My dear, I knew she loved me just as well as though she'd taken all day long to tell me. De Grandin and Renoir nodded joint and most emphatic approval. And so you were married? De Grandin asked. You bet we were, Donald answered. There'd have been all sorts of red tape to cut if we'd been married as civilians. But I was in the army, and Sonia wasn't a French citizeness. So we went to a friend of mine who was a padre in one of our outfits, and had him tie the knot. But I'm telling this like a newspaper story, given the ending first. To begin at the start, the sawbones in the hospital told me I was a medical freak, for the effect of the bursting coal box on me was more like the Benz or caisson disease than the usual case of shell shock. I didn't go dotty, nor get the horrors. I wasn't even deafened to any extent. But I did have the most god-awful neuralgic pains, with a feeling of almost overwhelming giddiness whenever I tried to stand. I seemed as tall as the Woolworth Tower the minute I got on my feet, and seven times out of ten I'd go sprawling on my face two seconds after I got out of bed. They packed me off to a convalescent home at Biarritz and told me to forget I'd ever been mixed up in any such thing as a war. I did my best to follow orders, but one phase of the war just wouldn't be forgotten. That was the plucky girl who dragged me in that night the Fritzies tried to blow me into kingdom come. She'd been to see me in hospital before they sent me south and I'd learned her name and unit, so, as soon as I was up to it, I wrote her. Lord, how happy I was when she answered. You know how those things are. Bit by bit, stray phrases of intimacy crept into our notes, and we each got so that the other's letters were the most important things in life. Then Sonia's notes became less frequent and more formal. Finally, they hinted that she thought I was not interested any more. I did my best to disabuse her mind of that thought, but the letters came farther and farther apart. At last I decided I'd better tell her the whole truth, so I proposed by mail. I didn't like the idea, but there I was, way down in the Pyrenees, unable to get about except in a wheelchair, and there she was, somewhere on the West Front. I couldn't very well get to her to tell her of my love, and she couldn't come to me, and I was dreadfully afraid I'd lose her. Then the bottom dropped out of everything. I never got an answer to that letter. I didn't care a hang what happened to me then, just sat around and moped till the doctors began to think my brain must be affected after all. I guess about the only thing that snapped me out of it was America's coming in. With my own country sending troops across, I had a definite object in life once more, to get into American uniform and have a last go at the Jerry's. So I concentrated on getting well. It wasn't till the latter part of July, though, that they let me go, and then they wouldn't certify me for duty at the front. One more concussion and you'll go blotto altogether, lad, the commandant told me before I left the nursing home, and he must have put a flea in GHQ's ear, too, for they turned me down cold as caviar when I asked for combatant service. I'd made a fair record with the Canadians and had a couple of good friends in the war department, so I drew a consolation prize in the form of a captaincy of infantry with assignment to liaison duty with the censure militaire. The French officers in the bureau were first-rate scouts, and we got along famously. One day one of them told me of a queer case they'd had passed along by the British M.I. It seemed there was a queer sort of bird, 
a Russian by the name of Constantine, who had been making whoopee for some time, but covering up his tracks so skillfully they'd never been able to put salt on his tail. He'd been posing as an emigre and living in the Russian colony in Paris, always with plenty of money but no visible employment. After the way the Bolshevs had let the Allies down, everything Russian was regarded with suspicion, and this bird had been a source of several sleepless nights for the French intelligence. Finally, it seemed, they'd got dead wood on him. An elderly Russian, who'd been billeted in the censor's bureau and always been above suspicion, had been found dead in the streets one morning. A suicide, and the police had hardly got his body to the morgue when a letter from him came to the chief. In it, he confessed that he'd been systematically stealing information from censored documents and turning it over to Constantine, who was really an agent for the Soviets working with the Heinies. Incidentally, the old fellow named several other Russians who'd been corrupted by Constantine. It seemed his game was to lend them money when they were hard up, which they generally were, then get them to do a little innocuous spying for him in return for the loan. After that, it was easy. He had only to threaten to denounce them in order to keep them in his power and make them go on gathering information for him. And, of course, the poor fish were more and more firmly entangled in the net with each job they did for him. Just why old Captain Malakoff chose to kill himself and denounce Constantine wasn't clear, but the Frenchman figured that his conscience had been troubling him for some time, and he'd finally gotten to the point where he couldn't live with it any longer. I'd been sitting back, not paying much attention to Lieutenant Fouché's story, but when he mentioned the suicide's name, my interest was roused. Of course, Malakoff isn't an unusual Russian name, but this man had been an officer in the Imperial Army in his younger days, and had been taken in the French service practically as an act of charity. The details seemed to fit my case. I used to know a girl named Malakoff, I said. Her father was in the censorship too, I believe. Fouché smiled in that queer way he had, showing all his teeth at once beneath his little black moustache. I always suspected he was proud of the bridge work an American dentist had put in for him. Was the young lady's name Sonia by any chance? he asked. That brought me up standing. Yes, I answered. Ah, it is doubtless the daughter of our estimable suicide in that case, he replied. Attend me. Two weeks ago she married with this Constantine while she was on furlough from her unit at the front. Almost immediately after her marriage she rejoined her unit, and each day she has written her husband a letter detailing minutely the regiments and arms of service to which the wounded men she carried have belonged. These letters have, of course, been held for us by the British, and voila, our case is complete. We are prepared to spring our trap." Captain Malakoff we buried with full military honors. No one suspects he has confessed. Tonight or tomorrow we all arrest this Constantine and his accomplices. He paused and smiled unpleasantly. Then, it is dull work for the troops stationed here in Paris, he added. They will appreciate a little target practice. But, but what of Sonia, Madame Constantine? I asked. I think that we can let the lady go, he said. Doubtless she was but a tool in her husband's hands. The same influence which drove her father from his loyalty may have been exerted on her. He is a very devil with the women, this Constantine. Besides, several of his aides have confessed, so we have ample evidence on which to send him to the firing party, without the so pitiful little spy letters his wife wrote to him. She must be dismissed from the service, of course, and never may she serve in any capacity, either with the civil or military governments, but at least she will be spared a court-martial and public disgrace. Am I not kind, my friend? A few days later he came to me with a serious face. The man Constantine has been arrested, he said, but his wife, alas, she is no more. The night before last she died in their apartment fell down the stairs, and broke her lovely neck, I'm told, and yesterday they buried her in saint Sebastien. Courage, my friend, he added as he saw my face. These incidents are most regrettable, but 
There is much sorrow in the world today. C'est la guerre. He looked at me a moment. Then, you loved her? He asked softly. Better than my life, I answered. It was only the thought of her that brought me through. She dragged me in and saved my life one night out by Lens when the Jerrys knocked me over with an air bomb. Mon pauvre garçon, he sympathized. Then, consider me, my friend, there is a rumor, oh, a very unsubstantiated rumor, but still a rumor, that poor Madame Constantine did not die an entirely natural death. An aged widow neighbor of hers has related stories of a woman's cries for mercy, as though she were most brutally beaten, coming from the Constantine apartment. One does not know this is a fact. The old talk much, and frequently without good reason, but— The dog, I interrupted. The cowardly dog. If he hits Sonia, I'll— Fouché broke in. I shall attend the execution tomorrow, he informed me. Would not you like to do the same? Why I said yes, I've no idea. But something, some force outside me, seemed to urge me to accept the invitation. And so it was arranged that I should go. A few hooded street lamps were battling ineffectually with the foggy darkness when we arrived at the Santé prison a little after three next morning. Several motor cars were parked in the quadrangle, and a sergeant assigned us seats in one of them. After what seemed an interminable wait, we saw a little knot of people come from one of the narrow doors leading into the courtyard, several officers in blue and black uniforms, a civilian handcuffed to two gendarmes and a priest, and enter a car toward the head of the procession. In a moment we were under way, and I caught myself comparing our motorcade to a funeral procession on its way to the cemetery. A pale streak of dawn was showing in the east, bringing the gabled roofs and towers out in faint silhouette as we swung into the Place de la Nation. The military chauffeurs put on speed, and we were soon in the Cour de Vincennes, the historic old fortification, looming gloomy and forbidding against the sky, as we dashed noiselessly on to the Champ d'Execution, where two companies of infantry in horizon blue were drawn up facing each other, leaving a narrow lane between. At the farther end of this aisle, a stake of two-by-four had been driven into the turf, and behind and a little to the left stood a two-horse black-curtained van, from the rear of which could be seen protruding the butt of a deal coffin, rough and unfinished as a hardware merchant's packing case. A trio of unshaven workmen in black smocks lounged beside the wagon. A fourth stood at the horses' heads. As our party alighted, a double squad of musicians, stationed at the lower end of the files of troops, tossed their trumpets upward with a triple flourish, and began sounding a salute, and the soldiers came to present arms. I could see the tiny drops of misty rain shining like gouts of sweat on the steel helmets and bayonet blades as we advanced between the rows of infantry. A chill of dread ran up my spine as I glanced at the soldiers facing us on each side. Their faces were grave and stern, their eyes harder than the bayonets on their rifles. Cold, implacable hatred, pitiless as death's own self, was in every countenance. This was a spy, a secret enemy of France, who marched to his death between their perfectly aligned ranks. The wet and chilly morning air seemed surcharged with an emanation of concentrated hate and ruthlessness. When the prisoner was almost at the stake, he suddenly drew back against the handcuffs binding him to his guard, and said something over his shoulder to the colonel marching directly behind him. The officer first shook his head, then consulted with a major walking at his left, finally nodded shortly. Monsieur le Capitaine, a dapper little sub-lieutenant saluted me. The prisoner asks to speak with you. It is irregular, but the colonel has granted permission. However, you may talk with him only in the presence of a French officer. He looked coldly at me, as though suspecting I were in some way implicated in the spy's plots. You understand that, of course. I have no wish to talk with him, I began, but Fouché interrupted. Do so, my friend, he urged. Who knows? He may have news of Madame Sonia, your mort amoureuse, 
Come. I will act as witness to the conversation and stand surety for Captain Tannis, he added to the subaltern with frigid courtesy. They exchanged polite salutes and decidedly impolite glares, and Fouché and I advanced to where the prisoner and the priest stood between the guarding gendarmes. Even if I'd known nothing of him, if I'd merely passed him casually on the boulevard, Constantine would have repelled me. He was taller than the average and thin with a thinness that was something more than the sign of malnutrition. This skeletal gauntness seemed to have a distinct implication of evil. His hat had been removed, but from neck to feet he was arrayed in unrelieved black, a black shirt bound round the collar with a black cravat, a black serge suit of good cut and material, shoes of dull black leather, even gloves of black kid on his long thin hands. He had a sardonic face, long, smooth-shaven, its complexion an unhealthy yellowish olive, his eyes were black as carbon, and as lacking in luster, overhung by arched brows of intense dead black, like his hair, which was parted in the middle and brushed sharply back from the temples, leaving a point at the center in the forehead. This inverted triangle led down to a long hooked nose, and that to a long sharp chin. Between the two there ran a wide mouth with thin, cruel lips of unnatural brilliant red, looking against the sallow face as though they had been freshly rouged. An evil face it was, evil with a fathomless understanding of sin and passion, and pitiless as the visage of a predatory beast. He smiled briefly, almost imperceptibly as I approached. Captain Donald Tannis, is it not? he asked in a low, mocking voice. I bowed without replying. Monsieur le Capitaine, he proceeded, I have sent for you because I, of all the people in the world, can give you a word of comfort, and my time for disinterested philanthropy grows short. A little while ago I had the honor to take to wife a young lady in whom you had been deeply interested. Indeed, I think we might make bold to say you were in love with her, nicht wahr? As I still returned no answer, he opened that cavernous red-lipped mouth of his and gave a low, almost soundless chuckle, repulsive as the grinning of a skull. Yavol, he continued, let us waive the tender confession. Whatever your sentiments were toward her, there was no doubt of hers toward you. She married me, but it was you she loved. The marriage was of her father's doing. He was in my debt, and I pressed him for my pound of flesh. Only in this instance it was a hundred pounds or so of flesh. His daughter. He'd acted as an agent of mine at the censure militaire until he'd worn out his usefulness, so I threatened to denounce him unless he would arrange a marriage for me with the charming Sonia. Having gotten what I wanted, I had no further use for him. The sad-eyed old fool would have been a wet blanket on the ardor of my honeymoon. I told him to get out, gave him his choice between disposing of himself or facing a French firing squad. It seems now that he chose to be revenged on me at the same time he gave himself the happy dispatch. Dear, dear, who would have thought the sniveling old dotard would have had the spirit? But we digress, and the gentlemen grow impatient. He nodded toward the file of troops. We Russians have a saying that the husband who fails to beat his wife is lacking in outward manifestation of affection. He chuckled soundlessly again. I do not think my bride had cause for such complaint. What would you have given? He asked in a low, mocking whisper to have stood in my place that night three weeks ago, to have torn the clothing off her shuddering body, to have cooled her fevered blushes with your kisses, then melted her maidenly coolness with burning lips, to have strained her trembling form within your arms, then in the moment of surrender to have thrust her from you, beaten her down, hurled her to the floor and ground her underfoot till she crept suppliant to you on bare and bleeding knees, 
holding up her bruised and bleeding face to your blows, or your caresses, as you chose to give them. Utterly submissive, wholly unconditionally yours, to do it as you wished. He paused again, and I could see little runnels of sweat trickling down his high, narrow brow as he shook with passion at the picture his words had evoked. No, he laughed shortly. I fear my love became too violent at last. The fish in the pan has no fear of strangling in the air. I can tell you this without fear of increasing my penalty. Sonia's death certificate declares she died of a broken neck, resulting from a fall downstairs. Bah! She died because I beat her. I beat her to death, do you hear, my fish-blooded American, my chaste, chivalrous worshipper of women. And as she died beneath my blows, she called on you to come and save her. You thought she stopped her letters because she had grown tired? Pah! Again! She did it out of pride, because she thought that you no longer cared. At my command, her father intercepted the letters you sent to her Paris home. I read them all, even your halting, trembling proposal, which she never saw or even suspected. It was amusing, I assure you. You've come to see me die, eh? Then have your fill of seeing it. I saw Sonia die, heard her call for help to the lover who never came, saw her lower her pride to call out to the man she thought had jilted her, as I rained blow on blow upon her. Abruptly his manner changed. He was the suave and smooth-spoken gentleman once more. Auf Wiedersehen, Herr Hauptmann, he bid me with a mocking bow. I await your pleasure, messieurs, he announced, turning to the gendarmes. A detail of twelve soldiers under the command of a lieutenant with a drawn sword detached itself from the nearer company of infantry, executed a left wheel and came to halt about five meters away, their rifles at the order the bayonets removed. The colonel stepped forward and read a summary of the death sentence, and as we drew back, the gendarmes unlatched their handcuffs and bound the prisoner with his back against the post with a length of new white rope. A handkerchief was bound about his eyes, and the gendarmes stepped back quickly. Garde à vous, the firing party commander's voice rang out. Adieu pour ce monde, mon lieutenant. Do not forget the coup de grace, Constantine called airily. The lieutenant raised his sword and swung it downward quickly. A volley rang out from the platoon of riflemen. The transformation in the prisoner was instant and horrible. He collapsed, his body sagging weakly at the knees, as a filled sack collapses when its contents are let out through a cut, then sprawled full length face downward on the ground for the bullets had cut the rope restraining him. But on the turf the body writhed and contorted like a snake seared with fire, and from the widely opened mouth there came a spate of blood and gurgling, strangling cries, mingled with half-articulate curses. A corporal stepped forward from the firing party, his heavy automatic in his hand. He halted momentarily before the widening pool of blood about the writhing body, then bent over, thrust the muzzle of his weapon into the long black hair, which, disordered by his death agonies, was falling about Constantine's ears, and pulled the trigger. A dull report, like the popping of a champagne cork, sounded, and the twisting thing upon the ground gave one convulsive shudder, then lay still. This is the body of Alexis Constantine, a spy duly elected in pursuance of the sentence of death pronounced by the military court. Does anyone lay claim to it? Announced the commandant in a steady voice. No answer came, though we waited what seemed like an hour to me. A vos rangs. Marching in quick time, the execution party filed past the prostrate body on the blood-stained turf and rejoined its company, and at a second command— the two units of infantry formed columns of fours and marched from the field, the trumpets sounding at their head. The black-smocked men dragged the coffin from the black-curtained van, 
dumped the mangled body unceremoniously into it, and the driver whipped his horses into a trot toward the cemetery of Vincennes, where executed spies and traitors were interred in unmarked graves. A queer one, that, an officer of the party which had accompanied the prisoner to execution told us as we walked toward our waiting cars. When we left the Santé he was almost numb with fright, but when I told him that the coup de grâce, the mercy shot, was always given on occasions of this kind, he seemed to forget his fears, and laughed and joked with us and with his warders till the very minute when we reached the field. Tiens, he seemed to have a premonition that the volley would not at once prove fatal, and that he must suffer till the mercy shot was given. Do you recall how he reminded the platoon commander to remember the shot before the order to fire was given? Poor devil. Ah? Huh? said Jules de Grandin. Ah? Do you report that conversation accurately, my friend? Of course I do, young Tannis answered. It's stamped as firmly on my mind as if it happened yesterday. One doesn't forget such things, sir. Précisément, monsieur. De Grandin agreed with a thoughtful nod. I did but ask for verification. This may have some bearing on that which may develop later, though I hope not. What next, if you please? Young Tannis shook his head, as though to clear an unhappy memory from his mind. Just one thought kept dinning in my brain, he continued. Sonia is dead. Sonia is dead. A jeering voice seemed repeating endlessly in my ear. She called on you for help, and you failed her. By the time we arrived at the censor's bureau, I was half mad. By luncheon I'd formed a resolve. I would visit Saint-Sébastien that night and take farewell of my dead sweetheart, she whom Fouché had called my morte amoureuse. The light mist of the morning had ripened into a steady, streaming downpour by dark. By half-past eleven... When my fiacre let me down at Saint-Sébastien, the wind was blowing half a gale, and the raindrops stung like whiplashes as they beat into my face beneath the brim of my field hat. I turned my raincoat collar up as far as it would go, and splashed and waded through the puddles to the pentis of the tiny chapel beside the cemetery entrance. A light burned feebly in the intendant's cabin, and as the old fellow came shuffling to open the door in answer to my furious knocks, a cloud of superheated almost fetid air burst into my face. There must have been a one percent concentration of carbon monoxide in the room, for every opening was tightly plugged and a charcoal brazier was going full blast. He blinked stupidly at me for a moment, then, Monsieur l'Américain? he asked doubtfully, looking at my soaking hat and slicker for confirmation of his guess. Monsieur has no doubt lost his way, n'est-ce pas? This is the cemetery of Saint Sebastien. Monsieur l'Americain has not lost his way, and he is perfectly aware this is the cemetery of Saint Sebastien, I assured him. Without waiting for the invitation I knew he would not give, I pushed by him into the stuffy little cabin and kicked the door shut. Would the estimable fossoyeur care to earn a considerable sum of money? Five hundred, a thousand francs, perhaps? I asked. Sacre Dieu, he's crazy, this one, the old man muttered. Mad he is, like all the Yankees, and drunk in the bargain. Help me, blessed mother. I took him by the elbow, for he was edging slowly toward the door, and shook a bundle of hundred-franc notes before his staring eyes. Five of these now, five more when you've fulfilled your mission, and not a word to anyone, I promised. His little shoe-button eyes shone with speculative avarice. Monsieur desires that I help him kill someone, he ventured. Is it perhaps that monsieur has outside the body of one whom he would have secretly interred? Nothing as bad as that, I answered, laughing in spite of myself, then stated my desires boldly. Will you do it at once? I finished. For fifteen hundred francs, perhaps he began, but I shut him off. A thousand or nothing, I told him. Mille tonnerre, monsieur, you have no heart, he assured me. A poor man can scarcely live these days, and the risk I run is great. However, he added hastily, as I folded the bills and prepared to thrust them back into my pocket, 
However one consents. There is nothing else to do. He slouched off to a corner of the hut and picked up a rusty spade and mattock. Come, let us go, he growled, dropping a folded burlap sack across his shoulders. The rain, wind-driven between the leafless branches of the poplar trees, beat dismally down upon the age-stained marble tombs and the rough, unsodded mounds of the ten-year concessions. Huddled by the farther wall of the cemetery, beneath their rows of ghastly white wooden signboards, the five- and three-year concessions seemed to cower from the storm. These were the graves of the poorer dead, one step above the tenants of the potter's field. The rich who owned their tombs or graves in perpetuity slept their last long sleep undisturbed. Next came the rows of ten-year concessionaires, whose relatives had bought them the right to lie in moderately deep graves for a decade, after which their bones would be exhumed and deposited in a common charnel house, all trace of their identity lost. The five-year concessionaires' graves were scarcely deeper than the height of the coffins they enclosed, and their repose was limited to half a decade while the three-year concessions, placed nearest the cemetery wall, were little more than mounds of sodden earth heaped over coffins sunk scarce a foot underground, destined to be broken down and emptied in thirty-six months. The sexton led the way to one of these and began shoveling off the earth with his spade. His tools struck an obstruction with a thud, and in a moment he was wrenching at the coffin top with the flat end of his mattock. I took the candle lantern he had brought and flashed its feeble light into the coffin. Sonia lay before me, rigid as though petrified, her hands tight clenched, the nails digging into the soft flesh of her palms, little streams of dried blood running from each self-inflicted wound. Her eyes were closed, thank heaven, her mouth a little open, and on her lips there lay a double line of bloody froth. Grand Dieu! The sexton cried as he looked past me into the violated coffin. Come away quickly, monsieur. It is a vampire that we see. Behold the lifelike countenance, the opened mouth all bloody from the devil's breakfast, the hands all wet with human blood. Come, I will strike it to the heart with my pickaxe and sever its unhallowed head with my spade. Then we shall fill the grave again and go away all quickly. O oh, Sainte Vierge, have pity on us. See, si, monsieur, I do begin. He laid the spur-end of his mattock against Sonia's left breast, and I could see the flimsy crepe night-robe she wore by way of shroud and the soft flesh beneath dimple under the iron's weight. "'Stop it, you fool!' I bellowed, snatching his pickaxe and bending forward. "'You shan't!' Some impulse prompted me to rearrange the shroud where the muddy mattock had soiled it, and as my hand came into contact with the beloved body, I started. The flesh was warm. I thrust the doddering old sexton back with a tremendous shove, and he landed sitting in a pool of mud and water and squatted there, mouthing bleating admonitions to me to come away. Sinking to my knees beside the grave, I put my hand against her breast, then laid a finger on her throat beneath the angle of the jaw, as they'd taught us in first aid class. There was no doubt of it, faint as the fluttering of a fledgling thrust prematurely from its nest, and almost perished with exposure, but still perceptible. A feeble pulse was beating in her breast and throat. A moment later I had snatched my raincoat off, wrapped it about her, and flinging a handful of banknotes at the screaming sexton, I clasped her flaccid body in my arms, sloshed through the mud to the cemetery wall, and vaulted over it. I found myself in a sort of alley, flanked on both sides by stables, a pale light burning at its farther end. Toward this I made, bending almost double against the driving rain, in order to shield my precious burden from the storm, and to present the poorest target possible if the sexton should procure a gun and take a pot shot at me. It seemed as though I waded through the rain for hours, though actually I don't suppose I walked for more than twenty minutes before a prowling taxi hailed me. I jumped into the vehicle and told the man to drive to my quarters as fast as his old rattle-trap would go, and while we skidded through the sodden streets, I propped Sonia up against the cushions and wrapped my blouse about her feet while I held her hands in mine, chafing them and breathing on them. 
Once in my room, I put her into bed, piled all the covers I could about her, heated water and soaked some flannel cloths in it, and put the hot rolls to her feet. Then mixed some cognac and water, and forced several spoonfuls of it down her throat. I must have worked an hour, but finally my clumsy treatment began to show results. The faintest flush appeared in her cheeks, and a tinge of color came to the pale wounded lips which I'd wiped clean of blood, and bathed in water and cologne when I first put her into bed. As soon as I dared leave her for a moment, I hustled out and roused the concierge and sent her scrambling for a doctor. It seemed a week before he came, and when he did he merely wrote me a prescription, looked importantly through his pass nay, and suggested that I have him call next morning. I pleaded illness at the bureau, and went home from the surgeon's office with advice to stay indoors as much as possible for the next week. I was a sort of privileged character, you see, and got away with shameless malingering which would have gotten any other fellow a good sound roasting from the sawbones. Every moment after that which I could steal from my light duties at the bureau, I spent with Sonia. Old Madame Couchin, the concierge, I drafted into service as a nurse, and she accepted the situation with the typical Frenchwoman's aplomb. It was September before Sonia finally came back to full consciousness and then she was so weak that the month was nearly gone before she could totter out with me to get a little sunshine and fresh air in the bois. We had a wonderful time, shopping at the Galerie Lafayette, replacing the horrifying garments Madame Couchin had bought for us with a suitable wardrobe. Sonia took rooms at a little pension, and in October we were... Ha! <laughs> Parbleu! Married at last! Jules de Grandin exclaimed with a delighted chuckle. Mille capots, my friend. I thought we never should have got you to that parson's door. Yes, and so we were married, Tannis agreed with a smile. The girl lifted her husband's hand and cuddled it against her cheek. Please, Donald dear, she pleaded. Please don't let Constantine take me from you again. But darling, the young man protested, I tell you, you must be mistaken. "'Mustn't she, Dr. de Grandin? he appealed. "'If I saw Constantine fall before a firing party "'and saw the corporal blow his brains out "'and saw them nail him in his coffin, "'he must be dead, mustn't he? "'Tell her she can't be right, sir.' "'But, Donald, you saw me in my coffin, too,' the girl began. "'My friends,' de Grandin interrupted gravely, "'it may be that you are both right.' though the good God forbid that it is so. 4. Menace Out of Bedlam Donald and Sonia Tannis regarded him with open-mouthed astonishment. You mean it's possible Constantine might have escaped in some mysterious way, and actually come here? the young man asked at last. The little Frenchman made no answer, but the grave regard he bent on them seemed more ominous than any vocally expressed opinion. "'But I say,' Tannis burst out, as though stung to words by de Grandin's silence, "'he can't take her from me. I can't say I know much about such things, but surely the law won't let—' "'Ah, bah!' Inspector Renoir's sardonic laugh cut him short. "'The law,' he jibed. "'What is it?' Parfum d'un chameau. I think in this country it is a code devised to give the criminal license to make the long nose at honest men, yes. A month and more ago I came to this so splendid country in search of one who has most richly deserved the kiss of Madame Guillotine, and here I catch him, red-handed in most flagrant crime. You are arrest, I tell him, for willful murder— for sedition and subornation of sedition, and for stirring up rebellion against the Republic of France, I make you arrested. Voila! I take him to the Ministry of Justice. Monsieur, I say, I have here a very noted criminal whom I desire to return to French jurisdiction, that he may suffer according to his misdoings. Certainly. Hello, what happens? The gentlemen at the Palais de Justice tell me, it shall be, even as you say. Do they assist me? Alas, entirely otherwise, in furtherance of his diabolical designs. This one has here abducted a young American lady, and on her has committed the most abominable assault. 
For this, say the American authorities, he must suffer. How much, I ask? Will his punishment be death? Oh, no, they answer me. We shall incarcerate him in the Bastille for ten years, perhaps fifteen. Bien alors, I tell him, let us compose our differences amicably. Me, I have traced this despicable one clear across the world. I have made him arrested for his crimes. I am prepared to take him where a most efficient executioner will decapitate his head with all celerity. Voilà tout. A man dies but once. Let this one die for the crime which is a capital offence by the laws of France, and which is not but should be capital by American law. That way we shall both be vindicated. Is not my logic absolute? Would not a three-year-old child of most deficient intellect be convinced by it? Of course, but these ones? No. We sympathize with you, they tell me. But to la même he stays with us to expiate his crime in prison. Then they begin his prosecution. Grand Dieu, the farce that trial is. First come the lawyers with their endless tongues and heavy words to make fools of the jury. Next comes a corps of doctors who will testify to anything so long as they are paid. Not guilty by reason of insanity, the verdict is. And so they take him to a madhouse. Not only that, he added, his grievance suddenly becoming vocal again. They tell me that should this despicable one recover from his madness, he will be discharged from custody and may successfully resist extradition by the government of France. Renoir is made the fool of. If he could but once get his hands on this criminal, son Apoy, or if that half-brother of Satan would but manage to escape from the madhouse, that I might find him unprotected by the attendants. Crash! I ducked my head involuntarily as a missile whistled through the sleep-drenched night, struck the study window a shattering blow and hurtled across the room, smashing against the farther wall with a resounding crack. Renoir, the Tannises, and I leaped to our feet as the egg-like object burst and a sickly sweet smell permeated the atmosphere. But Jules de Grandin seemed suddenly to go wild. As though propelled by a powerful spring, he bounded from the couch, cleared the six feet or so, separating him from Sonia in a single flying leap, and snatched at the trailing drapery of her dinner frock, ripping a length of silk off with a furious tug and flinging it veil-wise about her head. Out! For your lives, go out! he cried, covering his mouth and nose with a wadded handkerchief, and pushing the girl before him toward the door. We obeyed instinctively, and though a scant ten seconds intervened between the entry of the missile and our exit, I was already feeling a stinging sensation in my eyes, and a constriction in my throat, as though a ligature had been drawn around it. Tears were streaming from Renoir's and Tannis's eyes, too, as we rushed pell-mell into the hall and de Grandin slammed the door behind us. What? I began, but he waved me back. Papers! Newspapers! All you have! He ordered hysterically, snatching a rug from the hall floor and stuffing it against the crack between the door and sill. I took a copy of the evening news from the hall table and handed it to him, and he fell to tearing it in strips and stuffing the cracks about the door with fierce energy. To the rear door, he ordered. Open it and breathe as deeply as you may. I do not think we were exposed enough to do us permanent injury, but fresh air will help in any event. I humbly beg your pardon, Madame Tanis, he added as he joined us in the kitchen a moment later. It was most unconventional to set on you and tear your gown to shreds the way I did, but... He turned to Tanis with a questioning smile. Perhaps monsieur your husband can tell you what it was we smelled in the study a moment before. I'll tell the world I can, young Donald answered. I smelt that stuff at Mons, and it darn near put me in my grave. You saved us, no doubt about it, Dr. de Grandin. It's tricky, that stuff. What is? I asked. This understanding talk of theirs got on my nerves. Name of a thousand pestiferous mosquitoes. Yes, what was it? Renoir put in. Phosgene gas, COC-12, de Grandin answered. It was among the earliest of gases used in the late war, and therefore not so deadly as the others. But it is not a healthy thing to be inhaled, my friend, 
However, I think that in a little while the study will be safe, for that broken window makes a most efficient ventilator, and the phosgene is quickly dissipated in the air. Had he used mustard gas, tiens, one does not like to speculate on such unpleasant things, no. He? I echoed. Who the dickens are you talking? There was something grim in the smile which hovered beneath the upturned ends of his tightly waxed wheat-blonde moustache. I damn think friend Renoir has his wish, he answered, and a light which heralded the joy of combat shone in his small blue eyes. If Sun Apoi has not burst from his madhouse and come to tell us that the game of hide-and-go-seek is on once more, I am much more mistaken than I think. Yes, certainly. The whining, warning, wing of a police car's siren sounded in the street outside, and heavy feet tramped my front veranda, while heavy fists beat furiously on the door. Ouch, God be praised, you're all right, Dr. de Grandin, sir. Detective Sergeant Jeremiah Costello burst into the house, his greatcoat collar turned up round his ears, a shining film of sleet encasing the black derby hat he wore habitually. We came here hell-bent for election to warn you, sir, he added breathlessly. We just heard it ourselves, and— Tiens, so did we, de Grandin interrupted with a chuckle. Huh? What are you talking of, sir? I've come to warn you. That the efficiently resourceful Dr. Sun Apoi, of Cambodia and elsewhere, has burst the bonds of Bedlam and taken to the warpath, n'est-ce pas? De Grandin laughed outright at the Irishman's amazed expression. Come, my friend, he added, there is no magic here. I did not gaze into a crystal and go into a trance, then say, I see it all. Sunapoy has escaped from the asylum for the criminal insane and comes to this place to work his mischief. Indeed, no. Entirely otherwise. Some fifteen minutes gone, the good Renoir expressed a wish that Dr. Sun might manage his escape, so that the two might come to grips once more, and hardly had the words flown from his lips when a phosgene bomb was merrily tossed through the window, and it was only by a hasty exit we escaped the inconvenience of asphyxiation. I am not popular with many people, and there are those who would shed few tears at my funeral. "'but I do not know of one who would take pleasure "'in throwing a stink-bomb through the window to stifle me. "'No such clever tricks as that belong to Dr. Sun, "'who loves me not at all, "'but who dislikes my friend Renoir even more cordially. Alors, I deduce that Sun Apoi is out again "'and we shall have amusement for some time to come. "'Am I correct?' "'Check and double-check, as the fellow says,' Costello nodded. "'Twas just past dark this evening whilst the warders was going through the state asylum, seeing everything was ship for the night, sir, that Dr. Sun did his disappearing act. He'd been meek as any lamb ever since they took him to the bug house, and the orderlies down there had decided he weren't such a bad actor after all. "'Well, sir, the turnkey passed his door, and this Dr. Sun invites him in to see a drawing he's made. He's a clever filly with his hands, for all his being crippled, and the boys at the asylum is always glad to see what he's been up to making. The poor chap didn't have no more chance than a sparry in the cat's mouth, sir. Somewhere the Chinese devil had got hold of a table knife and ground it to a razor edge. One swipe of that across the turnkey's throat, and he's flopping round the floor like a chicken with its head cut off, not able to make no outcry for the blood that's strangling him. A poor knot across the corridor lets out a squawk, and Dr. Sun ups and cuts his throat, as cool as you'd pare a apple for your luncheon, sir. They finds this out from another inmate that's seen it all, but had sense enough in his poor crazy head to keep his mouth shut, till after it's all over. You know the cell doors ain't locked, but the different wards is barred off from each other with corridors between. This Dr. Sun takes the warder's uniform cap as calm as you please, and claps it on his ugly head. Then walks to the ward door and unlocks it with the keys he's taken from the turnkey. The guard on duty in the corridor don't notice nothing till Sun's clear through the door. Then it's too late, for Sun stabs him to the heart before he can so much as raise his club and beats it down the corridor. There's a fire escape at the other end of the passage. One of them spiral things that works like a slide inside a sheet-iron cylinder, you know. 
It's locked, but Son has the key. And in a moment he slipped inside, locked the door behind him, and slid down faster than a snake on roller skates. He's into the grounds and over the wall before they even know he's loose, and he must have had Confederates waiting for him outside, for they heard the roar of the car running like the hammers of hell, whilst they're still sounding the alarm. Of course the state troopers and the local police was notified, but it seems to have got clean away, except... Yes, except... De Grandin prompted breathlessly, his little round blue eyes sparkling with excitement. Well, sir, we don't rightly know it was him, but we're suspecting it. They found a trooper run down in kilt on the highway over by Morristown, with his motorcycle bent up like a pretzel and not a whole bone left in his body. Looks like son's work, don't it, sir? Assuredly, the Frenchman nodded. Is there more to tell? Nothing except he's gone, evaporated, vanished into thin air, as the saying is, sir. But we figured he's still nursing a grudge again, Inspector Renoir and you, and maybe come to settle it, so we come fast as we could to warn you. Your figuring is accurate, my friend, de Grandin answered with another smile. May we trespass on your good nature to ask that you escort Monsieur and Madame Tannis home? I should not like them to encounter Dr. Sunapoy, for he plays roughly. As for us, Renoir, friend Trowbridge, and me, we shall do very well unguarded for tonight. Good Dr. Sun has shot his bolt. He will not be up to other tricks for a little time, I think, for he undoubtedly has a hideaway prepared, and to it he has gone. He would not linger here, knowing the entire gendarmerie is on his heels. No, to hit and run and run as quickly as he hits, will be his policy, for a time at least. 5. Desecration Dr. de Grandin, gentlemen! Donald Tannis burst into the breakfast room as de Grandin, Renoir, and I were completing our morning meal next day. Sonia, my wife! She's gone! Eh? What is it you tell me? de Grandin asked. Gone? Yes, sir. She rides every morning, you see, and today she left for a canter in the park at six o'clock as usual. I didn't feel up to going out this morning and lay abed rather late. I was just going down to breakfast when they told me her horse had come back to the stable. Alone. Oh, perhaps she had a tumble in the park, I suggested soothingly. Have you looked? I've looked everywhere, he broke in. Soldier's Park's not very large, and if she'd been in it, I'd have found her long ago. After what happened last night, I'm afraid. More bleu, mon pauvre, you fear with reason, de Grandin cut him short. Come, let us go. We must seek her. We must find her right away at once, without delay, for— If you please, sir, Sergeant Costello's asking for Dr. de Grandin, announced Nora McGuinness, appearing at the breakfast-room door. He's got a furrin gentleman with him. She amplified as de Grandin gave an exclamation of impatience at the interruption. And says as how he's most particular to talk with you a minute. Father Pophosopholos, shepherd of the little flock of Greeks, Lithuanians, and Russians composing the congregation of St. Basil's Church, paused at the doorway beside the big Irish policeman with uplifted hand, as he invoked divine blessing on the inmates of the room then advanced with smiling countenance to take the slim white fingers de Grandin extended. The aged papa and the little Frenchman were firmest friends, though one lived in a thought world of the Middle Ages, while the other's thoughts were modern as the latest model airplane. My son, the old man greeted, the powers of evil were abroad last night. The greatest treasure in the world was ravished from my keeping, and I come to you for help. A treasure, mon père? de Grandin asked. Father Pophosophalos rose from his chair, and we forgot the cheap, worn stuff of his purple cassock, his broken shoes, even the pinchbeck gold and imitation amethyst of his pectoral cross, as he stood in patriarchal majesty with upraised hands and back-thrown head. The most precious body and blood of our blessed Lord, he answered sonorously. Last night, between the sunset and the dawn, they broke into the church and bore away the Holy Eucharist. For a moment he paused, 
Then in all reverence echoed the Magdalene's despairing cry. They have taken away my lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Ah, do you say it? The momentary annoyance de Grandin had evinced at the old priest's intrusion vanished as he gazed at the cleric with a level stare of fierce intensity. Tell me of the sacrilege. All, tell me all, right away at once, immediately. I am all attention. Father Pophesophilus resumed his seat, and the sudden fire which animated him died down. Once more he was a tired old man, the threadbare shepherd of a half-starved flock. I saw you smile when I mentioned a treasure being stolen from me, he told de Grandin gently. You were justified, my son, for St. Basil's is a poor church, and I am poorer still. Only the faith which is in me sustains me through the struggle. We ask no help from the public, and receive none. The rich Latins look on us with pity. The Anglicans sometimes give us slight assistance. The Protestant heretics scarcely know that we exist. We are a joke to them, and because we are poor, they sometimes play mischievous pranks on us. Their boys stone our windows, and once or twice, when parties of their young people have come slumming, they have disturbed our services with their thoughtless laughter or ill-bred talking during service. Our liturgy is only meaningless mummery to them, you see. But this was no childish mischief, not even the vandalism of irreverent young hoodlums. His face flushed above its frame of grey beard. This was deliberately planned and maliciously executed blasphemy and sacrilege. Our rubric makes no provision for the low mass like the Latins, he explained and daily celebration of the Eucharist is not enjoined, so our ceremony of consecration is a lengthy one. We customarily celebrate only once or twice a week, and the pre-sanctified elements are reserved in a tabernacle on the altar. This morning, as I entered the sanctuary, I found everything in disorder. The veils had been torn from the table, thrown upon the floor, and fouled with filth. The icon of the Virgin had been ripped from the Reredos and the tabernacle violated. They had carried off the elements together with the chalice and pattern, and in their place had thrust into the tabernacle the putrefying carcass of a cat. Tears welled in the old man's eyes as he told of the sacrilege. Costello's face went brick-red with an angry flush, for the insult put upon the consecrated elements stung every fibre of his nature. Bad cess to him, he muttered. May they have the curse of Cromwell. They took my chasuble and cope, my alb, my mitre, and my stole, the priest continued. And from the sacristy they took the deacon's vestments. Grand Dieu, I damn perceive their game, the little Frenchman almost shouted. At first I thought this might be but an act of wantonness performed by wicked boys. I have seen such things. Also, the chalice and the pattern might have some little value to a thief, but this is no mere case of thievery mixed with sacrilege. No, the stealing of the vestments is conclusive proof. Tell me, mon père, he interrupted himself with seeming irrelevance. It is true, is it not, that only the celebrant and the deacon are necessary for the office of consecration? No subdeacon is required. The old priest nodded wonderingly and these elements were already consecrated. They were already consecrated, the clergyman returned. Pre-sanctified, we call it, when they are reserved for future services. Thank God, no little one then stands in peril, the Grandin answered. Mon père, it gives me greatest joy to say I'll aid in tracking down these miscreants. Monsieur Tannis, unless I am more greatly mistaken than I think, there is direct connection between your lady's disappearance and this act of sacrilege. Yes, I'm sure of it. He nodded several times with increasing vigor. But, my dear fellow, I expostulated, what possible connection can there be between— Shit! He cut me short. This is the doing of that villain Constantine, assuredly. The wife he has again abducted, though he has not attempted to go near the husband. For why? Pardieu, because by leaving Monsieur Donald free, he still permits the wife one little tiny ray of hope. 
With vilest subtlety he holds her back from the black brink of despair and suicide that he may force her to compliance to his will by threats against the man she loves. Sacre nom d'un artichaut, I shall say yes. Certainly, of course. You, you mean he'll make Sonia go with him? Leave me? By threats against my life? Young Tannis faltered. Precisément. That and more, I fear, monsieur. De Grandin answered somberly. But what worse can he do than that? You, you don't think he'll kill her, do you? The husband cried. The little Frenchman rose and paced the study a moment in thoughtful silence. At last, courage, mon brave, he bade, putting a kindly hand on Tannis's shoulder. You and Madame Sonia have faced perils, even the perils of the grave before. Take heart, I shall not hide from you that your present case is as desperate as any you have faced before. But if my guess is right, as heaven knows I hope it is not, your lady stands in no immediate bodily peril. If that were all we had to fear, we might afford to rest more easily. As it is, as it is, Renoir cut in. Let us go with all celerity to St. Basil's Church and look to see what we can find. The trail grows cold, mon Jules, but— But we shall find and follow it, de Grandin interrupted. Parbleu will follow it, though it may lead to the fire doors of hell's own furnaces, and then— The sharp, insistent ringing of the telephone broke through his fervid prophecy. This is Miss Wilkinson, supervisor at Casualty Hospital, Dr. Trowbridge, a professionally precise feminine voice informed me. If Detective Sergeant Costello is at your office, we've a message for him. Officer Hornsby is here, about to go on the table, and insists we put a message through to Sergeant Costello at once. We've already called him at headquarters, and they told us— Just a minute, I bade. It's for you, Sergeant, I told Costello, handing him the instrument. Yes? Costello called into the mouthpiece. Yes? Uh-huh. What? Glory be to God! He swung on us with flushing face and blazing eyes. "'Twas Hornsby, he announced. He was doing relief traffic duty out at Auburndale and Gloucester Streets, and a car run him down half an hour ago. There was no witnesses to the accident, and Hornsby couldn't get the license number. But just before they struck him, he seen a filly riding in the car. You'll be remembering Hornsby was in the raiding party that captured this here doctor's son, he asked de Grandin. The Frenchman nodded. Well, sir, Hornsby's got the camera eye. He don't forget a face once he's seen it, even for a second, and he tells me Dr. Son was riding in the car that bowled him over. They run him down deliberate, sir, and Son Apoy was riding with a tall, long, black-faced filly with slanting eyebrows and a Pan like the pictures you see a Satan in the churches, sir. And what was this one doing with his pan? Renoir demanded. Is it that? Pan! Costello shouted, raising his voice as many people do when seeking to make clear their meaning to a foreigner. Twas his pan I'm speaking of. Not a pan. His pan. His mush. His map. His puss, you know. Pas possible. The miscreant held a pan of mush for his cat to eat, and a map also, while his motor-car ran down the gendarme? Oh, go sit in a tree. No, Costello roared. It's his face I'm after telling you of. Hornsby said he had a face. A face, get me? A face is a pan, and a pan's a face, like the devil's. And he was riding in the same car with this here now, Dr. Sunapoy, that's made his get away from the asylum. Savvy? Oh, may we? The Frenchman grinned. I apprehend. It is another of this old droll American idioms which you employ. Wida, I perceive him. Tis plain as any pike staff they meant to do him in deliberately, Costello went on. And they like to make good, too. The poor fellow's collarbone has broke, and so is several ribs. But glory be to heaven they was going so fast, they bumped him clean out of the road and onto the sidewalk and they kept on going like the hammers of hell, without waiting to see how much they'd hurt him. "'You hear, my friends?' de Grandin cried, leaping to his feet. 
eyes flashing, diminutive wheat-blonde mustache twitching with excitement like the whiskers of an angry tomcat. You heard the message of this gloriously devoted officer of the law who sends intelligence to Costello, even as he waits to go upon the operating table. What does it mean, I ask? No, I demand, what does it mean? Son Apoy rides in a car which maims and injures the police, and with him rides another with a face like Satan's. Mon Dieu, mes amis, we shall have hunting worthy of our utmost skill, I think. Son Apoy and Constantine have met and combined against us. Come, my friends, let us take their challenge. Come, Renoir, my old one. This is more than mere police work. The enemy laughs at our face. He makes the thumb nose at us and at all for which we stand. Forward to the battle, brave comrade. Pour la France. 6. Allies Unawares Four of us, de Grandin, Renoir, Donald Tannis and I, sat before my study fire and stared gloomily into the flames. All day the other three, accompanied by Costello, had combed the city and environs. But neither sign nor clue, trail nor trace of the missing woman could they find. By heaven, Tanis cried, striking his forehead with his hand in impotent fury. It looks as if the fellow were the devil himself. Not so bad a guess, mon brave. De Grandin nodded gloomily. Certain it is he is on friendly terms with the dark powers, and as usual Satan is most kindly to his own. Ah, bah, mon Jules, Renoir rejoined. You do but make a bad matter so much worse with your mumblings of Satan and his cohorts. Is it not sufficient that two poor ladies of this town are placed in deadly peril without your prating of diabolical opponents and... Two ladies? Tanis interrupted wonderingly. Why has he abducted someone else? Bien non, Renoir's quick explanation came. It is of another that I speak, monsieur. This Constantine, who has in some way met with Sonapoy and made a treaty of alliance with him, has taken your poor lady for revenge, even as he sought to do when we first met him. But Sonapoy has also reasons to desire similar vengeance of his own, and all too well we know how far his insane jealousy and lust will lead him. Regard me, if you please. As I have previously told you, I came across the world in search of Sonapoy, and took him bloody-handed in commission of a crime of violence. Clear from Cambodia I trailed him, for there he met, and having met, desired, a white girl dancer in the mighty temple shrine at Angkor. Just who she was we do not know for certain, but strongly circumstantial evidence would indicate she was the daughter of a missionary gentleman named Crownshield, an American, who had been murdered by the natives at the instigation of the heathen priests, and whose widowed mother had been spirited away and lodged within the temple until she knew the time of woman and her child was born. Then, we suppose, the mother too was done to death, and the little white girl reared as a bayadere or temple dancer. The years went on, and to Cambodia came a young countryman of yours, a citizen of Harrisonville who met and loved this nameless mystery of a temple corifé, known only as Tiba, the dancing woman of the temple. And she returned his passion, for in Cambodia as elsewhere, like cries aloud to like, and this milk-skinned, violet-eyed inmate of a heathen shrine knew herself not akin to her brown-faced fellow-members of the temple's corps du ballet. Enfin, they did elope and hasten to the young man's home in this city, and on their trail, blood-lustful as a tiger in the hunt, there followed Sunapoy, determined to retake the girl whom he had purchased from the priests, if possible, to slay the man on whom her favour rested also. Parbleu, and as the shadow follows the body when the sun is low, Renoir did dog the footsteps of this Sunapoy, yes. Tiens, almost the wicked one succeeded in his plans for vengeance. But with the aid of Jules de Grandin, who is a clever fellow for all his stupid looks and silly ways, I captured him and saved the little lady. 
now a happy wife, and an American citizeness by marriage and adoption. How I then fared, how this miscreant of a sonapoi made apes and monkeys of the law, and lodged himself all safely in a madhouse, I have already related. How he escaped, and all but gave me my quietus, you know, from personal first-hand experience, certainly. Now consider, somewhere in the vicinage there lurk these two near mad men with twin maggots of jealousy and vengeance gnawing at their brains. Your so unfortunate lady is already in their power. Constantine has scored a point in his game of passion and revenge. But I know Sonapoi, a merchant prince he was in former days, the son of generations of merchant princes and Chinese merchant princes in the bargain. Such being so, I know all well that Sonapoi has not united forces with this Constantine unless he is assured of compensation. My death, poof, a bagatelle, me he can kill, at least he can attempt my life, whenever he desires, and do it all unaided. Last night we saw how great his resource is, and how casually he tossed a stink bomb through the window by way of telling me he was at liberty once more. No, no, my friend, he has not joined with Constantine merely to be assured that Renoir goes home in one of those elaborate containers for the dead your undertakers sell. On the contrary, he seeks to regain the custody of her who flouted his advances and ran off with another man. Thus far his purpose coincides with Constantine's. They both desire women whom other men have won. One has succeeded in his quest, at least for the time being. The other still must make his purpose good. Already they have run down a gendarme who stood in their way. Thus far they work in concert. Beyond a doubt they will continue to be allies till their plans are consummated. Yes. The clatter of the front-door knocker silenced him, and I rose to answer the alarm, knowing Nora McGuinness had long since gone to bed. Is there a fellow named Renyard here? demanded a hoarse voice, as I swung back the door and beheld a most untidy taxi man in the act of assaulting the knocker again. There's a gentleman named Renoir stopping here, I answered coldly. What? All right, tell him to come out and get his friend, then. He's out in my cab, drunk as a hard-boiled owl, and won't stir a foot till this here Renyard fella comes for him. Tell him to make it snappy, will you, buddy? This here Chinaman's so potted I'm scared he's going to— A Chinaman? I cut in sharply. What sort of Chinaman? A damn skinny one, and a mean one, too, ordering me about like I was a servant or something, and— Renoir, de Grandin, I called over my shoulder. Come here quickly, please. There's a Chinaman out there in that cab. A skinny Chinaman, the driver calls him, and he wants Renoir to come out to him. Do you suppose— Sacre nom d'un porc, I damn do. De Grandin answered. To the taxi man he ordered, Bring your passenger in at once, my friend. We cannot come out to him, but... Say, fella, I ain't taking no more orders from a frog than I am from a chink, get me? The cabman interposed truculently. You'll come out and get this here drunk and like it, or else... Precisément, or else... De Grandin shot back sharply and the porch-light's rays gleamed on the wicked-looking barrel of his small but deadly automatic pistol. Will you obey me, or must I shoot? The taxi-man obeyed, though slowly, with many a backward fearful glance, as though he did not know what instant the Frenchman's pistol might spit death. From the cab he helped a delicate bent form muffled to the ears in a dark overcoat, and assisted it slowly up the steps. Here he is, he muttered angrily, as he transferred his tottering charge to Renoir's waiting hands. The shrouded form reeled weakly at each step, as de Grandin and Renoir assisted it down the hall and guided it to an armchair by the fire. For a moment silence reigned within the study, the visitant crouching motionless in his seat and wheezing asthmatically at intervals. At length de Grandin crossed the room, took the wide brim of the black felt hat which obscured the man's face in both his hands, and wrenched the headgear off. Ah, huh? 
he ejaculated as the light struck upon the caller's face. Huh? I thought as much. Renoir breathed quickly, almost with a snort, as he beheld the livid countenance turned toward him. Sunapoi, thou species of a stinking camel, what filthy joke is this you play? he asked suspiciously. The Chinaman smiled with a sort of ghastly parody of mirth. His face seemed composed entirely of parchment-like skin, stretched drum-tight above the bony processes. His little deep-set eyes were terrible to look at as empty sockets in a skull. His lips, paper-thin and bloodless, were retracted from a set of broken and discolored teeth. The countenance was as lifeless and revolting as the mummy of Ramesses in the British Museum, and differed from the dead man's principally in that it was instinct with conscious evil, and lacked the majesty and repose of death. "'Does this look like a jest?' he asked in a low, faltering voice, and with a twisted claw-like hand laid back a fold of his fur overcoat. The silken Chinese blouse within was stained with fresh warm blood, and the gory spot grew larger with each pulsation of his heart. Morbleu, it seems you have collided with just retribution, de Grandin commented dryly. Is it that you are come to us for treatment by any happy chance? Partly, the other answered, as another horrifying counterfeit of mirth writhed across his livid mouth. Dr. Jules de Grandin is a surgeon and a man of honor. The oath of Esculapius and the obligation of his craft will not allow him to refuse aid to a wounded man who comes to him for succor, whoever that man may be. Eh bien, you have me there, de Grandin countered. But I am under no compulsion to keep your presence here a secret. While I am working on your wound, the police will be coming with all haste to take you back in custody. You realize that, of course. We cut away his shirt and singlet, for undressing him would have been too hazardous. To the left, between the fifth and sixth ribs, a little in front of the mid-axillary line, there gaped a long incised wound, obviously the result of a knife thrust. Extensive hemorrhage had already taken place, and the patient was weakening quickly from loss of blood. A gauze pack and styptic collodion, de Grandin whispered softly. And then perhaps ten minims of adrenaline. It's all that we can do, I fear. The state will save electric current by this evening's work, my friend. He'll never live to occupy the chair of execution. The treatment finished, we propped the patient up with pillows. Dr. Sun, de Grandin announced professionally. It is my duty to inform you that death is very near. I greatly doubt that you will live till morning. I realize that, the other answered weakly. Nor am I sorry it is so. This wound has brought me back my sanity— and I am once again the man I was before I suffered madness. All I have done while I was mentally deranged comes back to me like memories of a disagreeable dream, and when I think of what I was and what I have become, I am content that Suna Boy should die. But before I go, I must discharge my debt, pay you my fee, he added with another smile and this time, I thought, there was more of gentleness than irony in the grimace. My time is short, and I must leave some details out, but such facts as you desire shall be yours, he added. This morning I met Constantine the Russian as I fled the police, and we agreed to join forces to combat you. He seemed to be a man beset like me by the police, and gladly did I welcome him as ally. He paused a moment, and a quick spasm of pain flickered in his face, but he fought it down. In the East we learn early of some things the Western world will never learn, he gasped. The lore of China is filled with stories of some beings whose existence you deride. Yet they are real, though happily they become more rare each day. Constantine is one of them, not wholly man 
nor yet entirely demon, but a dreadful hybrid of the two. Not till he'd taken me to his lair did I discover this. He is a servant of the evil one. It cost my life to come and tell you, but he must be exterminated. My life for his, the bargain is a trade by which the world will profit. What matters, Sunapoi, beside the safety of humanity? Constantine is virtually immortal, but he can be killed, unless you hunt him out and slay him. We know all this, de Grandin interrupted. At least I have suspected it. Tell us while you have time where we may find him, and I assure you we shall do to him according to his sins. Old Shepherd's Inn, near Chestertown. The old deserted place, padlocked three years ago for violation of the prohibition law. The Chinaman broke in. You'll find him there at night, and with him go there before the moon has set. By day he's abroad, and with him goes his captive, held fast in bonds of fear. But when the moon has climbed the heavens... He broke off with a sigh of pain, and little beads of perspiration shone upon his brow. The man was going fast. The pauses between his words were longer, and his voice was scarcely louder than a whisper. Renoir. He rolled his head toward the inspector. In the old days, you called me friend. Can you forget the things I did in madness, and say goodbye to the man you used to know? Will you take my hand, Renoir? I cannot hold it out to you. I am too weak. But— Assuredly, I shall do more, mon vieux. Renoir broke in. Je vous salue. He drew himself erect, and raised his right hand in stiff and formal military greeting. Jules de Grandin followed suit. Then, in turn, they took the dying man's hand in theirs and shook it solemnly. Shades of honorable ancestors comes now. Soon a boy to be among you. The Oriental gasped, and as he finished speaking a rattle sounded in his throat, and from the corners of his mouth there trickled thin twin streams of blood. His jaw relaxed, his eyes were set and glazed, his breast fluttered once or twice. Then all was done. Quicker than I thought, de Grandin commented, as he lifted the spare twisted body from the chair and laid it on the couch, then draped a rug over it. The moment I perceived his wound I knew the plural wall was punctured, and it was but a matter of moments before internal hemorrhage set in and killed him. But my calculations erred. I would have said half an hour. He has taken only eighteen minutes to die. We must notify the coroner, he added practically. This news will bring great happiness to the police, and rejoice the newspapers most exceedingly as well. I wonder how he got that wound, I asked. You wonder? He gave me an astonished glance. Last night we saw how Constantine can throw a knife. Renoir's shoulder is still sore in testimony of his skill. The wonder is he got away at all. I wish he had not died so soon. I should have liked to ask him how he did it. 7. Though This Be Damnation Shepherd's Inn was limbed against the backdrop of wind-driven snow like the gigantic carcass of a stranded leviathan. Remote from human habitation or activity, it stood in the midst of its overgrown grounds, skeletal remains of small summer-houses, where in other days Bacchus had dallied drunkenly with Aphrodite, stood starkly here and there, among the rank-grown evergreens and frost-blasted weeds. Flanking the building on the left was a row of frontless wooden sheds, where young bloods of the nineties had stabled horse and buggy, while reveling in the bar or numerous private dining rooms upstairs. A row of hitching posts for tethering the teams of more transient guests stood ranked before the porch. The lower windows were heavily barred by rusted iron rods without, and stopped by stout wooden shutters within. Even creepers seemed to have felt the blight which rested on the place, for there was no patch of ivy green upon the brickwork which extended upward to the limit of the lower story. Beneath a wide-bowed pine we paused for counsel. 
Sergeant, de Grandin ordered. You and friend Trowbridge will enter at the rear. I have here the key which fits the door. Keep watchful eyes as you advance, and have your guns held ready, for you may meet with desperate resistance. I would advise that one of you precede the other, and that the first man hold the flashlight and hold it well out from his body. Thus, if you're seen by Constantine and he fires or flings a knife at the light, you will suffer injury only to your hand or arm. Meanwhile, the one behind will keep sharp watch and fire at any sound or movement in the dark. A shotgun is most pleasantly effective at any range which can be had within a house. Should you come on him unawares, shoot first and parley afterward. This is a foul thing we face tonight, my friends. One does not parley with a rattlesnake. Neither does one waste time with a viper such as this, nor by no means. And as you hope for pardon of your sins, shoot him but once. No matter what transpires, you are not to fire a second shot. Remember. Renoir and I shall enter from the front and work our way toward you. You shall know when we are come by the fact that our flashlight will be blue. The light in that I give you will be red, so you may shoot at any but a blue light, and we shall blaze away whenever anything but red is shown. You understand? Perfectly, sir, the Irishman returned. We stumbled through the snow until we reached the rear door, and Costello knelt to fit the key into the lock while I stood guard above him with my gun. You or me, sir? he inquired as the lock unlatched, and even in the excitement of the moment I noted that its mechanism worked without a squeak. Eh? Huh? I answered. Which of us carries the light? Oh, perhaps I'd better. You're probably a better shot than I. Okay, lead the way, sir, and watch your step. I'll be right behind you. Cautiously we crept through the service hall, darting the red rays of our flash to left and right through the long, vacant dining-room, finally into the lobby at the front. As yet we saw no sign of Constantine, nor did we hear a sound betokening the presence of de Grandin or Renoir. The foyer was paved with flagstones set in cement sills, and every now and then these turned beneath our feet, all but precipitating us upon our faces. The air was heavy and dank with that queer, unwholesome smell of earth one associates with graves and tombs. The painted woodwork was dust-grimed and dirty, and here and there wallpaper had peeled off in leprous strips, exposing patches of the corpse-gray plaster underneath. From the center of the hall, slightly to the rear, there rose a wide grand staircase of wood. A sweep of my flashlight toward this brought an exclamation of surprise from both of us. The central flight of stairs, which led to the landing, whence the side flights branched to left and right, was composed of three steps and terminated in a platform some six feet wide by four feet deep. On this had been placed some sort of packing case or table. It was impossible to determine which at the quick glance we gave it, and over this was draped a cover of some dark material which hung down nearly to the floor. Upon this darker covering there lay a strip of linen cloth, and upright at the center of the case was fixed some sort of picture or framed object, while at either end there stood what I first took to be candelabra, each with three tall black candles set into its sockets. Why, I began in a whisper, it looks like an whist, Dr. Trowbridge, sir, there's someone coming, Costello breathed in my ear. Shall I let him have it? I heard the sharp click of his gun lock in the dark. There's a door behind us, I whispered back. Suppose we take cover behind it and watch to see what happens. If it's our man and he comes in here, he'll have to pass us, and we can jump out and nab him. If it's de Grandin and Renoir, we'll hail them and let them know there's no one in the rear of the house. What do you say? All right, he acquiesced. Let's go. We stepped back carefully, and I heard Costello fumbling with the door. Okay, sir, it's open, he whispered. Watch your step going over the sill, it's a bit high. I followed him slowly, feeling my way with cautious feet, felt his big bulk brush past me as he moved to close the door. Then, holy Moses, he muttered. It's a trap we're in, sir. It were a snap lock on the door. Who the devil'd have thought of that? 
He was right. As the door swung to, there came a faint, sharp click of a spring lock, and though we strained and wrenched at the handle, the strong oak panels refused to budge. The room in which we were imprisoned was little larger than a closet, windowless and walled with tongue and groove planks in which a line of coat hooks had been screwed. Obviously at one time it had functioned as a sort of cloak room. For some reason the management had fancied decorations in the door, and some five feet from the floor twin designs of interlacing hearts had been bored through the panels with an auger. I blessed the unknown artist who had made the perforations, for they not only supplied our dungeon generously with air, but made it possible for us to see all quarters of the lobby without betraying our proximity. Don't be talking, sir, Costello warned. There's someone coming. The door across the lobby opened slowly, and through it, bearing a sacristan's taper, came a cowled and surpliced figure an ecclesiastical-looking figure which stepped with solemn pace to the foot of the staircase, sank low in genuflection, then mounted to the landing and lit the candles on the right, retreated, genuflected again, then lit companion candles at the left. As the wicks took fire and spread a little patch of flickering luminance amid the dark, my first impression was confirmed. The box-like object on the stairs was an altar, clothed and vested in accordance with the rubric of the Orthodox Greek Church. At each end burned a trinity of sable candles, which gave off an unpleasant smell, and in the center stood a gilt-framed icon. Now the light fell full upon the sacristan's face, and with a start I recognized Dmitri, the burly Russian Renoir had felled the night we first met Constantine and Sonia. The leering altar-weight retired, backed reverently from the parodied sanctuary, returned to the room whence he had entered, and in a moment we heard the sound of chanting mingled with the sharp metallic clicking of a censer's chains. Again Dmitri entered, this time swinging a smoking incense pot, and close behind him, vested as a Russian priest, walked a tall, impressive figure— Above his sacerdotal garb his face stood out sharply in the candle's lambent light, smooth-shaven, long-jawed, swarthy of complexion. His coal-black eyes were deep-set under curiously arched brows. His lusterless black hair was parted in the middle and brushed abruptly backward, leaving a down-pointing triangle in the center of his high and narrow forehead, which indicated the commencement of a line which was continued in the prominent bowed nose and sharp out-jutting chin. It was a striking face, a proud face, a face of great distinction, but a face so cruel and evil it reminded me at once of every pictured image of the devil which I had ever seen. Held high between his upraised hands, the evil-looking man bore carefully a large chalice of silver gilt, with a paten fitted over it for cover. The floating cloud of incense stung my nostrils. I sniffed and fought away a strong impulse to sneeze, and all the while my memory sought to classify that strong and pungent odor. Suddenly I knew. On a vacation trip to Egypt I had spent an evening at an Arab camp out in the desert, and watched them build their fires of camel dung. That was it, the strong smell of ammonia, the faintly sickening odor of the carbonizing fume. Chanting slowly in a deep, melodious voice, his attendant chiming in with the responses, the mock priest marched to the altar and placed the sacred vessels on the fair cloth where the candle-rays struck answering gleams from their cheap gilding. Then with a deep obeisance he retreated, turned, and strode toward the doorway whence he came. Three paces from the portal he came to pause and struck his hands together in resounding claps, once, twice, three times, and though I had no intimation what I was about to see— I felt my heart beat faster, and a curious weakness spread through all my limbs as I waited breathlessly. Into the faint light of the lobby, vague and nebulous as a phantom form half seen, half apprehended, stepped Sonia. Slowly, with an almost regal dignity, she moved. 
She was enfolded from white throat to insteps in a long and clinging cloak of heavily embroidered linen, which one beautiful slim hand clutched tight round her at the breast. Something familiar, yet queerly strange about the garment struck me as she paused. I'd seen its like somewhere, but never on a woman. The candlelight struck full upon it, and I knew. It was a Greek priest's white linen overvestment, an alb, for worked upon it in threads of gold and threads of silver and threads of iridescent color were double-barred Lorraine crosses and three mystic Grecian letters. Are you prepared? the pseudo-priest demanded as he bent his lusterless black eyes upon the girl's pale face. I am prepared, she answered slowly. Though this be damnation to my soul and everlasting corruption to my body, I am prepared, if only you will promise me that he shall go unharmed. Think well, the man admonished. This rite may be performed only with the aid of a woman pure in heart, a woman in whom there can be found no taint or stain of sin, who gives herself willingly and without reserve to act the part I call on you to play. Are you such an one? I am such an one, she answered steadily, though a ripple of heartbreaking horror ran across her blenching lips, even as they formed the words. And you make the offer willingly, without reserve, he taunted. You know what it requires, what the consequences to your flesh and soul must be. With a quick motion he fixed his fingers in her short blonde hair, and bent her head back, till he gazed directly down into her upturned eyes. Willingly, he grated, without reserve. Willingly she answered with a choking sob. Yes, willingly, ten thousand times, ten thousand times, I offer up my soul and body without a single reservation. If you will promise... Then let us be about it, he broke in with a low, almost soundless laugh. Dmitri, who had crouched before the altar, descended with his censer and bowed before the girl till his forehead touched the floor. Then he arose and wrapped the loose ends of his stole about him, and passed the censer to the other man, while from a fold of his vestments he drew a strange metal plate shaped like an angel with fivefold outspread wings, and this he waved above her head while she moved slowly toward the altar, and the other man walked backward, facing her and sensing her with reeking fumes at every step. A gleam of golden slippers shone beneath her cloak as she approached the lowest of the altar steps. But as she halted for a moment, she kicked them quickly off and mounted barefoot to the sanctuary, where she paused a breathless second and blessed herself, but in reverse, commencing at a point below her breast and making the sign of the cross upside down. Then on her knees she fell, placing both hands upon the altar edge and dropping her head between them, and groveled there in utter self-abasement, while in a low but steady voice she repeated words which sent the chills of horror through me. I had not looked inside a Greek book for more than thirty years, but enough of early learning still remained for me to translate what she sang so softly in a firm, sweet voice. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. The canticle was finished. She rose and dropped the linen cloak behind her and stretched her naked body on the altar, where she lay beneath the candle's softly glowing light like some exquisite piece of carven Carrara marble, still, lifeless, cold. Chalice and paten were raised and placed upon the living altar cloth, their hard metallic weight denting the soft breasts and exquisite torso, their silver gilt reflecting little halos of brightness on the milk-white skin. The vested man's voice rose and fell in what seemed to me an endless chant, his kneeling deacon's heavy guttural intoning the response. 
On, endlessly on, went the deep chant of celebration, pausing a breathless moment now and then as the order of the service directed that the celebrant should kiss the consecrated place of sacrifice. Then hot and avid lips pressed shrinking, wincing flesh. Now the rite was ended. The priest raised high the chalice with its hallowed contents and turned his back upon the living altar with a scream of cacinating laughter. Lucifer, Lord of the world and Prince Supreme of all the powers of the air, I hold thy adversary in my hands, he cried. To thee the victory, mighty master, puissant god of hell. Behold, I sacrifice to thee the Nazarene. His blood be on our heads and on our children's. Eh bien, monsieur, I know not of your offspring, but blood assuredly shall be on your head, and that right quickly, said Jules de Grandin, appearing suddenly in the darkness at the altar side. A stab of lurid flame, a sharp report, and Constantine fell forward on his face, a growing smear of blood stain on his forehead. A second shot roared answer to the first, and the crouching man in deacon's robes threw up both hands wildly, as though to hold himself by empty air, then leaned slowly to the left, slid down the altar steps, and lay upon the floor, a blotch of moveless shadow in the candlelight. Inspector Renoir appeared from the altar's farther side, his smoking service revolver in his hand, a smile of satisfaction on his face. Tiens, my aim is true as yours, mon Jules, he announced matter-of-factly. Shall I give the woman one as well? By no means, no, de Grandin answered quickly. Give her rather the charity of covering for her old charming nudity, my friend. Quick, spread the robe over her. Renoir obeyed, and as he dropped the desecrated alb on the still body, I saw a look of wonder come into his face. She is unconscious, he breathed. She faints, my Jules. Will you revive her? All in good time, the other answered. First, let us look at this. He stirred the prostrate Constantine with the toe of his boot. How it happened, I could not understand, for de Grandin's bullet had surely pierced his frontal bone, inflicting an instantly fatal wound. But the prone man stirred weakly, and whimpered like a child in pain. Have mercy! he implored. I suffer. Give me a second shot to end my misery. Quick, for pity's sake. I am in agony. De Grandin smiled unpleasantly. So the lieutenant of the firing party thought, he answered. So the corporal who administered le coup de grâce believed, my friend. Them you could fool. You cannot make a monkey out of Jules de Grandin. No, by no means. Lie here and die, my excellent adorer of the devil. But do not take too long in doing it, for we fire the building within the quarter hour. And if you have not finished dying by that time, tiens, he raised his shoulders in a shrug. The fault is yours, not ours, no. Hi there, Dr. de Grandin, sir. Don't be after setting fire to this bloody devil's roost with me and Dr. Trowbridge cooped up in here, Costello roared. Morbleu! The little Frenchman laughed as he unlocked our prison. Upon occasion I have roasted both of you, my friends, but luckily I did not do it actually tonight. Come, let us hasten. We have work to do. Within the suite which Constantine had occupied in the deserted house, we found sufficient blankets to wrap Sonia against the outside cold, and having thus prepared her for the homeward trip, we set fire to the ancient house in a dozen different spots, and hastened toward my waiting car. Red mounting flames illuminated our homeward way, but we made no halt to watch our handiwork, for Sonia was moaning in delirium, and her hands and face were hot and dry, as though she suffered from typhoid. To bed with her, de Grandin ordered when we reached my house. We shall administer hyocin and later give her strychnia and brandy. Meanwhile, we must inform her husband that the missing one is found and safe. Yes, he will be pleased to hear us say so, I damn think. 8. The Tangled Skein Unraveled Jules de Grandin, 
smelling most agreeably of giboulet de mar toilet water and dusting powder, extremely dapper looking in his dinner clothes and matching black pearl stud and cuff links, decanted a fluid ounce or so of Napoleon brandy from the silver mounted pinch bottle standing handily upon the tabaret beside his easy chair, passed the wide mouthed goblet beneath his nose, sniffing the ruby liquor's aroma with obvious approval, then sipped a thimbleful with evident appreciation. "'Attend me,' he commanded, fixing small bright eyes in turn on Donald Tannis and his wife, Detective Sergeant Costello, Renoir, and me. "'When dear Madame Sonia told us of her strange adventures with this Constantine, I was amazed, no less. It is not given every woman to live through such excitement and retain her faculties,' much less to sail at last into the harbour of a happy love as she has done. Her father's fate also intrigued me. I had heard of his strange suicide, and how he did denounce the Bolshevik spy. So I was well prepared to join with Monsieur Tanis and tell her that she was mistaken when she declared the man who kidnapped her was Constantine. I knew the details of his apprehension and his trial. Also I knew he fell before the firing squad. Ah, but Jules de Granda has the open mind. To things which others call impossible, he gives consideration. So when I heard the tale of Constantine's execution at Vincennes, and heard how he had been at pains to learn if they would give him the mercy shot, and when I further heard how he did not die at once, although eight rifle balls had pierced his breast, I thought, and thought right deeply. Here were the facts. He checked them off upon his outspread fingers. Constantine was Russian. Constantine had been shot by eight skilled riflemen. Four rifles in the firing squad of twelve were charged with blanks. He had not died at once, so a mercy shot was given, and this seemed to kill him to death. So far, so ordinary. But, ah, there were extraordinary factors in the case as well. Oui, da. Of course. Before he suffered execution— Constantine had said some things which showed he might have hope of returning once again to wreak grave mischief on those he hated. Also, Madame Sonia had deposed it had been he who kidnapped her. She was unlikely to have been mistaken. Women do not make mistakes in matters of that kind. No, assuredly not. Also, we must remember, Constantine was Russian. That is of great importance. Russia is a mixture, a potpourri of mutual conflicting elements, neither European nor Asiatic, neither wholly civilized nor savage, modern on the surface. She is unchanging as the changeless East in which her taproots lie. Always she has harbored evil things which were incalculably old when the first deep stones of Egypt's mighty pyramids were laid. Now, Together with the werewolf and the vampire, the warlock and the witch, the Russian knows another demon thing, called Kalikantzaros, who is a being neither holy man nor devil, but an odd and horrifying mixture of the two. Some call them foster children of the devil, stepsons of Satan. Some say they are the progeny of evil, sin-soaked women and the incubi who are their paramours. They are imbued with semi-immortality also, for though they may be killed like other men, they must be slain with a single fatal blow. A second stroke, although it would at once kill ordinary humankind, restores their lives and their power for wickedness. So much for the means of killing a Kalikantzaros, and the means to be avoided. To continue, every so often preferably once each year about the 25th of February, the olden feast of St. Valburga, or at the celebration of St. Peter's Chains on August 1st, he must perform the sacrilege known as the Black Mass, or Mass to Lucifer, and hold thereby satanic favor and renew his immortality. Now this Black Mass must be performed with certain rules and ceremonies, and these must be adhered to to the letter. The altar is the body of an unclothed woman, and she must lend herself with willingness to the dreadful part she plays. If she be tricked or made to play the part by force, the rite is null and void. 
Moreover, she must be without a taint or spot of wickedness, a virtuous woman, pure in heart. To find a one like that for such a service is no small task, you will agree. When we consider this, we see why Constantine desired Madame Sonia for wife. She was a Russian like himself, and Russian women are servient to their men. Also, by beatings and mistreatment, he soon could break what little independence she possessed, and force her to his will. Thus he would be assured of the altar for his devil's mass. But when he had procured the altar, the work was but begun. The one who celebrated this unclean rite must do so fully vested as a priest, and he must wear the sacred garments which have been duly consecrated. Furthermore, he must use the consecrated elements at the service, and also the sacred vessels. If the host can be stolen from a Latin church, or the pre-sanctified elements from an altar of the Greek communion, it is necessary only that the ritual be fulfilled, the benediction said, and then defilement of the elements be made in insult of the powers of heaven, and to the satisfaction of the evil one. But if the Eucharist is unobtainable, then it is necessary to have a duly ordained priest, one who is qualified to cause the mystery of transubstantiation to take place, to say the office. If this form be resorted to, there is a further awful rite to be performed. A little baby, most usually a boy, who has not been baptized, but whose baby lips are too young and pure for speech, and whose soft feet have never made a step, must be taken. And as the celebrant pronounces, Hoc est enim corpus meum, he cuts the helpless infant's throat and drains the gushing life-blood into the chalice, thus mingling it with the transmuted wine. It was with knowledge of these facts that I heard Father Pophocephalos report his loss, and when he said the elements were stolen I did rejoice most greatly, for then I knew no helpless little one would have to die upon the altar of the devil's mass. And so with Madame Sonia gone, with the elements and vestments stolen from St. Basil's church, and with my dark suspicions of this Constantine's true character, I damn knew what was planned. But how to find this server of the devil, this stepson of Satan, in time to stop the sacrilege? Ah, that was the question, assuredly. And then came Sun Apoi, a bad man he had been, a very damn bad man, as friend Renoir can testify. But China is an old, old land, and her sons are steeped in ancient lore. For generations more than we can count, they've known the demon Ching Shi and his ghostly brethren, who approximate the vampires of the West, and greatly do they fear him. They hate and loathe him too, and there lay our salvation, for wicked as he was, Dr. Sun would have no dealings with this cursed Constantine, but came to warn us and to tell us where he might be found, although his coming cost his life. And so we went and saw, and were in time to stop the last obscenity of all, the defilement of the consecrated Eucharist in honour of the devil. Yes, of course! But, Dr. de Gronda, I was the altar at that mass, Sonia Tanis wailed. And I did offer myself for the devil's service. Is there hope for such as I? Will heaven ever pardon me? For even though I loathed the thing I did, I did it, and— She faced us with defiant, blazing eyes. I'd do it again for— Precisément, madame, de Gronda interrupted. For— that for is your salvation. Because you did the thing you did for love of him you married to save him from assassination. Love conquers all, the Latin poet tells us. So in this case, between your sin, if sin it were to act the part you did to save your husband's life, and its reward, we place the shield of your abundant love. Be assured, chère madame, you have no need to fear, for kindly heaven understands— and understanding is forgiveness. But, the girl persisted, her long white fingers knit together in an agony of terror, her eyes wide-set with fear. Donald would never have consented to my buying his safety at such a price. He— Madame, the little Frenchman fairly thundered. I am Jules de Grandin. I do not make mistakes. 
When I say something, it is so. I have assured you of your pardon. Will you dispute with me? Oh, Sonia, the husband soothed. It's finished now. There is no more. Alas, the man speaks truth, friend Trowbridge, de Grandin wailed. It is finished. There is no more. How true, my friend. How sadly true. The bottle. It is empty. Introduction by George A. Vanderberg and Robert E. Weinberg Weird Tales, the self-described unique magazine, and one of the most influential Golden Age pulp magazines in the first half of the twentieth century, was home to a number of now well-recognized names, including Robert Block, August Derleth, Robert E. Howard, H. P. Lovecraft, Clark Ashton Smith, and Manly Wade Wellman. But among such stiff competition was another writer, more popular at the time than all of the aforementioned authors, and paid at a higher rate because of it. Over the course of ninety-two stories and a serialized novel, his most endearing character captivated pulp magazine readers for nearly three decades, during which time he received more front-cover illustrations accompanying his stories than any of his fellow contributors. The writer's name was Seabury Quinn and his character was the French occult detective Jules de Grandin. Perhaps you've never heard of de Grandin, his indefatigable assistant, Dr. Trowbridge, or the fictional town of Harrisonville, New Jersey. Perhaps you've never even heard of Seabury Quinn, or maybe only in passing, as a historical footnote in one of the many essays and reprinted collections of Quinn's now more revered contemporaries. Certainly de Grandin was not the first occult detective. Algernon Blackwood's John Silence, Hodgson's Thomas Carnacki, and Sax Romer's Morris Claw preceded him. Nor was he the last, as Wellman's John Thunstone, Marjorie Lawrence's Miles Penoyer, and Joseph Payne Brennan's Lucius Leffing all either overlapped with the end of de Grandin's run or followed him. And without a doubt, de Grandin shares more than a passing resemblance to both Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes, especially with his Dr. Watson-like sidekick, and Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot. Indeed, even if you were to seek out a de Grandin story, your options over the years would have been limited. Unlike Lovecraft, Smith, Wellman, Bloch, and other Weird Tales contributors, the publication history of the Jules de Grandin tales is spotty at best. In 1966, Arkham House printed roughly 2,000 copies of The Phantom Fighter, a selection of ten early works. In the late 1970s, Popular Library published six paperback volumes of approximately 35 assorted tales, but they are now long out of print. In 2001, the specialty press, the battered Silicon Dispatch Box, released an oversized three-volume hardcover set of every de Grandin story the first time all the stories had been collected, and while still in production, the set is unavailable to the general trade. So, given how obscure Quinn and his character might seem today, it's justifiably hard to understand how popular these stories originally were, or how frequently new ones were written. But let the numbers tell the tale. From October 1925, when the very first de Grandin story was released, to December 1933, a roughly eight-year span, de Grandin's stories appeared in an incredible sixty-two of the ninety-six issues that Weird Tales published, totaling well over three-quarters of a million words. Letter after letter to the magazine's editor demanded further adventures from the supernatural detective. If Quinn loomed large in the mind of pulp readers during the magazine's heyday, then why has his name fallen on deaf ears since? Aside from the relative unavailability of his work, the truth is that Quinn has been successfully marginalized over the years by many critics, who have often dismissed him as simply a hack writer. The de Grandin stories are routinely criticized as being of little worth, and dismissed as unimportant to the development of weird fiction. A common argument, propped up by suspiciously circular reasoning, concludes that Quinn was not the most popular writer for weird tales just the most prolific. These critics seem troubled that the same audience who read and appreciated the work of Lovecraft, Smith, and Howard could also enjoy the exploits of the French Ghostbuster. 
And while it would be far from the truth to suggest that the literary merits of the de Grandin stories exceed those of some of his contemporaries' tales, Quinn was a much more skillful writer, and the adventures of his occult detective more enjoyable to read, than most critics are willing to acknowledge. In the second half of the twentieth century, as the literary value of some pulp fiction writers began to be reconsidered, Quinn proved to be the perfect whipping boy for early advocates attempting to destigmatize weird fiction. He was the hack author who churned out formulaic prose for a quick paycheck. Anticipating charges that a literary reassessment of Lovecraft would require reevaluating the entire genre along with him, an arbitrary line was quickly drawn in the sand and as the standard-bearer of Pulp Fiction's popularity, the creator of Jules de Grandin found himself on the wrong side of that line. First and foremost, it must be understood that Quinn wrote to make money, and he was far from the archetypal starving artist. At the same time that his Jules de Grandin stories were running in weird tales, he had a similar series of detective stories publishing in Real Detective Tales, Quinn was writing two continuing series at once through the 1920s, composing approximately 25,000 words a month on a manual typewriter. Maintaining originality under such a grueling schedule would be difficult for any author, and even though the de Grandin stories follow a recognizable formula, Quinn still managed to produce one striking story after another. It should also be noted that the tendency to recycle plots and ideas for different markets was very similar to the writing practices of Weird Tales's other prolific and popular writer, Robert E. Howard, who is often excused for these habits rather than criticized for them. Throughout his many adventures, the distinctive French detective changed little. His penchant for amusingly French exclamations was a constant through all ninety-three works as was his taste for cigars and brandy after, and sometimes before, a hard day's work, and his crime-solving styles and methods remained remarkably consistent. From time to time some new skill or bit of knowledge was revealed to the reader, but in most other respects the Jules de Grandin of The Horror on the Lynx was the same as the hero of the last story in the series, published twenty-five years later. He was a perfect example of the rare French blonde type, rather under medium height, but with a military erectness of carriage that made him look several inches taller than he really was. His light blue eyes were small and exceedingly deep-set, and would have been humorous had it not been for the curiously cold directness of their gaze. With his wide mouth, light moustache waxed at the ends in two perfectly horizontal points, and those twinkling, stock-taking eyes— he reminded me of an alert tomcat. Thus is de Grandin described by Dr. Trowbridge in the duo's first meeting in 1925. His personal history is dribbled throughout the stories. De Grandin was born and raised in France, attended medical school, became a prominent surgeon, and in the Great War served first as a medical officer, then as a member of the intelligence service. After the war, he traveled the world in the service of French intelligence. His age is never given, but it's generally assumed that the occult detective is in his early forties. Samuel Trowbridge, on the other hand, is a typical, conservative, small-town doctor of the first half of the twentieth century. As described by Quinn, he is a cross between an honest brother of George Bernard Shaw and former Chief Justice of the United States Charles Evans Hughes. Bald and bewhiskered, most, if not all, of his life was spent in the same town. Trowbridge is old-fashioned and somewhat conservative, a member of the Knights Templar, a vestryman in the Episcopal Church, and a staunch Republican. While the two men are dissimilar in many ways, they're also very much alike. Both are fine doctors and surgeons. Trowbridge might complain from time to time about de Grandin's wild adventures, but he always goes along with them. There is no thought ever of leaving de Grandin to fight his battles alone. More than any other trait, though, they are two men with one mission, and perhaps for that reason they remained friends for all of their ninety-three adventures and countless trials. The majority of Quinn's de Grandin stories take place in or near Harrisonville, New Jersey, a fictional community that rivals, 
with its fiends, hauntings, ghouls, werewolves, vampires, voodoo, witchcraft, and zombies, Lovecraft's own Arkham, Massachusetts. For more recent examples of a supernatural infested community, one need look no further than the modern version of pulp fiction narratives, television. Buffy the Vampire Slayer's Sunnydale, California, and The Night Strangler's Seattle both reflect the structural needs of this type of supernatural narrative. Early in the series, de Grandai is presented as Trowbridge's temporary house guest, having traveled to the United States to study both medicine and modern police techniques. But Quinn quickly realized that the series was due for a long run, and recognized that too much globe-trotting would make the stories unwieldy. A familiar setting would be needed to keep the main focus of each tale on the events themselves. Harrisonville, a medium-sized town outside New York City, was completely imaginary, but served that purpose. Most of the de Grandin stories feature beautiful girls in peril. Quinn discovered early on that Farnsworth Wright, Weird Tales' editor from 1924 to 1940, believed nude women on the cover sold more copies so when writing he was careful to always feature a scene that could translate to appropriately salacious artwork. Quinn also realized that his readers wanted adventures with love and romance as central themes, so even his most frightening tales were given happy endings, of a sort. And yet the de Grandin adventures are set apart from the stories they were published alongside by their often explicit and bloody content. Quinn predated the work of Clive Barker and the Splatterpunk writers by approximately fifty years, but using his medical background, he wrote some truly terrifying horror stories. Tales like The House of Horror and The House Where Time Stood Still feature some of the most hideous descriptions of mutilated humans ever set down on paper. The victims of the Mad Doctor in the House of Horror in particular must rank near the top of the list of medical monstrosities in fiction. Another element that set Quinn's occult detective apart from others was his pioneering use of modern science in the fight against ancient superstitions. De Grandin fought vampires, werewolves, and even mummies in his many adventures, but oftentimes relied on the latest technology to save the day. The Frenchman put it best in a conversation with Dr. Trowbridge at the end of The Blood Flower. And wasn't there some old legend to the effect that a werewolf could only be killed with a silver bullet? Ah, bah, he replied with a laugh. What did those old legend mongers know of the power of modern firearms? When I did shoot that wolfman, my friend, I had something more powerful than superstition in my hand. More bleu, but I did shoot a hole in him large enough for him to have walked through. Quinn didn't completely abandon the use of holy water, ancient relics, and magical charms to defeat supernatural entities, but he made it clear that de Grandin understood that there was a place for modern technology, as well as old folklore, when it came to fighting monsters. Nor was de Grandin himself above using violence to fight his enemies. Oftentimes, the French occult investigator served as judge, jury, and executioner when dealing with madmen, deranged doctors, and evil masterminds. There was little mercy in his stories for those who used dark forces. While sex was heavily insinuated but rarely covered explicitly in the pulps, except in the most general of terms, Quinn again was willing to go where few other writers would dare. Sexual slavery lesbianism, and even incest played roles in his writing over the years, challenging the moral values of the day. In the end, there's no denying that the de Grandin stories are pulp fiction. Many characters are little more than assorted clichés bundled together. De Grandin is a model hero, a French expert on the occult, and never at a loss when battling the most evil of monsters. Dr. Trowbridge remains the steadfast companion, much in the Dr. Watson tradition, always doubting but inevitably following his friend's advice. Quinn wrote for the masses, and he didn't spend pages describing landscapes when there was always more action unfolding. The Jules de Grandin stories were written as serial entertainment, with the legitimate expectation that they would not be read back to back. While all of the adventures are good fun, the best way to properly enjoy them is over an extended period of time.
Plowing through one story after another will lessen their impact and greatly cut down on the excitement and fun of reading them. One story a week, which would stretch out this entire five-volume series over two years, might be the perfect amount of time needed to fully enjoy these tales of the occult and the macabre. They might not be great literature, but they don't pretend to be. They're pulp adventures, and even after seventy-five years, the stories read well. Additionally, though the specific aesthetic values of Weird Tales readers were vastly different than those of today's readers, one can see clearly the continuing allure of these types of supernatural adventures, and the long shadow that they cast over twentieth and early twenty-first century popular culture. Sure, these stories are formulaic, but it is a recipe that continues to be popular to this day. The formula of the occult detective, the protector who stands between us and the monsters of the night, can be seen time and time again in the urban fantasy and paranormal romance categories of commercial fiction, and is prevalent in today's television and movies. Given the ubiquity and contemporary popularity of this type of narrative, it's actually not at all surprising that Seabury Quinn was the most popular contributor to Weird Tales. Finally, if Seabury Quinn is watching from above and closely scrutinizing the shelves of bookstores, he would undoubtedly be pleased as punch and proud as all get out to find his creation, Dr. Jules de Grandin, rising once again in the minds of readers around the world battling the forces of darkness, wherever, whoever, or whatever the nature of their evil might be. When the jaws of darkness open, only Jules de Grandin stands in Satan's way. Robert E. Weinberg, Chicago, Illinois, USA And George A. Vanderberg, Lake Eugenia, Ontario, Canada 23rd of September, 2016 THE DEVIL'S BRIDE 1. ALICE, WHERE ARE YOU? Five of us sat on the twin divans flanking the fireplace where the eucalyptus logs burned brightly on their polished brass andirons, throwing kaleidoscopic patterns of highlights and shadows on the ivory-enameled woodwork and the rug-strewn floor of the ancestor's room at Twelve Trees. Old David Hume, who dug Twelve Trees' foundations three centuries ago, had planned that room as shrine and temple to his Lar Familiaris, and to it each succeeding generation of the house had added some memento of itself. The wide bay window at the east was fashioned from the carved poop of a Spanish galleon captured by a buccaneering member of the family, and brought home to the quiet Jersey village where he rested while he planned new forays on the Antilles. The tiles about the fireplace, which told the story of the fall of man in blue and white Dutch Delft, were a record of successful trading by another long-dead Hume, who flourished in the days when New Amsterdam claimed all the land between the Hudson and the Delaware, and held it from the Swedes, till Britain, with her lust for empire, took it for herself, and from it shaped the none-too-loyal colony of New Jersey. The carpets on the floor— the books and bric-a-brac on the shelves, each object of vertu within the glass-doored cabinets, had something to relate of Hume adventures on sea or land, whether as pirates, patriots, traders, or explorers, sworn enemies of law, or duly constituted bailiffs of authority. Adventure ran like Icor in the Hume veins, from David, founder of the family, who came none knew whence with his strange dark bride, and settled on the rising ground beside the Jersey meadows, to Ronald, last male of the line, who went down to flames and glory when his plane was cut out from its squadron, and fell blazing like a meteor to the shell-scarred earth at Neuve-Chapelle. His croix de guerre, posthumously awarded, lay in the cabinet beside the sword the Continental Congress had presented to his great-great-grandsire, in lieu of long arrearage of salary. Across the fire from us, between her mother and her fiancé, sat Alice, final remnant of the line, her half-humorous, half-troubled glance straying to each of us in turn as she finished speaking. She was a slender wisp of girlhood, 
with a mass of chestnut hair with deep shadow-laden waves which clustered in curling tendrils at the nape of her neck. A pale, clear complexion, the ivory tones of which were enhanced by the crimson of her wide, sensitive mouth, and the long silken lashes and purple depths of the slightly slanting eyes, which gave her face a piquant oriental flavor. "'You say the message is repeated constantly, mademoiselle?' asked Jules de Grandin, my diminutive French friend, as he cast a fleeting look of unqualified approval at the slim satin slipper and silk-sheathed leg the girl displayed, as she sat with one foot doubled under her. Yes, it's most provoking when you're trying to get some inkling of the future, especially at such a time as this, to have the silly thing keep saying— Alice, dear, Mrs. Hume remonstrated, I wish you wouldn't trifle with such silly nonsense— particularly now when— She broke off with what would unquestionably have been a sniff in anyone less certainly patrician than Arabella Hume, and glanced reprovingly at her daughter. De Grandin tweaked the needle-pointed tips of his little blonde moustache, and grinned the gammon grin which endeared him to dowager and debutante alike. It is mysterious, as you have said, mademoiselle, he agreed. But are you sure you did not guide the board? Of course I am, the girl broke in. Just wait, I'll show you. Placing her coffee cup upon the Indian mahogany tabaret, she leaped petulantly from the couch and hurried from the room, returning in a moment with a Ouija board and table. Now watch, she ordered, putting the contrivance on the couch beside her. John, you and Dr. Trowbridge and Dr. de Grandin put your hands on the table, and I'll put mine between them so you can feel the slightest tightening of my muscles. That way you'll be sure I'm not guiding the thing, even unintentionally. Ready? Feeling decidedly sheepish, I rose and joined them, resting my fingertips on the little three-legged table. Young Davison's hand was next to mine, de Grandin's next to his, and between all rested Alice's slender, cream-white fingers. Mrs. Hume viewed the spectacle with silent disapproval. For a moment we bowed above the Ouija board, waiting tensely for some motion of the table. Gradually a feeling of numbness crept through my hands and wrists as I held them in the strained and unfamiliar pose. Then, with a sharp and jerky start, the table moved, first right, then left, then in an ever-widening circle, till it swung sharply toward the upper left-hand corner of the board, pausing momentarily at the A, then travelling swiftly to the L, thence with constant acceleration back to I. Quickly the message was spelled out. A pause, and then once more the three-word sentence was repeated. Alice, come home. There! the girl exclaimed, a catch half fright, half annoyance in her voice. It spelled those very words three times today. I couldn't get it to say anything else. Rot, all silly nonsense! John Davison declared, lifting his hands from the table and gazing almost resentfully at his charming fiancée. "'You may believe you didn't move the thing, dear, but you must have, for—' "'Dr. de Gronda, Dr. Trowbridge,' the girl appealed. "'You held my hands just now. You'd have known if I'd made even the slightest move to guide the table, wouldn't you?' We nodded silent agreement, and she hurried on. "'That's just what's puzzling me.' Why should a girl who's going to be married tomorrow be telling herself, subconsciously or otherwise, to come home? If the board had spelt go home, perhaps it would have made sense, for we're going to our own place when we come back from our wedding trip. But why the constant repetition of come home? I'd like to know. Do you suppose? The raucous hooting of an automobile horn broke through her question, and a moment later half a dozen girls, accompanied by as many youths, stormed into the big hall. "'Ready, old fruit?' called Irma Sherwood, who was to be the maid of honor. "'We'd better be stepping on the gas. The church is all lit up, and Dr. Cuthbert's got the organ all tuned and humming.' She threw a dazzling smile at us and added, "'This business of getting Alice decently married is more trouble than running a man down for myself, Dr. Trowbridge. One more rehearsal of these nuptials, and I'll be a candidate for a sanitarium.' St. Chrysostan's was all alight when we arrived at the Pentis and paused beside the baptismal font awaiting the remainder of the bridal party. For as it ever is with lovers, 
John and Alice had lagged behind the rest to exchange a few banalities of the kind relished only by idiots, little children, and those engaged to wed. Sorry to delay the show, friends and fellow citizens, Alice apologized as she leaped from Davison's roadster and tossed her raccoon coat aside. The fact is, John and I had something of importance to discuss, and she raised both hands to readjust her hat. And so we lingered by the way to... Alice! Mrs. Hume's voice betokened shocked propriety and hopeless protest at the antics of her daughter's graceless generation. You're surely not going to wear that... that thing in church. Her indignant glance indicated the object of her wrath. Why, it's hardly decent, she continued, then paused as though vocabulary failed her, while she pointed mutely to the silver girdle which was clasped about her daughter's slender waist. Of course I shall, old dear, the girl replied. The last time one of us was married she wore it, and the one before wore it too. Hume women always wear this girdle when they're married. It brings them luck and ensures big fam— Alice! The sharp, exasperated interruption cut her short. If you have to be indelicate, at least you might remember where we are. All right, Mater, have it your own way. But the girdle gets worn just the same. The girl retorted, pirouetting slowly, so that the wide belt's polished bosses caught flashes from the chandelier and flung them back in gleaming, lance-like rays. Mon Dieu, mademoiselle, what is it that you wear? May I see it? May I examine it? De Grandin demanded excitedly, bending forward to obtain a closer view of the shining corselet. Of course, the girl replied. Just a moment till I get it off. She fumbled at a fastening in front, undid a latch of some sort, and put the gleaming girdle in his hand. It was a beautiful example of barbaric jewelry, a belt, perhaps a corset would be the better term, composed of two curved plates of hammered silver, so formed as to encircle the wearer's abdomen from front to hips, joined together at the back by a wide band of flexible brown leather of exquisitely soft texture. In front the stomach plates were locked together by four rings, with a long silver pin which went through them like a loose rivet, with a little ball at the top fastened by a chain of cold-forged silver links. The metal was heavily bossed and rather crudely set with a number of big red and yellow stones. From each plate depended seven silver chains each terminating in a heart-shaped ornament carved from the same kind of stones with which the belt was jeweled, and these clanked and jingled musically as the little Frenchman held the thing up to the light and gazed at it with a look of mingled fascination and repulsion. Grand Dieu! he exclaimed softly. It is. I cannot be mistaken. It is assuredly one of them, but— Alice bent smilingly across his shoulder. Nobody knows quite what it is or where it comes from, she explained. But there's a tradition in the family that David Hume's mysterious bride brought it with her as a part of her marriage portion. For years every daughter of the house wore it to be married, and it's been known as the luck of the Humes for goodness knows how long. The legend is that the girl who wears it will keep her beauty and her husband's love and have an easy time in child— Alice! Once more her mother intervened. All right, mother, I won't say it, her daughter laughed. But even nice girls know you don't find babies in a cabbage head nowadays. Then to de Grandin. I'm the first Hume girl in three generations, and the last of the family in the bargain, so I'm going to wear the thing for whatever luck there is in it, no matter what anybody says. The answering smile de Grandin gave her was rather forced. You do not know whence it comes, nor what its history is, he asked. No, we don't. Mrs. Hume returned, before her daughter could reply. And I'm heartily sorry Alice found the thing. I almost wish I'd sold it when I had the chance. Eh? He turned upon her almost sharply. How is that, madame? A foreign gentleman called the other day and said he understood we had this thing among our curios, and that it might be for sale. He was very polite, but quite insistent that I let him see it, when I told him it was not for sale, he seemed greatly disappointed, and begged me to reconsider. 
He even offered to allow me to set whatever price I cared to, and assured me there would be no quibble over it, even though we asked a hundred times the belt's intrinsic worth. I fancy he was an agent with carte blanche from some wealthy collector. He seemed so utterly indifferent where money was concerned. And did he, by any chance, inform you what this belt may be or whence it came? De Grandin queried. Why, no. He merely described it, and begged to be allowed to see it. One hardly likes to ask such questions from a chance visitor, you know. Precisément. One understands, madame. He nodded. The procession was quickly marshalled, and attended by her maids, Alice marched serenely up the aisle. As she had no male relative to do the office, the duty of giving her in marriage was delegated to me both she and her mother declaring that no one more deserved the honor than the one who had assisted her into the world, and brought her through the measles, chicken-pox, and whooping cough. "'And we'll have Trowbridge somewhere in the first one's name, old dear,' Alice promised in a whisper, as she patted my arm while we halted momentarily at the chancel steps. "'Now, when Dr. Bentley has pronounced the warning, if no one offers an impediment to the marriage—' the curate who was acting as master of ceremonies informed us. You will proceed to the communion rail, and— Somewhere outside, faint and far away seeming, but gaining quickly in intensity, there came a high, thin, whistling sound, piercing but so high one could scarcely hear it. Rather, it seemed more like a screaming heard inside the head than any outward sound, and strangely it seemed to circle round the three of us, the bride, the bridegroom, and me, and to cut us definitely off from the remainder of the party. Queer, I thought. There was no wind a moment ago, yet the thin, high whining closed tighter round us, and involuntarily I put my hands to my ears to shut out the intolerable sharpness of it, when with a sudden crash the painted window just above the altar burst as though a missile struck it and through the ragged aperture came drifting a billowing yellow haze, a cloud of saffron dust, it seemed to me, which hovered momentarily above the unveiled cross upon the altar, then dissipated slowly, like steam evaporating in winter air. I felt an odd sensation, almost like a heavy blow delivered to my chest, as I watched the yellow mist disintegrate, then straightened with a start as another sound broke on my hearing. Alice? Alice, where are you? The bridegroom called, and through the bridal party ran a wondering murmur. Where's Alice? She was right there a moment ago. Where is she? Where's she gone? I blinked my eyes and shook my head. It was so. Where the bride had stood, her fingers resting lightly on my arm a moment before, there was only empty space. Wonderingly at first, then eagerly, at last, with a frenzy bordering on madness, we searched for her. Nowhere, either in the church or vestry room or parish house, was sign or token of the missing bride. Nor could we find a trace of her outside the building. Her coat and motor gloves lay in a crumpled heap within the vestibule. The car in which she came to the church still stood beside the curb. An officer whose beat had led him past the door two minutes earlier declared he had seen no one leave the edifice. Had seen no one on the block, for that matter. Yet discuss and argue as we might, search, seek, and call, then tell ourselves it was no more than a silly girl's prank. The fact remained. Alice Hume was gone, vanished as utterly as though absorbed in air or swallowed by the earth, and all within less time than the swiftest runner could have crossed the chancel, much less have left the church beneath the gaze of half a score of interested people for whom she was the center of attraction. She must have gone home. Someone suggested as we paused a moment in our search and gazed into each other's wondering eyes. Of course, that's it. She's gone back to twelve trees, the others chorused, and by the very warmth of their agreement gave tokens of dissent. At last the lights were dimmed, the church deserted, and the bridal party, murmuring like frightened children to each other, took up their way toward twelve trees, to which we were agreed the missing bride had fled. But as we started on our way, young Davison, with lover's prescience of evil to his loved one, gave tongue to the question which trembled silently on every lip. 
Alice, he cried out to the unresponsive knight, and the tremor in his voice was eloquent of his heart's agony. Alice, beloved, where are you? 2. Bulala Gwai Coming, I asked as the sorrowful little motorcade began its pilgrimage to Twelve Trees. De Grandin shook his head in short negation. Let them go on, he ordered. Later, when they have left, we may search the house for Mademoiselle Alice, though I greatly doubt we shall find her. Meanwhile, there is that here which I would investigate. We can work more efficiently when there are no well-meaning nincompoops to harass us with senseless questions. Come. He turned on his heel and led the way back into the church. Tell me, friend Trowbridge, he began as we walked up the aisle. When that window yonder broke, did you see or seem to see a cloud of yellowness drift through the opening? Why, yes, I thought so, I replied. It looked to me like a puff of muddy fog, smoke perhaps, but it vanished so quickly that... Très bien, he nodded. That is what I wished to know. None of the others mentioned seeing it, and our eyes play strange tricks on us at times. I thought perhaps I might have been mistaken, but your testimony is enough for me. With a murmuring of excuse, as though apologizing for the sacrilege, he moved the bishop's chair to a point beside the altar, mounted nimbly on its tall carved back, and examined the stone casing of the broken window intently. From my station outside the communion rail I could hear him swearing softly and excitedly in mingled French and English, as he drew a card from his pocket, scraped something from the window sill upon the card, then carefully descended from his lofty perch. Behold, regard, attend me if you will, friend Trowbridge, he ordered. Observe what I have found. As he extended the card toward me, I saw a line of light yellow powder, like pollen from a flower gathered along one edge. Regarde, he commanded sharply, raising the slip of pasteboard level with my face. Now, if you please, what did I do? Huh? I asked, puzzled. Your hearing functions normally. What is it that I did? Why, you showed me that card, and precisely, and? He paused with interrogatively arched brows. And that's all? No, not at all. By no means, my friend, he denied. Attend me. First I did, as you have said, present the card to you. Next, when it was fairly level with your nostrils, I did blow on it, oh so gently, so that some of the powder on it was inhaled by you. Next I raised my arms three times above my head, lowered them again, then capered round you like a dancing Indian. Finally I did tweak you sharply by the nose. Tweak me by the nose, I echoed aghast. You're crazy. Like the fox, as your slang so drolly expressed it he returned with a nod. My friend, it has been exactly one minute and forty seconds by my watch since you did inhale that so tiny bit of dust, and during all that time you were either as utterly oblivious to all that happened as though you had been under ether. Yes, when first I saw I suspected. Now I have submitted it to the test and am positive it is so. What on earth are you talking about? I asked. Bulalaguay, no less. Bu- what? He seated himself in the bishop's chair, crossed his knees and regarded me with the fixed unwinking stare which always reminded me of an earnest tomcat. Attend me, he commanded. My duties as an army medical officer and as a member of La Sûreté have taken me to many places off the customary map of tourists. The Congo Francais, by example. It was there that I first met Boulalaguay which was called by our gendarmes the stuff of death, sometimes la petite mort, or little death. Barbe d'un raver, but it is well named, my friend. A traveller journeying through the interior once lay down to rest on his camp bed within his tent. He meant to sleep for thirty minutes only. When he awoke he found that twenty-six hours had gone, likewise all his paraphernalia. Native robbers had inserted a tube beneath his tent flap, blown a minute pinch of their death snuff into the enclosure, then boldly entered and helped themselves to all of his effects. Again a tiny paper torpedo of the stuff was thrown through the window of a locomotive cab while it stood on a siding. 
both engineer and fireman were rendered unconscious for ten hours, during which time the natives denuded the machine of every movable part. So powerful an anaesthetic is Bulalaguay, that so much of it as can be gotten on a penknife's point. If blown into a room fourteen feet square, it will serve to paralyze every living thing within the place for several minutes. The secret of its formula is close guarded, but I have been assured by witch men of the Congo that it can be made in two strengths, one to kill at once, the other to stupefy, and it is a fact to which I can testify that it is sometimes used successfully to capture both elephants and lions alive. I once went with the local inspector of police to examine premises which had been burglarized with the aid of this so powerful sleeping powder, and on the window sill we did behold a minute quantity of it. The inspector scooped it up on a card and called a native gendarme to him, then blew it in the negro's face. The stuff had lost much potency by exposure to the air, but still it was so powerful that the black was totally unconscious for upward of five minutes and did not move a muscle when the inspector struck him a stinging blow on the cheek and even touched a lighted cigarette against his hand. Not only that, when finally he awakened, he did not realize he had been asleep at all, and would not believe us till we showed him the blister where the cigarette had burned him. Very good. It is twenty years and more since I beheld this powder from the devil's snuff-box. But when I saw that yellow cloud come floating through the broken window, and when I realized Mademoiselle Alice had decamped unseen by us before our very eyes, I said to me, Jules de Grandin? Here, it seems, is evidence of Boulalaguay, and nothing else. You may be right, Jules de Grandin, I answered me, but still you are not sure. Wait until the others have departed with their silly gabble-gabble. Then ask friend Trowbridge if he also saw the yellow cloud. He knows nothing of Boulalaguay, but if he saw that fog of yellowness, you may depend upon it there was such a thing. And so I waited. And when you did agree with me, I searched, and having searched, I found that which I sought, and, forgive me, my friend, as there was no other laboratory material at hand, I did test the stuff on you, and now I am convinced. Yes, I damn know how they spirited Mademoiselle Alice away, while our eyes were open and unseeing. Who it was that stole her, and why he did it, that is for us to discover as quickly as may be. He felt for his cigarette case and thoughtfully extracted a Maryland, then, remembering where he was, replaced it. Let us go, he ordered. Perhaps the chatterers have become tired of useless searching at twelve trees, and we can get some information from Madame Hume. But if this Bulala, this sleeping powder, whatever its native name is, was used here, it's hardly likely Alice has gone back to twelve trees, is it? I objected. "'And what possible information can Mrs. Hume have? "'She knows as little about it all as you or I.' "'One wonders,' he replied, "'as we left the church and climbed into my car. "'At any rate, perhaps she can tell us more of that sacré girdle "'which Mademoiselle Alice wore.' "'I noticed you seemed surprised when you saw it,' I returned. "'Did you recognize it?' "'Perhaps,' he answered cautiously. At least I have seen others not unlike it. Indeed, where? In Kurdistan. It is a Yazidi bridal belt, or something very like it. A what? A girdle worn by virgins who... But I forget, you do not know. The work of pacifying subject people is one requiring all the white man's ingenuity, my friend, as your countrymen who have seen service in the Philippines will tell you. In 1922... When French authority was flouted in Arabia, I was dispatched there on a secret mission. Eventually my work took me to Deir Ezzor, Anna, finally to Baghdad and across British Iraq to the Kurdish border. There, no matter in what guise, I penetrated Mount Lalesh and the holy city of the Yazidis. These Yazidis are a mysterious sect, scattered throughout the Orient, from Manchuria to the Near East, but strongest in North Arabia, and feared and loathed alike by Christian, Jew, Buddhist, Taoist, and Muslim, for they are worshippers of Satan. 
Their sacred mountain, Lalesh, stands north of Baghdad on the Kurdish border near Mosul, and on it is their holy and forbidden city, which no stranger is allowed to enter. And there they have a temple, reared on terraces hewn from the living rock, in which they pay homage to the image of a serpent as the beguiler of man from pristine innocence. Beneath the temple are gloomy caverns, and there, at dead of night, they perform strange and bloody rites before an idol fashioned like a peacock, whom they call Malaktaus, the viceroy of Shaitan, the devil, upon earth. According to the dictates of the Kitab Aswad, or Black Scripture, their mir, or pope, has brought to him as often as he may desire the fairest daughters of the sect, and these are his to do with as he chooses. When the young virgin is prepared for the sacrifice, she dons a silver girdle like the one we saw on Mademoiselle Alice tonight. I saw one on Mount Lalesh. Its front is hammered silver, set with semi-precious stones of red and yellow, never blue, for blue is heaven's color, and therefore is accursed among the Yazidis who worship the arch-demon. The belt's back is of leather, sometimes from the skin of a lamb untimely taken from its mother, sometimes of a kid's skin, but in exceptional cases, where the woman to be offered is of noble birth and notable lineage, it is made of tanned and carefully prepared human skin. A murdered babe's by preference. Such was the leather of Mademoiselle Alice's girdle. I recognized it instantly. When one has examined a human hide tanned into leather, he cannot forget its feel and texture, my friend. But this is dreadful. Unthinkable, I protested. Why should Alice wear a girdle made of human skin? That is precisely what we have to ascertain tonight, if possible, he told me. I do not say Madame Hume can give us any direct information, but she may perchance let drop some hint that will set us on the proper track. No, he added as he saw a protest forming on my lips. I do not intimate she has willfully withheld anything she knows, but in cases such as this there are no such things as trifles. Some bit of knowledge which she thinks of no importance may easily prove the key to this so irritating mystery. One can but hope. Another car, a little roadster of modish lines, opulent with gleaming chromium, drew abreast of us as we halted at the gateway of the Hume House. Its driver was a woman, elegantly dressed, sophisticated, chic from the crown of her tightly fitting black felt hat to the tips of her black leather gloves. As she slackened speed and leaned toward us, our headlights' rays struck her face illuminating it as an actor's features are picked out by the spotlight on a darkened stage. Although a black lace veil was drawn across her chin and cheeks after the manner of a western desperado's handkerchief mask, so filmy was the tissue that her countenance was alluringly shadowed rather than obscured. A beautiful face it was, but not a lovely one. Skin light and clear as any blonde's was complemented by hair as black and bright as polished basalt. Black brows circumflexed superciliously over eyes of almost startling blueness. Her small, petulant mouth had full, ardent lips of brilliant red. There was a slightly amused, faintly scornful smile on her somewhat vixenish mouth, and her small teeth, gleaming like white coral behind the vivid carmine of her lips, seemed sharp as little sabers as she called to us in a rich contralto. Good evening, gentlemen. If you're looking for someone, you'll save time and trouble by abandoning the search and going home. The echo of a cynical, disdainful laugh floated back to us as she set speed to her car and vanished in the dark. Jules de Grandin stared after her, his hand still halfway to the hat he had politely touched when she first addressed us. Astonishingly, he burst into a laugh. Tiens, my friend, he exclaimed when he regained his breath. It seems there are more locks than one for which we seek the keys tonight. 3. David Hume, His Journal Arabella Hume came quickly toward us as we entered the hall. Sorrow and hope, 
or the entreaty of hope, was in the gaze she turned on us. Also, it seemed to me, there lay deep in her eyes some latent, nameless fear, vague and indefinable as a child's dread of the dark, and as terrifying. Oh, Dr. Trowbridge, Dr. de Granda, have you found out anything? Do you know anything? She quavered. It's all so dreadful, so, so impossible. Can you, have you any explanation? De Grandin bent stiffly from the hips as he took her hand in his and raised it to his lips. Courage, madame, he exhorted. We shall find her. Never fear. Oh, yes, yes, she answered almost breathlessly. She will be found. She must be found. With you and Dr. Trowbridge looking for her, I know it. Don't you think a mother who has been as close to her child as I have been to Alice since Ronald was killed may have a sixth sense where she is concerned? I have such a sense. I tell you, I know. Alice is near. The little Frenchman regarded her somberly. I, too, have a feeling she is not far distant, he declared. It is as if she were near us in an adjoining room, by example, but a room with sound-proof walls and a cleverly hidden door. It is for you to help us find that door, and the key which will unlock it, Madame Hume. I'll do everything I can, she promised. Very good. You can tell us to begin all that you know, all you have heard of David Hume, the founder of this family. Arabella gave him a half-startled, half-disbelieving glance, almost as though he had requested her to state her views of the Einstein hypothesis, or some similarly recondite and irrelevant manner. "'I really don't know anything about him,' she returned somewhat coldly. "'He seems to have been a sort of Melchizedek, appearing from nowhere and without any antecedents.' Hmm? De Grandin stroked his little wheat-blonde moustache with affectionate thoughtfulness. There are then no records, no family records of any kind which one can consult, no deeds or wills or leases, by example. Only the family Bible, and that, eh bien, madame, we may do worse than consult the scriptures in our present difficulty. By all means, lead us to it, he broke in. The records of ten generations of Humes were spread upon the sheets bound between the book of Malachi and the Apocrypha. Of succeeding members of the family there was extensive register, their births, their baptisms, their progeny and deaths, as well as matrimonial alliances being catalogued with painstaking detail. Of David Hume the only entry read, Died in ye hope of glorious resurrection at years eighty-one, months seven, days twenty, ye twenty-ninth September, sixteen fifty-seven. Nom d'un book, and that is all. De Grandin tugged so viciously at the waxed ends of his moustache that I felt sure the hairs would be wrenched loose from his lip. Satan, bake the fellow for a pusillanimous rogue. Even though he had small pride of ancestry, he should have considered future generations. He should have had a thought for my convenience, pardieu. He closed the great cedar-bound book with a resounding bang, and thrust it angrily back into the case. But as he shoved the heavy volume from him, a hammered brass corner reinforcing the cover caught against the shelf edge, wrenching the tome from his hands, and the Bible fell crashing to the floor. Oh, mille pardon, he cried contritely, stooping to retrieve the fallen book. I did lose my temper, madame, and, dear, dear, dear what have we here? The impact of the fall had split the brittle, age-worn cedar slabs with which the Bible had been bound, and where the wood had buckled gable-wise, the glazed leather inner binding had cracked in a long vertical fissure, and from this opening protruded a sheaf of folded paper. Even as we leaned forward to inspect it, we saw that it was covered with fine crabbed writing in all but totally faded ink. Bearing the manuscript to the reading table, de Grandin switched on all the lights in the electrolier and bent over the faded, time-obliterated sheets. For a moment he knit his brows in concentration. Then, Ah-ha! he exclaimed exultantly. Ah-ha-ha, ah, my friends! We have at last flushed old Monsieur David's secret from its covert. 
Come close and look, if you will be so good. He spread the sheets upon the polished tabletop and tapped the uppermost with the tip of a small, well-manicured forefinger. You see? he asked. Although the passage of three hundred years had dimmed the ink with which the old scribe wrote, enough remained to let us read across the yellowed paper's top. David Hume, his journal. And below? Inscribed at his house at Twelve Trees in Ye Colony of New... The rest had faded out, but enough was there to tell us that some secret archive of the family had been brought to light, and that the Scrivener had been that mysterious ancestor of whom no more was known than that he once lived at Twelve Trees. "'May one trespass on your hospitality for pen and paper, madame?' de Grandin asked, his little round blue eyes shining with suppressed excitement, the twin needles of his waxed moustache points twitching like the whiskers of an agitated tomcat. This writing is so faint, it would greatly tax one to attempt reading it aloud, and by tomorrow it may be fainter with exposure to the air. But if you will give leave that I transcribe it while I yet may read, I will endeavour to prepare a copy and read you the results of my work when it is done. Arabella Hume, scarcely less excited than we, nodded hasty assent, and de Grandin shut himself in the ancestor's room with pen and paper, and a tray of cigarettes, to perform his task. Twice, while we waited in the hall, we saw the butler tiptoe into the closed room in answer to the little Frenchman's summons. His first trip was accompanied by a bowl of ice, a glass, and a decanter of brandy. "'He'll drink himself into a stupor,' Arabella told me when the second consignment of liquor was borne in. "'Not he,' I assured her with a laugh. Alcohol's only a febrifuge with him. He drinks it like water when he's working intensively, and it never seems to affect him. Oh, she answered somewhat doubtfully. Well, I hope he'll manage to stay sober till he's finished. Wait and see, I told her. If he's unsteady on his feet, I'll— De Grandin's entrance cut my promise short. His face was flushed, his little round blue eyes were shining as though with unshed tears— and his moustache fairly bristling with excitement and elation, but of alcoholic intoxication there was no slightest sign. Voyez, he ordered, flourishing a sheaf of rustling papers. Although the writing was so faded that I did perforce miss much of the story of Monsieur the Old One, enough remained to give us information of the great importance. But yes, your closest attention, if you please. Seating himself on the table edge, and swinging one small patent leather-shod foot in rhythm with his reading, he began. And now my case was truly worser than before, for though my Muslim captors had been followers of Mahound, these that had taken me from them were worshippers of Satan's self, and nightly bowed the knee to Beelzebub, whom they worshipped in the image of a peacock heiter Melek Taus, whose favour they are wont to invoke with every sort of wickedness. For their black scriptures teach that God is good and merciful and slow to take offence, while Shaitan, as they name the devil, is ever near and ever watchful to do hurt to mankind, wherefore he must be propitiated by all who would not feel his malice. And so they work all manner of evil." accounting that as virtue which would be deemed most villainous by us, and confessing and repenting of good acts as though they were the deadliest of sins. Their chief priest is Eclept the Mere, and of all their wicked tribe he is the wickedest, scrupling not at murder and finding great delight in such vile acts as caused the Lord aforetimes to rain down fire and brimstone on the evil cities of the plain. Once, as I stood without their temple gate by night, I did espy a great procession entering with the light of torches, and with every sound of minstrels and mirth. But in the middle of the revellers there walked a group of maidens, and these did weep continually. And when I asked the meaning of this sight, they told me that these girls, the very flower of the tribe, had been selected by the mere for his delight, and for the lust and cruelty of those who acted as his counsellors. For such is their religion that the pontifex may choose from out their womanhood as many as he pleases, and do unto them, even according to the dictates of his evil will. 
nor may any say him nay. And as I looked upon these woeful women, I beheld that each was clasped about the middle by a stomacher of cunningly wrought silver, and this, they told me, was the girdle of a bride, for their women don such girdles when they are ready to engage in wedlock, or when they tread the path of sorrow which leads them to the mere and degradation. For he who gives his daughter voluntarily to be devoured by the mere acquires merit in the eyes of Satan, and to lie as paramour to the devil's viceroy on earth is accounted honourable for any woman, yea, even greater than to enter into matrimony. The little Frenchman laid his paper down and turned his quick bird-like glance upon us. Is it now clear? he asked. This old Monsieur David was undoubtedly sold as slave unto the Yezidis by Muslims who had in some way captured him. It is of Sheikh Adi, the sacred city of the Satanists, he writes, and his reference to the silver girdles of the brides is most illuminating, n'est-ce pas? Consider what he has to say a little later. Shuffling through the pile of manuscript, he selected a fresh sheet and resumed. Yet she, who was the daughter of this man of blood and sin, was fair and good as any Christian maid. Moreover, her heart was inclined toward me, and many a kind act she did for me, the Christian slave, who sadly lacked for kindness in that evil mountain city. And so, as it has ever been twixt man and maid, we loved, and loving knew that we could not be happy till our fates joined for ever. And so it was arranged that we should fly to freedom in the south, where I could take her to wife, for she had agreed to renounce Satan and all his ways, to follow in the pathway of the true religion. Now in the falling of the year, when crops were gathered and the husbandry was through, these people were wont to gather in their temple of the peacock, and make a feast wherewith they praised the power of evil, and on the altar would be offered beasts, birds, and women devoted to the service of the arch-fiend. And thus did Kudeja and I arrange the manner of our flight. When all within the temple was prepared, and we could hear the sound of drums and trumpets offering praise unto the devil, we slipped quickly down the mountain pass. She closely veiled like any Moslem woman. I disguised as a man of Kurdistan, and with us were two mules well laden with gold and jewels of precious stones, which she had filched from the treasury of the Mir her sire. Nor did we loiter on the way, but hastened ever till we came to the border of the land of evil, and were safe among the Moslems, who treated us right kindly, believing us co-religionists who were fleeing from the worshippers of Satan. And so we came at last to Basra, and thence by ship to Muscat, from whence we sailed again and finally came once more to England. But ere we breathed the English air again, we had been wed with Christian rite, and Kudeja had dropped her heathen name and taken that of Mary, which had also been my mother's, and sure a sweeter bride or truer wife has no man ever had. E'en though she saw the light of day beneath the shadow of the devil's temple, Yet, though she had accepted Christ and put behind her Lucifer and all his works, when we did stand before the parson to be wed, my Mary wore about her the great silver belt which had been fashioned for her marriage when she dwelt on Satan's mountain. And this we have unto this day, as a marriage portion for the women of our house. Most crafty are those devil men from whom we fled, and well were we aware of it, and so we came to this new land, where I did leave my olden name behind, and take the name of Hume, that those who might come seeking us might the better be befooled. And yet, though leagues of ocean toss between us and the worshippers of Satan, a thought still plagues us as a naughty dream may vex a frightened child. The office of high priest to Melek Taus is hereditary in the family of Mir. The eldest son ascends the altar to perform the rites of blood the moment that his sire has breathed his last. And if there be no son, then must the eldest daughter of the line be wedded unto Satan, with formal ceremony and silver girdle, and serve as priestess in her father's stead until a son is born, whereupon she is led forth with all solemnity and put to death with horrid torment, for her sufferings are a libation unto Beelzebub, 
and thereupon a regency of under-priests must serve the king of evil till the son is grown to man's estate. Wherefore, O ye who may come after me in this the family I have founded, I do adjure ye to make choice of death, rather than submit to the demands of the worshippers of Satan, for in the years to come it well may happen that the mere his line may be exhausted, and then those crafty men of magic who do dwell on Mount Lalesh may seek ye out, and summon ye to serve the altar of the devil. And so I warn you, if the time should come, when you receive a message from ye know not where, bidding ye simply to come home, that this shall be the sign, and straightway shall ye flee with utmost haste, or if ye cannot flee, then take your life with your own hand, for better far is it to face an outraged God with the blood stains of self-murder on your hands than to stand before the seat of judgment with your soul foredoomed for that you were a priest and server of the archfiend in your days on earth. I have... Well? I prompted as the silence lengthened. What else? There is no else, my friend, he answered. As I told you, the ink with which Monsieur L'Ancetre wrote was faded as an old bell's charms. The remainder of his message is but the shadow of a shadow. An angel out of paradise could not decipher it. We sat in silence for a moment, and it was Arabella Hume who framed our common thought in words. He said, If the time should come when ye receive a message from ye know not where, bidding ye simply to come home, this shall be the sign. The message Alice got on the Ouija board yesterday, you remember? You saw it repeated yourselves before we went to church. De Grandin bent a fixed, unwinking stare on her. Madame, he asked, can you not give us some description of this stranger who desired that you let him see the wedding girdle of Madame David? Was he, according to your guess, a Levantine? Mrs. Hume considered him a moment thoughtfully. Then, no, I shouldn't think so, she replied. He seemed more like a Spaniard, possibly Italian, though it's hard to say more than that he was dark and very clean-looking, and spoke English with that perfect lack of accent which showed it was not his mother tongue. You know, each word sharply defined, as though it might be the result of a mental translation. Perfectly, de Grandin nodded. I should say— well, I should say it's all a lot of nonsense, I broke in. It may be true old David Hume was sold as a slave to these devil worshippers, and that he ran off with the high priest's daughter and all the money he could get his hands on, but you know how superstitious people were in those days. The chances are he was filled full of fantastic stories by the Yazidis, and believed everything he heard, and more that he imagined. I'd say his conscience was troubling him toward the last— Perhaps his mind was failing, too. Look how carefully he hid what he'd written in the cover of the family Bible. Is that the action of a normal man? Especially if he seriously intended future generations to profit by his warning. Arabella glanced at each of us in turn, finally gave vent to a sigh of relief, and put her hand on mine. Thank you, Samuel, she said. I knew there was some explanation for it all. But Alice's strange disappearance and all this has so upset me that I'm hardly normal. To de Grandin, she added, I'm sure Dr. Trowbridge's explanation is the right one. Old David must have been weak-minded when he wrote that senseless warning. He was eighty-one when he died, and you know how old people are inclined to imagine things. Like children, really. A stubborn, argumentative expression crossed de Grandin's face, but gave place instantly to one of his quick, elfin grins. Perhaps I have put too much trust in the vaporings of a senile old man's broken mind, he admitted. Nevertheless, the fact remains that Mademoiselle Alice is not here, and the task remains for us to find her. Come, friend Trowbridge. There is little we can do here, and much we can do elsewhere. Let us go if we have Madame's permission to retire. He bowed with continental grace to Arabella. Oh, yes, and thank you so much for what you've done already, Mrs. Hume returned. I'm half inclined to think this is some madcap prank of Alice's, but... 
her expression of false confidence gave way a moment, unmasking the panic fear which gnawed at her heart. If we hear nothing by morning, I think we'd better summon the police, don't you? By all means, he agreed, taking her hand in his, and bending ceremoniously above it ere he turned to accompany me from the house. Thank you, my friend, he murmured as we began our homeward drive. Your interruption was most timely, and served to divert poor Madame's mind from the awful horror I saw gathering around us. Eh? I returned. You don't mean to tell me you actually believe that balderdash you read us? He turned on me in blank amazement. And was your avowal of disbelief in Monsieur David's tale not simulated? He asked. Good Lord, I answered in disgust. Do you mean to say you swallowed that old dotard's story, all that nonsense about an hereditary priesthood of the devil worshippers and the possibility of... See here, don't you remember? He said if the Mir's male line became extinct, the eldest daughter had to serve and that she must be married to the devil. That might be possible, mystically speaking. But he specifically said, she shall thereafter act as high priestess until a son is born. I know the legend of Robert the Devil, and it was probably implicitly believed in David Hume's day, for the devil was a very real person then. But we've rather graduated from that sort of medievalism nowadays. How can a woman be married to the devil and bear him a son? There was more of sneer than smile in the mirthless grin he turned on me. Have you been to India? he demanded. India? Of course not, but what's that got to do with... Then perhaps it is that you do not know of the Devadasis, or wives of Siva. In that benighted land a father thinks he does acquire merit by giving up his daughter to be wedded to the god, and wedded to him she truly is, with all the formal pomp accompanying the espousal of a princess. Thereafter she is accounted honourable as consort of the great god of destruction. But though her wedded lord is but a thing of carven stone, she does not lack for offspring. Nor, par Dieu, she is more often than not a mother before her thirteenth birthday and several times a mother when her twentieth year is reached, if she survives that long. Consider the analogy here. From what I have beheld with my own two eyes, and my sight is very keen, and from what I have been told by witnesses, who had no need to lie or even stretch the truth, I know that Monsieur David's narrative is based on fact, and very ugly fact at that. But what about hiding his warning in the cover of the Bible? I persisted. Surely three centuries have passed since he penned those words, de Grandin interrupted. And in that time much may be forgotten. That David told his children where they might look for guidance, if the need for guidance rose, I make no doubt. But in the course of time his admonition was forgotten, or— He broke off musingly, and I had to prompt him. Yes, or— or the story of some secret warning has been handed down to each generation, he replied. Did it not strike you more than once that Madame Hume was not entirely honest, pardon I should say, frank with us? The fear of something which she could or would not mention was plainly in her eyes when we came from the church, and earlier in the evening her efforts to direct the conversation from that obscure message which her daughter had from the Ouija board— were far more resolute than they would have been had she had nothing but a distaste for superstitious practice to excuse them. Also, when we did ask for information relative to Monsieur David, she suddenly turned cold to us, and had I not persisted would undoubtlessly have turned us from examination of the family Bible. Moreover, again he paused, and again I prompted him, Jules de Grandin is experienced, he assured me solemnly. As a member of Le Sûreté, he has had much to do with questioned documents. He knows ink. He knows paper. He can scent a forgery or an attempt at alteration as far as he can recognize the symptoms of Coriza. Yes. Yes, then what? This, Cordier. I played the dolt, the simple guileless fool, tonight, my friend. 
but this I say with half an eye as I made transcription of old David's story. Someone, I know not who, someone has essayed to blot that writing out with acid ink eradicator. Had the writing been in modern metallic ink, the effort would have been successful, but Monsieur Lancetre wrote with the old vegetable ink of his time, and so the acid did not quite efface it. It is that to which I owed my ability to read the journal. But believe me, good friend, it was a man or woman, and not time, which dimmed the writing on those pages and rendered illegible much which old David wrote to warn his descendants, and which would have greatly simplified our problems. But who could have done it, and why? I asked. He raised his narrow shoulders in an irritable shrug. Ask the good God, or perhaps the devil, as to that, he told me. They know the answer, not I. 4. By Whose Hand? Threatening little flurries of snow had been skirmishing down from the cloud-veiled sky all evening. Before we were halfway to my house, the storm attacked in force, great feathery flakes following each other in smothering profusion obscuring traffic lights, clinging to the windshield, clogging our wheels. Midnight was well past as we stamped up my front steps, brushed our feet on the doormat, and paused a moment at the vestibule while I fumbled for my latch-key. As I swung back the door, the office phone began a shrill, hysterical cachination, which seemed to rise in terrified crescendo as I ran down the hall. Hello? I challenged gruffly. Dr. Trowbridge, the high-pitched voice across the wire called. Yes, what? This is Wilbur, sir, Mrs. Hume's butler, you know. Oh, well, what's... It's the missus, sir. She's... I'm afraid you'll be too late, sir, but please hurry. I just found her, and she's... His voice trailed off in a wheeze of asthmatic excitement, and I could hear him gasping in a futile effort to regain his speech. Oh, all right. Do what you can for her till we get there. We'll be right over, I called back. Attempting to ascertain the nature of the illness by questioning the inarticulate domestic would be only a waste of time, I saw, and obviously time was precious. Come on, I bade de Grandin. Something's happened to Arabella Hume. Wilbur is so frightened he's gasping like a newly landed fish and can't give any information. So it may be anything from a broken arm to a stroke of apoplexy, but... But certainly, by all means, of course, the Frenchman agreed enthusiastically. Next to solving a perplexing bit of crime, he dearly loved a medical emergency. With deftness, which combined uncanny speed with almost superhuman accuracy of selection, he bundled bandages and styptics, stimulants and sedatives, a sphygmomanometer and a kit of first-aid instruments into a bag, then, Let us go, he urged. All is ready. Wilbur was pacing back and forth on the veranda when we arrived some half an hour later. His face was blue with cold, and his teeth chattered so he could scarcely form the hurried greeting which he gave us. "'God, gentlemen,' he told us tremblingly, "'I thought you'd never get here.' Eh "'Bien, so did we,' de Grandin answered. "'Madame, your mistress, where is she, if you please?' "'Upstairs, sir, in her dressing-room. I found her like she is just before I called you.' I'd finished locking up the house and was going to my room by way of the back stairs when I heard the sound of something heavy falling up the hall toward the front of the house and ran to see if I was wanted. She didn't answer when I knocked. Indeed, it seemed so awful quiet in her room that it fair gave me the creeps, sir. So I made bold to knock again. Then when she didn't answer, to look in and... Les dons, mon vieux, de Grandin interrupted. The circumstances of your discovery can wait at present. It is Madame Hume that we would see. The butler was a step or two ahead of us as we climbed the stairs, but as we approached Mrs. Hume's door his footsteps lagged. By the time we stood before the portal he had dropped back to de Grandin's elbow, and made no motion either to rap upon the panels or to turn the knob for us. Lead on, de Grandin repeated. We would see her at once, if you please. "'There's nothing you can do, of course,' the servant answered. "'But in a case like this it's best to have a doctor, so—' The little Frenchman's temper broke beneath the strain. 
damn yes, he snapped. But save your conversation till a later time, my friend. I do not care for it at present. Without more ado, he turned the latch and swung the door back, stepping quickly past the butler into Arabella's boudoir, but coming to a halt on the threshold. Close behind him, I stepped forward, but stopped with a gasp at what I saw. Suspended by a heavy silken curtain cord, looped twice about her neck, Arabella Hume hung from the iron curtain rod, bridging the archway between her chamber and her dressing room. A satin upholstered boudoir chair lay overturned on its back beneath her and a little to one side. Her flaccid feet in their satin evening slippers swung a scant four inches from the floor. Her hands draped limply at her sides and her head was sharply bent forward to the left. Her lips were slightly parted, and between them showed a quarter inch of tongue, like the pale pink pistil of a blossom protruding from the leaves. Her eyes were partly opened, and already covered with the shining gelatin film of death, but not at all protuberant. "'Good heavens!' I exclaimed. "'My God, sir, ain't it awful?' whispered Wilbur. Nom de Dieu, de nom de Dieu, c'est une affaire du diable, said Jules de Grandin. To Wilbur, you say you first discovered her thus when you called Dr. Trowbridge? he demanded. Yes, sir. Then why in the name of ten million small blue devils did you not cut her down? The chances are she was already dead, but you daren't cut a hanging person down to the coroner's looked at him. Dast you, sir? the servant replied. Oh, eh, sacré nom d'un petit bonhomme. De Grandin wrenched savagely at the ends of his moustache. This chimney-corner law, this smug wisdom of ignorance, it will drive me mad. Had you cut the cord by which she hung when you first saw her, it is possible there would have been no need to call the coroner at all, great stupid head, he stormed. Abruptly he put his anger by as one might lay off a garment. No matter, he resumed. The mischief is now done. We must to work. Wilbur, bring me a decanter full, full, remember, of brandy. Yes, sir, the servant answered. Thank you, sir. And Wilbur? Yes, sir. Take a drink or two yourself before you serve me. Thank you, sir. The butler departed on his errand with alacrity. Quick, my friend the Frenchman ordered. We must examine her before he returns. Snipping through the silken strangling cord with a pair of surgeon's scissors, he eased the body down in his arms and bore it to the couch, then with infinite care loosened the ligature about the throat and slipped the noose over her head. Morbleu, he murmured, as he laid the cord upon the table. Who taught her to form a hangman's knot, one wonders? I took the curtain cord in my hand and looked at it. It was right. The loop which had been round Arabella's neck was no ordinary slipknot, but a carefully fashioned hangman's halter, several turns of end being taken round the cord above the noose, thus ensuring greater freedom for the loop to tighten around the throat. It may be so, I heard him whisper to himself, but I down doubt it. What's that? I asked. He bent above the body, examining the throat first with his naked eye, then through a small but powerful lens which he drew from his waistcoat pocket. Consider, he replied, rising from his task to regard me with a fixed, unwinking stare. Wilbur tells us that he heard a piece of furniture overturned. That would be the chair on which this poor one stood. Immediately afterward he ran to her room and knocked. Receiving no response, he knocked again. Then, when no answer was forthcoming, he entered. With due allowance made for everything, not more than five minutes could have elapsed. Yet she was dead. I do not like it. She might not have been dead when he first saw her, I returned. You know how quickly unconsciousness follows strangulation. She might have been unconscious, and Wilbur assumed she was dead— then, because of his fool notion that it was unlawful to cut a hanging body down, he left her strangling here while he ran to phone us and waited for us on the porch. The little Frenchman nodded shortly. How is death caused in hanging? 
he demanded. Why, uh, by strangulation, asphyxia, or fracture of the cervical vertebrae and rupture of the spinal cord. Precisément. If Madame Hume had choked to death from yonder bar, it is not nearly certain that not only her poor tongue, but her eyes as well would have been forced forward by pressure on the constricted blood vessels. I suppose so, but the devil take all butts. See here. Drawing me forward, he thrust his lens into my hand and pointed to the dead woman's throat. Look carefully, he ordered. You will observe the double track made by the wide silk noose with which poor Madame Hume was hanged. Yes. I nodded as my eye followed the parallel anemic band marked by the curtain cord. I see it. Very good. Now look more closely. See? Hold the glass so, and tell me if you see a third, a so narrow and deeper mark, a spiral track traced in slightly purple bruise beneath the wide white marks made by the curtain cord. By heaven! I started as his slender finger pointed to the darker, deeper depression. It's pretty faint, but it's still perceptible. I wonder what that means. Murder, pardieu! He spat the accusation viciously. Hanged poor Madame Arabella undoubtedly was, but hanged after she was dead. This so narrow purple mark, I know him. Ah, do I not, good dear? In the native states of India I have seen him more than once, and never can it be mistaken for other than itself. No, it is the mark of the rumal of the thugs, the strangling cord of those who serve Bawani, the black goddess. Scarcely thicker than a harp-string it is, yet deadly as a serpent's fang. See those evil ones loop it quickly round their victim's neck, draw it tight with crossed ends, then with their knuckles knead sharply at the base of the skull where the atlas lies, and poof, it is done. Yes, certainly. You want more proof? He rose and faced me with flashing eyes, his little milk-white teeth bare beneath the line of his moustache. Then look. Abruptly he took Arabella's cheeks between his palms and drew her head forward, then rocked it sharply from side to side. The evidence was indisputable. Such limber, limp flaccidity meant but one thing. The woman's neck was broken. But the drop, I persisted. She might have broken her neck when she kicked the chair from under her and— Ah, bah, he countered hotly. That chair seat is a scant half meter high. Her feet swung at least four inches from the floor. She could not possibly have dropped a greater length than sixteen inches. Her weight was negligible. I lifted her a moment since, not more than ninety-five or ninety-eight pounds, at most. A drop so short for such a light woman could not possibly have broken the spine. Besides, this fracture is high, not lower than the atlas or the axis. The ligature about her neck encompassed the second cervical vertebra. The two things do not match, nor, my friend, this is no suicide, but murder cleverly dressed to simulate it. Your brandy, sir. Wilbur halted at the door, keeping his eyes averted resolutely from the quiet form upon the couch. Merci bien, de Grandin answered. Put it down, mon vieux, then call monsieur the coroner, and tell him we await him. If the other servants have not yet been appraised of madame's death, it will do no harm to let them wait till morning. Poor Arabella. I murmured, staring with tear-dimmed eyes at the pathetic little body underneath the coverlet. Who could have wanted to kill her? Eh bien, who could have wanted to steal Mademoiselle Alice away? Who wanted to obtain the devil-worshipper's marriage belt? Who sent the strange veiled lady following after us to tell us that our quest was vain? He answered, bitter mockery in his tones. Good heavens! You mean precisely, exactly, quite so. I mean no more and certainly no less, my friend. This is assuredly the devil's business, and right well have his servants done it, certainly. John Martin, county coroner and leading mortician of the city, and Jules de Grandin were firm friends. 
At the little Frenchman's earnest entreaty he drove Parnell, the coroner's physician, to perform an autopsy which corroborated every assumption de Gronda had made. Death was due to coma induced by rupture of the myelin, not to strangulation, the post-mortem revealed. Moreover, though Parnell rebelled at the suggestion, Robert Hartley, chief biochemist at Mercy Hospital, was called in to make a decimetric test of Arabella's liver. Carefully, de Grandin, Martin and I watching him, he macerated a bit of the organ, mixed it with lamp black, and strained it through a porcelain filter. While Parnell sulked in a corner of the laboratory, the rest of us watched breathlessly as the serous liquid settled in the glass dish beneath the filter. It was clear. Well, that's that, said Hartley. Mais oui, c'est démontré, de Grandin nodded. Huh? Parnell grunted in disgust. The ruddy-faced, grey-haired coroner looked interrogatively from one to the other. Just what's been proved, gentlemen? he asked. Absence of glycogen, Hartley answered. Murder, Pablo, de Grandin added. Nothing, nothing at all, Parnell assured him. But, the coroner began, more bewildered than ever. Monsieur, de Grandin cut him short. Glycogen, or liver sugar, represents the stored-up energy of muscular strength in the machines we call our bodies. When it is plentiful, we are strong, active, hearty, what you call filled with pep. As it is depleted, we become weakened. When it is gone, we are exhausted, yes. Undoubtedly, a woman being strangled would make a tremendous last muscular effort to fight off her assailant. Such an effort, lasting but a little minute, would burn this muscle power we call glycogen from her liver. Her reservoir of strength would be drained. Am I not right? He turned for confirmation to Hartley, who nodded slow agreement. Very well, then. Now, the experiment Dr. Hartley has just performed shows us conclusively that glycogen was practically absent from Madame Hume's liver. Had it been present in even small quantities, the filtered liquid would have been cloudy, yes. But it was clear, or very nearly so, as you did observe with your own two eyes. What, then? Simply this. Mon Dieu, she fought frenziedly, though futilely, for her life, before the vile miscreant who killed her drew his rumal tight about her throat, and with his diabolically skilful knuckles broke her neck. It was the tightening strangle cord which prevented outcry, though the chair we found overturned was undoubtedly turned over in the struggle not kicked aside by her after she had adjusted the hangman's noose about her neck. No, by no means. Had she been self-hanged, there would be ample store of glycogen found in her liver. As it is... He paused, raising shoulders, elbows, and eyebrows in a shrug of matchless eloquence. I see, said Mr. Martin slowly. But the jury did not. Dr. Parnell's lukewarm reception of de Grandin's theory, Hartley's refusal to testify to anything save that there was a lack of glycogen found in the liver, and the lack of cleverness with which the stage had been set to give plausibility to suspicion of suicide, combined to forge a chain of circumstantial evidence which all the little Frenchman's fiery oratory could not break. Suicide, dead by her own hand while of unsound mind, was the consensus of the jury. 5. The Missing Child Headlines screamed across the country. Mother slays self as cops hunt vanished child. Broken heart makes mother seek death. Love-crazed woman suicides as daughter disappears. These were among the more conservative statements which faced Americans from Maine to Oregon as they sat at breakfast and for a time reporters from the Metropolitan Dailies were as thick in our town as hungry flies around an abattoir. At length the hue and cry died down, and Arabella's death and Alice's strange disappearance gave way on the front page to the latest tales of scandal in municipal administration. Jules de Grandin shut himself in the study, emerging only at meal-time or after office hours for a chat with me, 
smoked innumerable vile-smelling French cigarettes, used the telephone a great deal, and posted many letters. But as far as I could see, his efforts to find Alice or run down her mother's murderers were nil. I should think you'd feel better if you went out a bit, I told him at breakfast one day. I know finding Alice is a hopeless task, and as for Arabella's murderer, I'm beginning to think she committed suicide after all, but— He looked up from the copy of the morning journal he had been perusing, and fixed me with a straight, unwinking stare. The police are cooperating, he answered shortly. Not a railway station or bus terminal lacks watchers, and no private cars or taxis leave the city limits without submitting to a secret but thorough inspection. What more can we do? Why, you might direct the search personally, or check up such few clues as they may find, I began, nettled by his loss of interest in the case. But he cut me short with a quick motion of his hand. My friend, he told me with one of his puckish grins, attend me. When I was a little lad, I had a dog, a silly, energetic little fellow, all barks and jumps and wagging tail. He dearly loved a cat, more bleu. The very sight of Madame Pousse would put him in a frenzy. How he would rush at her, how he would show his teeth and growl and put on the fierce face. Then, when she had retired to the safety of a pear tree, how he would stand beneath her refuge and twitch his tail and bark. Cordieu, sometimes I would think he must surely burst with barking. And she, the scornful pussy, did she object? Mille fois non. Safe in her sanctuary, she would eye him languidly and let him bark. At last, when he had barked himself into exhaustion, he would withdraw to think upon the evils of times, and Madame Pousse would leisurely descend the tree and trot away to safety. I would often say to him, My Toto, you are a great stupid head. Why do you do it? Why do you not depart a little distance from the tree and lie perdu? Then Madame Pousse may think that you have lost all interest and come down. Then poof, you have her at your mercy. But no, that foolish little dog, he would not listen to advice. And so, though he expended great energy and made a most impressive noise, he never caught a cat. Friend Trowbridge, I am not a foolish little dog, by no means. It is not I who do such things. Here in the house I stay, with strict instructions that I be not called should any want me on the telephone. I am not ever seen abroad. For all of the display I make, I might be dead or gone away. But I am neither. Always and ever I sit here all watchful, and frequently I do call the gendarmes to find if they have discovered that for which we seek. I know. I see all that takes place. If any makes a move, I know it. But those we seek do not know, I know. No, they think Jules de Grandin is asleep or drunk, or perhaps gone away. It is best so, I assure you. Anon, emboldened by my seeming lethargy, they will emerge from out their hiding place. Then... His smile became unpleasant, as he clenched one slender strong hand with a gesture suggestive of crushing something soft within it. Then, par Dieu, they shall learn that Jules de Grandin is not a fool, nor can they make the long nose at him with impunity. He helped himself to a second portion of broiled mackerel from the hot water dish, and resumed his perusal of the journal. Suddenly, Oh, eh, misère, calamité! C'est désastreux, he cried. Read here, my friend, if you please. Read it, and tell me that I am mistaken. Hands shaking with eagerness, he passed the paper to me, indicating a rather inconspicuous item in the lower left-hand corner of the third page. Child vanishes from Baptist home. Shortly after one o'clock this morning, Mrs. Maud Gordon, 47, a matron in the Harrisonville Baptist home, was awakened by sounds of crying from the ward in which the younger children of the orphanage were quartered. Going quickly to the room, the woman found some of the older children sitting up in bed and crying bitterly. Upon demanding what was wrong, she was told that a man had just been in the place, flashed a flashlight in several of the children's faces, 
then picked Charles Eastman, eight months, from his crib which stood near the open window, and made off with him. The matron at once gave the alarm, and a thorough search of the premises was made, but no trace of the missing child or his abductor could be found. The gates of the orphanage were shut and locked, and the lodgekeeper, who was awakened by the searching party, declared it would have been impossible for anyone to pass in or out without his knowledge, as his were the only keys to the gates beside those in the main office of the home, and the keys were in their accustomed place on his bureau in his bedroom when the alarm reached him. The home's extensive grounds are surrounded by a twelve-foot brick wall with an overhang on either side, and climbing it, either from the outside or from within, would be almost impossible without extension ladders. The Eastman child's parents are dead, and his only living relative so far as known is an uncle lately released from the penitentiary. Police are checking up on this man's movements during the night, as it is thought he may have stolen the child to satisfy a grudge he had against the mother— now dead, whose testimony helped convict him on a charge of burglary five years ago. "'Well?' I asked as I laid the paper down. "'Is that what you read?' "'Elas, yes, it is too true.' "'Why, what do you mean?' I began, but he cut in hurriedly. "'Perhaps I do mistake, my friend. Although I have lived in your so splendid country for upward of five years, there is still much which is strange to me.' Is it that the sect you call the Baptists do not believe in infant baptism, that only those of riper years are given baptism by them? Yes, that's so, I answered. They hold that, no matter what they hold, if that be so, he interrupted, that this little one had not been accorded baptism is enough. Parbleu, it is much. Come, my friend, the time for concealing is past. Let us hasten, let us rush, let us fly. Rush, I echoed, bewildered. Where? To that orphan home of the so little unbaptized Baptists, of course, he answered almost furiously. Come, let us go right away, immediately at once. Maintained by liberal endowments, and not greatly taxed by superfluity of inmates, the Baptist home for children lay on a pleasant elevation some five miles out of Harrisonville. Its spacious grounds, which were equipped with every possible device for fostering organized play among its little guests, were, as the newspaper accounts described, surrounded by a brick wall of formidable height, with projecting overhangs flanging tea-wise from the top. Moreover, in an excess of caution, the builder had studded the wall's crest with a fringe of broken bottle-glass set in cement and any one endeavouring to cross the barrier must be prepared not only with scaling ladders so long as to be awkward to carry, but with a gangway or heavy pad to lay across the shark-tooth points of glass with which the wall was armoured. De Grandam made a rapid reconnaissance of the position, twisting viciously at his moustache, meanwhile. Ah, uh, alas, the poor one, he murmured, as his inspection was completed. Before I had some hope— now I fear the worst. Huh? I returned. What now? Plenty, par Dieu. A very damn great plenty, he answered bitterly. Come, let us interview the concierge. He is our only hope, I fear. I glanced at him in wonder as we neared the pretty little cottage in which the gatekeeper maintained his home and office. No, sir, the man replied to de Grandin's question. I'm sure no one could have come through that gate last night. It's usually locked for the night at ten o'clock, though I mostly sit up listening to the radio a little later, and if anything real important comes up, I'm on hand to open the gates. Last night there wasn't a soul, man or woman, except in the grocery deliveryman, coming here after six o'clock. Very quiet day it was, count the cold weather, I guess. I was up a little later than usual, too, but turned in about eleven o'clock, I should judge. I'd made the rounds of the grounds with Bruno a little after seven. And believe me, I'm here to tell you, no one could have been hiding anywhere without his knowing about it. No, sir. Here, Bruno. He raised his voice and snapped his fingers authoritatively, and a ponderous mastiff, seemingly big enough to drag down an elephant, ambled in and favored us with a display of awe-inspiring teeth as his black lips curled back in a snarl. Bruno slept right beside my bed, sir. The gatekeeper went on. 
and the window was open, so if anyone had so much as stopped by the gate to monkey with it, he'd have heard him, and, well, it wouldn't have been so good for him, I'm telling you. I recollect once when a petting party crossed the road from the gate, Bruno got kind of suspicious-like, and first thing any of us knew, he'd bolted through the window and made for him. I like to tore the shirt off the fella before I woke up and called him off. De Grandin nodded shortly. And may one examine your room for one little minute, monsieur? He asked courteously. We shall touch nothing, of course, and request that you be with us at all times. Well, I don't, uh... All right, the watchman responded as the Frenchman's hand strayed meaningfully toward his wallet. Come on. The small, neat room in which the gatekeeper slept had a single wide window opening obliquely toward the gate, and giving a view both of the portal and a considerable stretch of road in each direction, for the gatehouse was built into, and formed an integral part of the wall surrounding the grounds. From window sill to earth was a distance of perhaps six feet, possibly a trifle less. And your keys were where, if you please? de Grandin asked as he surveyed the chamber. Right on the bureau there, where I put them before I went to bed last night. And they was in the same place this morning when they called me from the office, too. Guess they'd better have been there, too. Anyone trying to sneak in and pinch them would have had old Bruno to deal with, even if I hadn't wakened, which I would have, count if I'm such a light sleeper. You have to be in a job like this. Perfectly, the Frenchman nodded understandingly as he walked to the window removed the immaculate white linen handkerchief from his sleeve, and flicked it lightly across the sill. "'Thank you, monsieur. We need not trouble you further, I think,' he continued, taking a bill from his folder and laying it casually on the bureau before turning to leave the room. At the gateway he paused a moment, examining the lock. It was a heavy snap-latch of modern workmanship, strong enough to defy the best efforts of a crew of journeyman safe-blowers. C'est très simple, he murmured to himself, as we left the gate and entered my car. Behold, friend Trowbridge. Withdrawing the white handkerchief from his cuff, he held it toward me. Across its virgin surface there lay, where he had brushed it on the watchman's window sill, a smear of yellow powder. Boulala la guay, he told me, in a weary, almost toneless voice. What, that? Devil dust? Precisément, my friend, that devil dust. Was it not simple? To his window they did creep, most doubtlessly on shoes with rubber soles, which would make no noise upon the frozen ground. Poof! The sleeping powder is tossed into his room, and he and his great mastiff are at once unconscious. They remove his keys. It is a so easy task. The gate is unlocked, opened then made fast with a retaining wedge, and the keys replaced upon his bureau. The little one is stolen, the gate closed behind the kidnappers, and the spring latch locks itself. When the alarm is broadcast, Monsieur le Concierge can swear in all good conscience that no one has gone through the gate, and that his keys are in their proper place. But certainly, of course they were. By damn, but they are clever, those ones. Whom do you mean? Who'd want to steal a little baby from an orphan's home? A little unbaptized baby. And a boy, he interjected. All right, a little unbaptized boy. I would give my tongue to the cat to answer that, he told me solemnly. That they are the ones who spirited Mademoiselle Alice away from before our very eyes, we cannot doubt. The technique of their latest crime has labeled them. But why they? whose faith is a bastardized descendant of the old religion of Zoroaster, a sort of disreputable twelfth cousin of the Parsees, should want to do this? No, it does not match, my friend. Jules de Grandin is much puzzled. He shook his head and pulled so savagely at his moustache that I feared he would do himself permanent injury. What in heaven's name? I began. And, in heaven's name, ha! Yes, we shall have much to do in heaven's name, my friend, he cut in. For a certainty, we are aligned against a crew who ply their arts in hell's name. 6. The Veiled Lady Again 
Harrisonville's newest citizens, gross weight 16 pounds 12 ounces, delayed their advent past all expectations that night. But with their overdue arrival came trying complications, and for close upon three hours two nurses, a badly worried young house physician and I, fought manfully to bring mother and her twins back across death's doorstep. It was well past midnight when I climbed my front steps, dog-tired, with hands that trembled from exhaustion and eyes still smarting from the glare of surgery lamps. Half a gill of brandy, then bed, and no morning office hours tomorrow, I promised myself as I tiptoed down the hall. I poured the spirit out into a graduate and was in the act of draining it when the sudden furious clamor of the night bell arrested my upraised hand. Acquired instinct will not be denied. Scarcely aware of what I did, I put the brandy down untasted and stumbled, rather than walked, to the front door to answer the alarm. Doctor! Doctor, let me in! Hide me! Quick, don't let them see us talking! The fear-sharpened feminine whisper cut through the darkened vestibule, and a woman's form lurched drunkenly forward into my arms. She was breathing in short-labored gasps, like a hunted creature. Quick, quick! Again that scarcely audible murmur, more pregnant with terror than a scream. Shut the door! Lock it! Bolt it! Stand back out of the light, please! I retreated a step or two, my visitor still clinging to me like a drowning woman to her rescuer. As we passed beneath the ceiling light, I took a glance at her. I was vaguely conscious of her charm, of her beauty, of her perfume— so delicate that it was but the faint, seductive shadow of a scent. A tightly fitting hat of black was set on her head, and draped from this, from ear tip to ear tip, was stretched a black mesh veil, its upper edge just clearing the tip of her nose, but covering mouth, cheeks, and chin, leaving the eyes and brow uncovered. Through its diaphanous gauze I could see the gleam of carmine lips and tiny pearl-like teeth. Seemingly sharp as little sabers, as the small childish mouth writhed back from them in panic terror. Why, why, I stammered, it's the lady we saw when we— Perfectly, it is Mademoiselle L'Inconnu, the Lady of the Veil, de Grandin finished, as he descended the last three steps at a run, and in a lavender dressing gown and purple kidskin slippers— a violet muffler draped around his throat, stepped nimbly forward to assist me with my lovely burden. "'What is it, mademoiselle?' he asked, half leading, half carrying her toward the consulting room. "'Have you perhaps come again to tell us that our search is vain?' "'No, no!' the woman moaned, leaning still more heavily upon us. "'Help me! Oh, help me, please! I'm wounded! They... he... Oh, I'll tell you everything. Excellent! De Grandin nodded as he flung back the door and switched on the electric lights. First let us see your hurt, then. Mon Dieu! Friend Trowbridge, she had swooned. Even as he spoke, the woman buckled weakly at the knees, and like a lovely doll from which the sawdust has been let, crumpled forward toward the floor. I freed one hand from her arm intent on helping place her on the table, and stared at it with an exclamation of dismay. The fingers were dyed to the knuckles with blood, and on the girl's dark motor coat an ugly dull red stain was sopping wet and growing every moment. Très bien so, de Grandin murmured, placing his hands beneath her arms and heaving her up the examination table. She will be better here for... Dieu de chien, my friend. Observe. As the heavy outdoor wrap the woman wore fell open, we saw that it, a pair of modish patent leather pumps, her motor gloves and veil-draped hat, were her sole wardrobe. From veil-swathed chin to blue-veiled instep, she was as nude as on the day she came into the world. No wound showed on her ivory shoulders or creamy breast, but on her chest, immediately above the gently swelling breasts, was a medallion-shaped outline, or cicatrix, which was crudely tattooed. "'Good heavens!' I exclaimed. "'What is it? Precisément, what is it? And what are these?' 
The little Frenchman countered, ripping aside the flimsy veil and exposing the girl's pale face. On each cheek, so deeply sunk into the flesh below the mailer points that they could only be the result of branding, were two small cruciform scars, perhaps three-quarters of an inch in height by half an inch in width, describing the device of a passion cross turned upside down. Why, of all ungodly things, I began, and— ah, Ungodly, do you say, mon vieux? Pardieu, you call it by its proper name, said Jules de Grandin. An insult to le bon Dieu was intended, for this poor one wears upon her body. I couldn't stand it, moaned the girl upon the table. Not that, not that. He looked at me and smiled, and put his baby hand against my cheek. He was the image of my dear little— No, no, I tell you, you mustn't— Oh, no! For a moment she sobbed brokenly, then— Oh, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Remember not our offenses, nor the offenses of our forefathers. Spare us, good Lord. I will, I tell you. Yes, I'll go to him and tell if— Dr. de Grandin. Her voice sank to a sibilant whisper, and she half rose from the table, glaring about with glazed, unseeing eyes. Dr. de Grandin, watch for the chalk signs of the devil. Follow the pointing tridents. They'll lead you to the place when— Oh, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, have pity, Jesu. Delirium, I diagnosed. Quick to Grandin, she's running a pretty high temperature. Help me turn her. The wound seems in her back. It was. Puncturing the soft flesh a little to the left of the right shoulder, glancing along the scapula, then striking outward to the shoulder tip, was a gunshot wound, superficial but undoubtedly painful, and productive of extensive hemorrhage. With probe and cotton and mercurochrome we sterilized the wound, then made a gauze compress liberally sprinkled with Sen's mixture, and made it fast with cross bandages of adhesive tape. Three-quarters of a grain of morphine injected in her arm provided a defense against recurring pain, and sank her in a deep and peaceful sleep. "'I think she'd best be taken to a hospital,' I told him when our work was finished. "'We've given all the first aid that we can, and she'll be better tended there.' We've no facilities for bed rest here, or— Agreed, he broke in. To City Hospital, by all means. They have a prison ward there. But we can't put her there, I objected. She's guilty of no crime, and besides, she's in no condition to go out alone for several days. She'll be there when we want her, without the need of bars to keep her in. Not bars to keep her in, he told me. Bars to keep them out, my friend. Them who, the good God knows who, I only suspect what, he answered. Come, let us take her there without delay. Can't be done, son, Dr. Donovan told de Grandin when we arrived at City Hospital with our patient. The prison wards exclusively reserved for gents and ladies on special leave from the Huskow, or those with some specific charge pending against them. You'd not care to place a charge against the lady, would you? De Grandin considered him a moment. Murder is still a relatively serious offense, even in America, he returned thoughtfully. Cannot she be held as a material witness? To whose murder? asked the practical Donovan. The little Eastman boys, he who was stolen from the Baptist home last night, the Frenchman replied. Hold on, feller, be your age, the other cautioned. Who says the little lad's been murdered? The police can't even find him alive. Until they find his body, there's no corpus delicti to support a murder charge. Once more, the Frenchman gazed somberly at him. Whether you know it or not, my friend, he answered seriously. That little one is dead. Dead as mutton and died most unpleasantly, like the sinless little lamb he was, yes. Maybe you've got some inside dope on the case? Donovan suggested hopefully. No, only reason and intuition, but they— They won't go here, the other cut in. We can't put this girl in the prison ward without a warrant of some sort, de Grandin. It's against the rules, and as much as my job's worth to do it. There might be all sorts of legal complications, suits for false imprisonment and that sort of thing. 
But see here, she came fumbling at your door, mumbling all sorts of nonsense, and clearly out of her head, didn't she? The Frenchman nodded. All right, then. We'll say she was batty. Looney, balmy in the bean, as they say in classic Siamese. That'll give us an excuse for locking her up in H3, the psychopathic ward. We've got stronger bars on those windows than we have in the prison ward. Plenty of room there, too. No one but some souses sleeping off DTs and the effects of Prohibition whoopee. I'll move him over to make room for... By the way, what's your little playmate's name, anyhow? We do not know, returned de Grandin. She is une inconnue. Hell, I can't spell that, Donovan assured him. We'll have to write her down unknown, all right? Quite, the little Frenchman answered with a smile. And now you will receive her? Sure thing, the other promised. Hey, Jim, he hailed an orderly lounging in the corridor. Bring the agony cart. Got another customer for H3. She's unconscious. Okay, chief, the man responded, trundling forward a wheeled stretcher. Frightened, pitiful moans of voyagers in the borderland of horror sifted through the latticed doors of the cells facing the corridors of H-3 as we followed the stretcher down the hall. Here a gin-crazed woman sobbed and screamed in mortal terror at the phantoms of alcoholic delirium. There a sodden creature, barely eighteen but with the marks of acute nephritis already on her face, choked and regurgitated in the throes of deathly nausea. Three rousing cheers for the noble experiment, Dr. Donovan remarked, an ugly sneer gathering at the corners of his mouth. I wish to God those damn prohibitionists had to drink a few swigs of the kind of poison they've flooded the country with. If I had my way, Jesus! screamed a blear-eyed Irish woman whose cell we passed. Lord, have mercy on us, tis she! For a moment she clung to the wicket of her door like a monkey to the bars of its cage, staring horror-struck at the still form upon the stretcher. Take it easy, Annie, Donovan comforted. She won't hurt you. Won't hurt me, is it? The woman croaked. Won't harm me with the devil's sylph marching down the hall beside her. Can't you see the horns and tail and the flashing fiery eyes of him as he walks beside her, Dr. Darlin? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Bless and save us, Holy Mother. She signed herself with the cross and stared with horror-dazed, affrighted eyes at the girl on the litter till our pitiful procession turned the bend that shut us from her sight. 7. The Mutter of a Distant Drum It was a windy night of scudding clouds which had brought a further fall of snow, and our progress was considerably impeded as we drove home from the hospital. I was nearly numb with cold and on the verge of collapse with fatigue when we finally stabled the car and let ourselves in the back door. Now for that dose of brandy and bed, I promised myself as we crossed the kitchen. Yes, by blue, de Grandin agreed vigorously. You speak wisdom, my friend. Me, I shall be greatly pleased to join you in both. By the door of the consulting room I halted. Queer, I muttered. I'd have sworn we turned the lights off when we left, but shh! De Grandin's sibilant warning cut me short as he edged in front of me and drew the small but vicious automatic pistol, which he always carried, from its holster underneath his left armpit. Stand back, friend Trowbridge, for I, Jules de Grandin, will deal with them. He dashed the door wide open with a single well-directed kick, then dodged nimbly back, taking shelter behind the jam and leveling his pistol menacingly. Attention, hands up! I have you covered, he called sharply. From the examination table, where he had evidently been asleep, an undersized individual bounced rather than rose, landing cat-like on both feet and glaring ferociously at the door where de Grandin had taken cover. Assassin! he shouted, clenching his fists and advancing half a pace toward us. Morbleu, he has found us! de Grandin almost shrieked. It is the Apache, the murderer, the robber of defenseless little ones and women. Have a care, monster. He leaped into the zone of light shed by the desk lamp and brandished his pistol. Stand where you are, if you would go on living your most evil life. 
Disdainful of the pistol, as though it were a pointed finger, the other advanced, knees bent in an animal crouch, hands half closed, as though preparing for a death grip on de Grandin's throat. A single pace away, he halted and flung wide his arms. Embrasse moi! he cried, and in another moment they were locked together in a fond embrace, like sweethearts reunited after parting. Oh, Georges! Mon Georges, you are the curing sight for tired eyes. You are truly heaven sent, de Grandin cried, when he had in some measure regained his breath. Between the sight of your so unlovely face and fifty thousand francs placed in my hand, I should assuredly have chosen you, mon petit singe. To me, he added, Assuredly, you recall, Monsieur Renoir, friend Trowbridge, Georges Jean Jacques Joseph Marie Renoir, inspecteur du service de la Sûreté Générale. Of course, I answered, shaking hands with the visitor. Glad to see you again, Inspector. The little colonial administrator had been my guest some years before, and he, de Grandin, and I had shared a number of remarkable adventures. We were just about to take a drink, I added, and the caller's bright eyes lit up with appreciation. Won't you join us? Parbleu, Renoir assured me. I do most Dearly love your language, Monsieur Trowbridge, and most of all I love the words that you just said. Our liquor poured, we sat and faced each other, each waiting for the other to begin the conversation. At length, I called an hour or so ago, Renoir commenced, and was admitted by your so excellent maid. She said that you were out, but bade me wait, then off she went to bed. "'nor do I think that she did count the silver first. "'She knows me. "'Yes, bien alors. "'I waited and fell asleep while doing so.' "'I looked at him with interest. "'Though shorter by some inches than the average American, "'Renoir could not be properly called undersized. "'Rather, he was a giant in miniature. "'His very lack of height gave the impression of material equilibrium "'and tremendous physical force.' Instinctively, one felt that the thews of his arms were massive as those of a gladiator, and that his torso was sheathed in muscles like that of a professional wrestler. A mop of iron-gray hair was brushed back in an uprearing pompadour from his wide, low brow, and a curling white mustache adorned his upper lip, while from his chin depended a white beard cut square across the bottom in the style beloved of your true Frenchman. But most impressive of all was his cold, pale face, a face with the pallor of a statue, from which there burned a pair of big, deep-set eyes beneath circumflexes of intensely black and bushy brows. Eh bien, mon Georges? de Grandin asked. What storm-wind blows you hither? You were ever the fisher in troubled water. Renoir gulped down his brandy, stroked his moustache and tugged his beard, then drew forth a Russian leather case from which he extracted a Maryland cigarette. Women, parbleu, one sometimes wonders why the good God made them. He snapped an English lighter into flame and with painstaking precision set his puissant cigarette aglow then folded his big white hands demurely in his lap and glanced inquiringly at us with his bright dark eyes as though we held the answer to his riddle tiens my friend de grandin laughed had he not done so it is extremely probable that you and i would not be here indulging in this pleasant conversation but women bring you here and why renoir expelled a double stream of acrid smoke from his nostrils emitting a snort of annoyance at the same time. "'One hardly knows the words to tell it,' he replied. "'The trouble starts in Egypt, during the war and afterward until the end of martial law in 1923. Egypt, apart from the continental system of Maison de Tolerance, was outwardly at least as moral as London. But since the strong, clean hand of Britain has been loosed, there has been a constantly increasing influx of white slaves to the country. Today hardly a ship arrives in Alexandria without its quota of this human freight. The trade is old, as old as Nineveh and Tyre, and to suppress it altogether is a hopeless undertaking. But to regulate it, ah, that is something different. 
We were not greatly exercised when the numbers of unfortunate girls going from Marseille increased in Egypt, but when respectable young girls, may we girls of more than mere bourgeois respectability, even daughters of Le Beau Monde, were sucked beneath the surface, later to be boiled up as inmates of those infamous blue houses of the East, then we did begin to take sharp notice. They sent for me. Renoir, they said, investigate and tell us what is which. Très bon, I did commence. The dossiers of half a dozen girls I took, and from the ground upward I did build their cases. Name of a little blue man. He leaned forward, speaking a low, impressive tone scarce above a whisper. There was devilment, literally, I mean, my friends, in that business. By example, each one of these young girls was of an independent turn. She reveled in the new emancipation of her sex. Oh, but yes, so much she relished this new freedom that the ancient inhibitions were considered out of date. The good God, the gentle Christ child, the blessed mother, ah, bah, they were outmoded. She must follow after newer or older gods. Eh bien, exceedingly strange gods they were too. In Berlin, Paris, London, and New York, there is a sect which preaches for its gospel, Do what thou wilt, this shall be the whole of the law. And as the little boy who eats too many bonbons inevitably achieves a bellyache, so do the followers of this unbridled license reap destruction ultimately. But certainly, each one of these young girls I find she has enlisted in this strange new army of the freed. She has attended meetings where they made strange prayers to stranger gods. And eventually she ends a cast-off plaything, eaten with drugs and surfeited with life, in the little infamous blue houses of the East. Yes, I found them all. Some were dying, some were better dead. Some had still a little way to tread the dreary path of hell in life, but all, all my friends, were marked with this device upon their breasts. See, I have seen him so often I can draw him from memory. Taking a black oilcloth bound notebook from his pocket, he tore out a leaf and scribbled a design upon it. De Grandin and I stared at each other in blank amazement as he passed the sheet to us. "'Good Lord!' I ejaculated. "'It's exactly like précisément la même chose. It is the same that Mademoiselle of the Vale displayed,' de Grandin agreed. With shining eyes he turned to face Renoir. "'Proceed, my friend,' he begged. "'When you have done, we have a tale to tell.' "'Ah, but I am far from done,' the inspector replied. Bien, no. I did investigate some more, and I found much. I discovered, by example, that the society to which these most unhappy girls belonged was regularly organized, having grand and subordinate lodgers like Freemasons, with a central body in control of all. Moreover, I did find that at all times and all places where this strange sect met, there was a Russian in command, or very near the head. Does that mean anything to you? No? Very well, then. Consider this. Last year, the Union of the Militant Godless, financed by the Soviet government, closed 4,000 churches in Russia by direct action. Furthermore, still well supplied with funds, they succeeded in doing much missionary work abroad. They promoted all sorts of aesthetic societies, principally among young people. In America, on the one hand, they gave much help to such societies as the lost souls among college students, and on the other, they greatly aided fanatical religious sects which aim at the abolition of innocent amusement in the name of Christ. Associations for making the Sabbath day unpleasant by closing of the cinemas, the shops and all places of recreation, have received large grants of money from the known agents of this godless union. Moreover, we know for certain that much of the legislation fostered by these bodies has been directly proposed by Russian agents posing as staunch upholders of fundamental religion. You see, on the one side, atheism is promoted by the young, 
On the other, religion's own ministers are whipped on by flattery or outright bribery to do such things as will make the churches hateful to all liberal-minded people. The scheme is beautifully simple, and it has worked well. Again, in England only half a year ago, a clergyman was unfrocked for having baptized a dog, saying he would make it a good member of the established church. We looked this man's antecedents up and found that he was friendly with some Russians who posed as émigrés, refugees from the Bolshevik oppression. Now this man, who has no fortune and no visible means of support, is active every day in preaching radical atheism and in weaning his former parishioners from their faith. He lives and lives well. Who provides for him? One wonders. Defections in the clergy of all churches have been numerous of late, and in every instance one or more Russians are found on friendly terms with the apostate man of God. No, hear me a little further, he went on, as de Grandin was about to speak. The forces of disorder and of downright evil are dressing their ranks and massing their shock troops for attack. For in the east there is the mutter of a distant drum, and from the fastnesses of other lands the war drum's beat is answered. Consider. In the Congo there is renewed activity by the leopard men, those strange and diabolical societies whose members disguise themselves as leopards, then seek and kill their prey by night. The authorities are taking most repressive measures, but still the leopard societies flourish more than ever and the blacks are fast becoming unruly. There will be difficulties. In Paris, London and Berlin again and yet again, churches are despoiled of sacred plate and blessed vestments. The host is stolen from the altar, and every kind of sacrilege is done. A single instance of this sort of thing, or even several, might be coincidence. But when the outrages are perpetrated systematically, not once but scores of times, and always at about the same time, though in widely separated places. Coincidences become statistics. There can no longer be a doubt. The Black Mass is being celebrated regularly in all the greater cities of the world. Yet we do not think mere insult to God is all that is intended. No, there is some central, underlying motive for this sudden and widespread revival of Satanism. One wonders what. And here another puzzle rises. In Arabia, north of Iraq, in the Kurdish mountains, is the headquarters of a strange people called the Yazidis. About them we know little, save that they have served the devil as their god time out of mind. Had they been strong numerically, they would have been a problem, for they are brave and fierce, and much given to killing. But they are few in number, and their Muslim neighbors ring them round so thoroughly that they have been forced back upon themselves, and seldom do they trouble those who do not trouble them. But, he paused impressively, on Mount Lalesh, where their great temple stands, strange things have been brewing lately. What it is we do not clearly know but their members have been gathering from all parts of the East, from as far as Mongolia in some instances, to celebrate some sort of mystic ceremony. Not only that, but strangers, Europeans, Africans, white, black and yellow men, who have no business being there, have been observed en route to Kurdistan, like pilgrims journeying to Mecca. Less than a month ago, a party of brigands waylaid some travellers near Aleppo, our gendarmes rescued them. They were a party of Americans and Englishmen, with several Spaniards as well, and all were headed for Kurdistan and Mount Lalesh. Again, one wonders why. Our secret agents have been powerless to penetrate the mystery. We only know that many Russians have been sent to enter the forbidden city of the Yazidis, that the Yazidis, who once were poor, are now supplied with large amounts of ready cash, and that their bearing toward their neighbors has suddenly become arrogant. Wild rumors are circulated. There is talk of a revival of the cult of the assassins, who made life terrible for the crusaders and the Muslims alike. There are whispers of a prophetess to come from some strange land, 
a prophetess who will raise the standard of the devil and lead his followers against the crescent and cross. Just what it is, we do not surely know. But those of us who know the East can perceive that it means war. The signs are unmistakable. A revolution is fomenting. Some sort of unholy jihad will be declared, but where the blow will fall, or when, we cannot even guess. India? Indochina? Arabia? Perhaps in all at once. Who knows? London is preparing. So is Paris, and Madrid is massing troops in Africa. But who can fight a figure carved in smoke? We must know at whom to strike before we can take action, n'est-ce pas? But this much I can surely tell. One single man, a so mysterious man whose face I have not seen, but whose trail is marked as plainly as a snake's track in the dust, is always found at hand, where the strings of these far separated things are joined and knotted in a cord. He was a prime mover in the societies to which those wretched girls belonged. He was among those friendly with the unfrocked English clergyman. He was almost, but not quite, apprehended in connection with the rifling of the sanctuary of a church in Cologne. He has been seen in Kurdistan, across France, England, Arabia, and Egypt have I trailed him, always just a little bit too late. Now he is in America. Yes, Pablo, he is in this very city. Say too, I must find him. And finding him, I must achieve a method to destroy him. Even if I have to stoop to murder, the snake may wiggle, even though his head has been decapitated. But God knows, he can no longer bite when it is done. So do I. Jules de Grandin leaned across the desk and possessed himself of Renoir's cigarette case, extracting from it a vile-smelling Maryland, and lit it with a smile. I know the answers to your problems, or some of them at least, my friend, he asserted. This very night there came to us, to this very house, a deserter from the ranks of the accursed, and though she raved in wild delirium, she did let fall enough to tell us how to find this man you seek, and when we find him. The hard, cold light, which always reminded me of winter sunshine glinting on a frozen stream, came into his eyes, and his thin lips tightened in an ugly line. When we have found him, he continued, we shall know what to do. Name of an umbrella we damn shall. The piecemeal information which you have fits admirably with what we already know, and better yet with that which we suspect. Listen to me carefully. The sudden jangle of the telephone broke in. Dr. Trowbridge, called a deep bass voice as I snatched up the instrument and growled a gruff, Hello? Yes? Costello. Detective Sergeant Costello speaking. Can you and Dr. de Grandin be ready in five minutes to go with me? I'd not be after asking you to leave your bed so early if it weren't important, sir, but... That's all right, Sergeant. We haven't been to bed as yet, I told him. We're pretty well done in, but if this is important... Important, is it? Glory be to God, if the foulest murder that ever disgraced the state of New Jersey ain't important, then I can't think what is. Tis out to the convent of the Sacred Heart by Ropleyville, sir, and I'll take it kindly if you'll go along with me, sir. The poor ladies out there'll be needin' a doctor's services, I'm thinking, and St. Joseph knows I'm after needin' all the expert help that Dr. de Grandin can give me, too. All right. We'll be waiting for you, I replied, as I put the monophone back in its hooks and turned to notify de Gronda and Renoir of our engagement. 8. In hoc signo The querulous crescendo of a squad car's siren sounded outside our door almost as I finished speaking, and we trooped down the front steps to join the big Irish policeman and two other plainclothes officers occupying the tonneau of the department vehicle. Sure, Inspector Renoir. Costello greeted heartily as he shook hands. "'Tis glad I am to see you this morning. "'There's nothing to do in this case but work like the devil and trust in God, "'and the more of us there's here to do it, the better our chances are. "'Jump in, gentlemen.' "'To the uniformed chauffeur he ordered, "'Step on it, Casey.' "'Casey stepped. 
The powerful Cadillac leaped forward like a mettlesome horse beneath the flailings of a lash, and the cold, sharp air of early winter morning was whipped into our faces with breathtaking force as we sped along the deserted road at nearly eighty miles an hour. What is it? What has happened? De Gronda cupped his hands and shouted as we roared past the sleeping houses of the quiet suburb. Costello raised his gloved hand to his mouth, then shook his head. No voice was capable of bellowing above the screeching of the rushing wind. Almost before we realized it, we were drawn up before the tall greystone walls of the convent, and Costello was jerking vigorously at the bell-pull beside the gate. From headquarters, Mum, he announced tersely, touching his hat as the portress drew back the little wicket in the door and gazed at us inquiringly. Something more than ordinary silence seemed to brood above the big bare building as we followed our conductress down the clean-swept corridor to the public reception parlor. Rather, it seemed to me, the air was charged with a sort of concentrated, apprehensive emanation of sheer terror. Once, when professional obligations required my attendance at an execution— I had felt some such eerie sensation of concentrated horror and anticipation, as the other witnesses and I sat mute within the execution chamber, staring alternately with fright-filled eyes at the grim electric chair and the narrow door through which we knew the condemned man would soon emerge. As we reached the reception room and seated ourselves on the hard, uncomfortable chairs, I suddenly realized the cause of the curiously anxious feeling which possessed me. From every quarter of the building, seemingly from floors and walls and ceilings, there came the almost mute but still perceptible soft sibilation of a whispered chorus. Whisper, whisper, whisper. The faint half-audible susurration persisted without halt or break, endless and untiring as the lisping of the tide upon the sands. It worried me. It beat upon my ears like water wearing on a stone. Unless it stopped, I told myself, I would surely shout aloud with all my might for no other reason than to drown its everlasting monotonous reiteration. The tap of light-soled shoes and the gentle rustle of a skirt brought relief from the oppressive monotone, and the mother superior of the nunnery stood before us. Costello bowed with awkward grace as he stepped forward. De Gronda and Renoir were frigidly polite in salutation. For Frenchmen, especially those connected with official life, have not forgotten the rift between the orders and the government of France, existing since the disestablishment of 1903. We're from headquarters, mother, Costello introduced. We came as quickly as we could. Where is it? She, uh, the body, if you please. Mother Mary Margaret regarded him with eyes which seemed to have wept so much that not a tear was left and her firm lips trembled as she answered. In the garden, officer. It's irregular for men to enter there, but this is an emergency to which the rules must yield. The portress was making her rounds a little before matins when she heard somebody moving in the garden and looked out. No one was visible, but something looked strange to her, so she went out to investigate. She came to me at once, and I called your office on the phone immediately. Then we rang the bell and summoned all the sisters to the chapel. I told them what I thought they ought to know, and then dismissed them. They're in their cells now, reciting the rosary for the repose of her soul. Costello nodded shortly and turned to us, his hard-shaven chin set truculently. Come on, gentlemen, let's get going, he told us. Will you lead us to the gate? He added to the mother superior. The convent gardens stretched across a plot of level ground for several hundred feet behind the building. Tall evergreens were marshaled in twin rows about its borders, and neatly trimmed privet hedges marked its graveled paths. At the far end, by a wall of ivy-covered masonry some twelve feet high, was placed a calvary, a crucifix, nine or ten feet high set in a cairn, which overlooked the whole enclosure. It was toward this Costello led us, his blue-black jaw set bellicosely. 
De Grandin swore savagely in mingled French and English as the light, powdery snow rose above the tops of his patent leather evening pumps and chilled his silk-shod feet. Renoir looked round with quick, appraising glances. I watched Costello's face, noting how the savage scowl deepened as he walked. I think we recognized it simultaneously. Renoir gave a short half-scream, half-groan. Sacré nom de sacré nom de sacré nom, de Grandin swore. Jesus, said Costello. I felt a sinking in the middle of my stomach, and had to grasp Costello's arm to keep from falling with the sudden vertigo of overpowering nausea. The lifeless figure on the crucifix was not a thing of plaster or of painted wood. It was human, flesh and blood. Nailed fast with railway spikes through outstretched hands and slim crossed feet, she hung upon the cross, her slender naked body white as carven ivory. Her head inclined toward her left shoulder, and her long black hair hung loosed across the full white breasts which were drawn up firmly by the outspread arms. Upon her head had been rudely thrust an improvised crown of thorns, a chaplet of barbed wire cut from some farmer's fence, and from the punctures that it made, small streams of coral drops ran down. Thin trickles of blood oozed from the torn wounds in her hands and feet, but these had frozen on the flesh, heightening the resemblance to a tinted simulacrum. Her mouth was slightly opened, and her chin hung low upon her breast, and from the tongue which lay against her lower lip, a single drop of ruby blood, congealed by cold even as it fell, was pendant like a ruddy jewel against the flesh. Upon her chest, above her breasts, glowed the tattooed mark which we had seen when she appealed to us for help a scant four hours earlier. Above the lovely, thorn-crowned head, where the replica of Pontius Pilate's inscription had been set, Another legend was displayed, an insulting, mocking challenge from the murderers. In hoc signo, in this sign, and then a grim, derisive picture of a leering devil's face. Ah, la pauvre, de Grandin murmured. Poor mademoiselle of the Vale, were not all the bars and bolts of the hospital enough to keep you from them after all? I should have stayed with you. Then they would not. He broke off, staring meditatively at the figure racked upon the cross, his little round blue eyes hardening as water hardens with a sudden frost. Renoir tugged at his square-cut beard, and tears welled unashamed in his bright, dark eyes. Costello looked a moment at the pendant figure on the crucifix, then, doffing his hat, fell to his knees, signed himself reverently, and began a hasty mumbled prayer for the dying. De Grandin neither wept nor prayed, but his little eyes were hard and cold, as eyes of polished agate inlaid in the sockets of a statue's face, and round his small and thin-lipped mouth, beneath the pointed tips of his trim waxed moustache. There gathered such a snarling grin of murderous hate as I had never seen. Hear me, my friends, he ordered. Hear me, you who hang so dead and lovely on the cross. Hear me, all ye that dwell in heaven with the blessed saints. And in his eyes and on his face was the terrifying look of the born killer. When I have found the one who did this thing, it had been better far for him had he been stillborn, for I shall surely give him that which he deserves. Yes, though he take refuge underneath the very throne of God himself, I swear it upon this. He laid his hand against the nail-pierced feet of the dead girl as one who takes a ritual oath upon a sacred relic. It was grisly business getting her from the cross, but at last the spikes were drawn and the task completed. While Costello and Renoir examined every inch of trodden snow about the violated Calvary, de Grandin and I bore the body to the convent mortuary chapel, composed the stiffened limbs as best we could, then notified the coroner. 
This must by no means reach the press, monsieur, de Grandin told the coroner when he arrived. Promise you will keep it secret, at least until I give the word. Hmm, I can't do that very well, coroner Martin demurred. There's the inquest, you know. It's my sworn duty to hold one. Ah, but yes. But if I tell you that our chances of capturing the miscreants who have done this thing depend upon our secrecy, then you will surely withhold publicity. De Grandin persisted. Can you not, by example, summon your jury, show them the body, swear them in, and then adjourn the public hearing pending further evidence? Mr. Martin lowered his handsome grey head in silent thought. You'll testify the cause of death was shock and exposure to the cold? he asked at length. Name of a small asparagus tree. I will testify to anything, answered Jules de Grandin. Very well, then. We'll hush the matter up. I won't call Mother Mary Margaret at all, and Costello can tell us merely that he found her, nude, in the convent garden. Just how he found her is a thing we'll not investigate too closely. She disappeared from City Hospital psychopathic ward— the inference is she wandered off and died of exposure. It will be quite feasible to keep the jury from seeing the wounds in her hands and feet. I'll hold the official viewing in one of the reposing rooms of my funeral home, and have the body covered with a robe from the neck down. How's that? Monsieur. De Grandin drew himself up stiffly and raised his hand in formal military salute. Permit me to inform you that you are a great man. Allons. Speed, quickness, hurry, we must go, he ordered, when the pitiful body had been taken away, and Costello and Renoir returned from their inspection of the garden. Where are we rushing to now, sir? the big detective said. To City Hospital, pardieu. I would know exactly how it comes that one whose custody was given to that institution last night should thus be taken from her bed beneath their very noses, and murderously done to death in this so foul manner. Say, de Grandin, was that gal you and Trowbridge brought here last night any kin to the late Harry Houdini? Dr. Donovan greeted as we entered his office at City Hospital. De Grandin favored him with a long, hard stare. What is it that you ask? he demanded. Was she a professional disappearing artist or something of the kind? We saw her locked up so tight that five men and ten little boys couldn't have got her out. But she's gone. "'Skipped, flown the coop, and not a soul saw her when she blew, either. "'Perfectly. We are well aware she is no longer with you,' de Grandin answered. "'The question is, how comes it that you, who were especially warned to watch her carefully, permitted her to go?' Huh. "'I wish I knew the answer to that one myself,' Donovan returned. I turned in a few minutes after you and Trowbridge went, and didn't hear anything further till an hour or so ago, when Dawkins, the night orderly in H-3, came pounding on my door with some wild story of her being gone. I threw a shoe at him and told him to get the devil away and let me sleep, but he kept after me till I finally got up in self-defense. Darned if he wasn't right, too. Her room was empty as a bass drum, and she was nowhere to be found, though we searched the ward with a fine-tooth comb. No one had seen her go. At least no one will admit it, though I think someone's doing a piece of monumental lying. Hmm? De Grandin murmured noncommittally. Suppose we go and see. The orderly, Dawkins, and Miss Hoskins, the night supervisor of the ward, met us as we passed the barred door. No, sir, the man replied to De Grandin's quick questions. I didn't hear a seat. Gee whiz, I, I wonder if that could have had anything to do with it. No, of course it couldn't. Eh? De Grandin returned sharply. Tell us the facts, monsieur. We shall draw our own conclusions, if you please. Well, sir, the man grinned sheepishly. It was somewhere about five o'clock, possibly a bit later, and I was sort of nodding in my chair down by the lower end of the corridor, when all of a sudden I heard a funny sounding kind of noise, sort of like a high wind blowing, or, let's see, well, you might compare it to the hum of a monster bee. Only it was more of a whistle than a buzz, though there was a sort of buzzing sound to it, too. Well, as I was saying, I'd been nodding, and this sudden queer noise woke me up. I started to get up and see what it was all about, but it didn't come again. So, 
I just sat back and... And went to sleep, eh? Donovan cut in. I thought you'd been lying, you swine. Fine chance we have of keeping these nuts in, with you orderlies snoring all over the place. Monsieur Donovan, if you please. Renoir broke in with lifted hand. To Dawkins. You say this was a high, shrill sound, mon vieux. Very high and very shrill. Yes, sir, it was. Not real loud, sir, but so awful shrill it hurt my ears to listen to it. It seemed almost as though it made me sort of unconscious, though I don't suppose... Tiens, but I do, Renoir broke in. I think I understand. Turning to us, he added seriously, I have heard of him. Our agents in Kurdistan described him. It is a sound, a very high shrill sound, produced by blowing on some sort of reed by those followers of Satan from Mount Lalesh. He who hears it becomes first deafened, then temporarily paralyzed. According to our agent's testimony, it is a refinement of the wailing of the Chinese screaming boys, that high, thin, piercing wail which so disorganizes the hearer's nervous system that his marksmanship is impaired, and often he is rendered all but helpless in a fight. De Grandin nodded. We know, my friend, he agreed. The night Mademoiselle Alice disappeared, we heard him, friend Trowbridge and I, but that time they used their devil dust as well to make assurance doubly sure. It is possible that their store of bull a is low, or completely exhausted, and so they now rely upon the stupefying sound to help them at their work. Mademoiselle, he bowed to Miss Hoskins, did you too by any chance hear the strange sound? I, uh, I can't say I did. The nurse answered with embarrassment. The fact is, sir, I was very tired, too, and was rather relying on Dawkins being awake to call me if anything were needed, so... She paused, a flush suffusing her face. Quite so, de Grandin nodded. But... But I did wake up with a dreadful headache, almost as though something sharp had been thrust in my ears, just before Dawkins reported that the patient in 47 was missing she added. Again, de Grandin nodded. I fear there is nothing more to learn, he returned wearily. Come, let us go. Doctor! Doctor Darlin, they was here last night like I told you they'd be! The drunken Irish woman called to Donovan as we went past her door. Now, Annie, Donovan advised, you just lie back and take it easy, and we'll have you in shape to go out and get soused again in a couple of days. Annie the devil, my name's Bridget O'Shea, and you will know it. Bad cess to you, the woman stormed. And as for sleeping in this place again, I'd sooner sleep in hell, for tis haunted be the devil's houses. Last night, doctor, I heard the banshee keening outside me windy, and Bridget O'Shea says I to myself, the fairy wife's come for you and I lays down on the floor, with both fingers in my ears, to stop the sound of her calling. But presently there comes a throop of devils marching up the corridor, the one in front of playing on some sort of devil's pipes, which I couldn't hear at all, at all, for having my fingers stuck in my ears, and walking close to behind him. There was two other ones, and they always walk in like they knew where they was going. I watched them, till they turned to the bend, and then I took my finger from one ear, but quick enough I stuffed it back, for there was the horribly screaming noise in all the place, as would have deafened me entirely if I hadn't stopped my ears again. Presently they come again, the foremost one still playing on his pipes a hill, and one of them carrying something crossed his shoulders all wrapped up in a blanket, whilst t'other was a-looking round from right to left, and his eyes was like peat fires, burning in a cave, sir, so they was. I ducked me head as he went past, for well I know they'd murder me if I was seen, and I know what it was too. Twas Satan on earth, come for that woman you brung in here last night, and well I know she'll not be seen again. Gosh, that was some case of Jim Jams you had last night, Donovan laughed. Better see Father O'Connell and take the pledge again, Annie or they'll be putting you in the bug house for keeps one of these days. It's true, the girl's wandered off, but we don't think anything has happened to her. 
We don't know where she is, even. Eh bien, my friend, de Grandin contradicted as we left the psychopathic ward. You are most badly mistaken. We know quite definitely where the poor one is. Huh? The devil? Donovan returned. Where is she? Upon a slab in Coroner Martin's morgue. For Pete's sake. Tell me about it. How did it happen? I'm interested. The papers will contain a story of her death. De Grandin answered as he suppressed a yawn. I, too, am greatly interested. In five eggs with ham to match, ten cups of coffee, and twelve hours' sleep. Adieu, monsieur. 9. Thoughts in the Dark I was too near the boundary line of exhaustion to do more than dally with the excellent breakfast which Nora McGuinness, my super-efficient household factotum, set before us. But Renoir, with the hardihood of an old campaigner, wolfed huge portions of cereal, fried sausages and eggs, and hot-buttered toast, washing them down with innumerable cups of well-creamed coffee, while de Grandin, ever ready to eat, drink, or seek adventure, stowed away an amazing cargo of food. Très bon. Now let us sleep, he suggested, when the last evidence of food had vanished from the table. Pablo, me, I could sleep for thirty days unceasingly, and as for food, the thought of it disgusts me. Madame Nora, he raised his voice and turned toward the kitchen. "'Would it be too much to ask that you have roast duckling and apple tart for dinner, "'and that you serve it not later than five this evening? "'We have much to do, and we should prefer not to do it on an empty stomach.' "'No office hours today, Nora,' I advised as I rose, swaying with sleepiness. "'And no telephone calls for any of us either. "'Please tell anyone who cannot wait to get in touch with Dr. Phillips.' "'How long I slept, I do not know.' but the early dark of midwinter evening had fallen when I sat suddenly bolt upright in my bed, my nerves still vibrating like telephone wires in a heavy wind. Gradually, insistently, insidiously, a voice had seemed commanding me to rise, don my clothes, and leave the house. Where I should go was not explained, but that I go at once was so insistently commanded that I half rose from the bed, reluctance, fear, and something close akin to horror dragging me back, but that not-to-be-ignored command impelling my obedience. Then, while I wrestled with the power which seemed dominating me, a sudden memory broke into my dream, a memory of other dreams of long ago, when I woke trembling in the darkened nursery, crying out in fright, then the stalwart bulk of a big body bending over me, hands firm yet tender, patting my cheek reassuringly, and the mingled comforting smell of starched linen, Russian leather and good tobacco coming through the darkness, while my father's soothing voice bade me not to be afraid, for he was with me. The second dream dispelled the first, but I was still a-tremble with the tension of the summons to arise when I struggled back to consciousness and looked about the room. Half an hour later— Bathed, shaved, and much refreshed, I faced de Grandin and Renoir across the dinner-table. Par l'amour d'un bouc, my friends, de Grandin told us. This afternoon has been most trying. Me, I have dreamed most unpleasant dreams, dreams which I do not like at all, and which I hope will not soon be repeated. Comment cela? Renoir inquired. By blue, I dreamed that I received direct command to rise and dress and leave the house, and what is more, I should have done so had I not awakened. Great Scott, I interjected. So did I. Eh, is it so? Renoir regarded each of us in turn with bright, dark eyes, shrewd and knowing as a monkey's. This is of interest, he declared, tugging at his square-cut beard. From what we know, it would seem that the societies to which the unfortunate young ladies who first did bring me in this case are mixed in some mysterious manner with the Yezidis of Kurdistan, n'est-ce pas? De Grandin nodded, watching him attentively. Very well, then. 
As I told you heretofore, I do not know those Yezidis intimately. My information concerning them is hearsay, but it comes from sources of the greatest accuracy. Yes. Now, I am told, stretching over Asia, beginning in Manchuria, and leading thence across Tibet, westward into Persia, and finally clear to Kurdistan, there is a chain of seven towered temples of the Yezidis, erected to the glorifying of the devil. The chiefest of these shrines stands upon Mount Lalesh, but the others are, as the electricians say, hooked up in series. No, underneath the domes of each one of these temples there sits at all times a priest of Satan, perpetually sending off his thought rays, his mental emanations. Oh, do not laugh, my friends, I beg, for it is so. As priests or nuns profess to the service of God, offer up perpetual adoration and prayers of intercession, so do these servants of the arch-fiend continually give forth the praise and prayer of evil. Unceasingly they broadcast wicked influences, and while I would not go so far as to assert that they can sway humanity to sin, some things I know. I said I did not know the Yazidis, but that is only partly so. Of them I have heard much, and some things connected with them I have seen. For instance, when I was in Damascus, seeking out some answer to the riddle of the six women, I met a certain Muslim who had gone to Kurdistan, and while there incurred the enmity of the Yazidi priests. What he had done was not entirely clear, although... I think that he had in some way profaned their idols. However that may be, Damascus is a long and tiresome journey from the confines of Lalesh, where Satan's followers hold their sway, but attend me. He leaned forward till the candlelight struck odd reflections from his deep-set eyes. This man came to me one day and said he had received command to go out into the desert. Whence the command came he did not know. But in the night he dreamed, and every night thereafter he had dreamed, always the same thing, that he arise and go into the desert. Was it a voice commanding? I did ask. And no, he said, it was rather like a sound unheard, but felt, like that strange ringing in his ears we sometimes have when we have taken too much quinine for the fever. I sent him to a doctor, and the learned medical fool gave him some pills and told him to forget it. <laughs> forget that never-ending order to arise and leave, which ate into his brain as a maggot eats in cheese. As well he might have told one burning in the fire to dismiss all thought of torment from his mind. There finally came a time when the poor fellow could no longer battle with the psychic promptings of the priests of Satan. One night he left the house and wandered off. Some few days later the desert patrol found his burnous and boots, or what was left of them. The jackals, perhaps with the aid of desert bandits, had disposed of all the rest. Now we tread close upon these evildoers' heels. I have followed them across the ocean. You, my Jules, and you, Monsieur Trowbridge, have stumbled on their path, and all of us would bring them to account for their misdoings. What then? What indeed, but that one of them, who is an adept at the black magic of their craft, has thrown himself into a state of concentration and sent forth dire commands to us, such subtle silent orders as the serpent gives the fascinated bird. You, my Jules, have it. So have you, Monsieur Trowbridge, for both of you are somewhat psychic. Me, I am the hard, tough-headed old policeman. Practical. "'seeing little further than my own nose, "'and then seeing only what I do behold no more. "'Their thought commands, which are a species of hypnotism, "'will probably not reach me, "'or if they do will not affect my conduct. "'Your greatest danger is while you sleep, "'for then it is the sentry of your conscious mind "'will cease to go his guardian rounds, "'and the gateway to your inner consciousness will be wide open.' I therefore think it wise that we shall share one room hereafter. Renoir is watchful. Long years of practicing to sleep with one hand on his weapon and one eye open for attack have schooled him for such work. You cannot move without my knowing, and when I hear you move I wake you. 
and when I wake you, their chain is broken. Do you agree? The thought occurred to Jules de Grandin and me at once. Alice, I began, and, Yes, parbleu, Mademoiselle Alice, cried de Grandin. That message which she had, that constant but not understood command, Alice, come home. It was undoubtedly so given her. Remember a day or so before she first received a spy of theirs, pretending to be seeking curios for some collector, came to the house and saw the marriage girdle of the Yazidis. That was what he wanted, to assure himself that the Alice whom their spies had run to earth was indeed the one they sought, the descendant of that high priest's daughter of the ancient days, she who had run off with the Christian Englishman. Yes! Par la barbe d'un chat, no wonder that she could write nothing else upon her Ouija board that day. No wonder she puzzled why she had that thought impression of command to go. Already they had planted in her mind the order to abandon home and love and God and to join herself to their unholy ranks. By blue, my Georges, you have solved two problems for us. It was you who told us of the meaning of that shrilling cry which friend Trowbridge and I did hear the night on which she disappeared and which made the hospital attachés unable to repel invasion of their ward. Now you have thrown more light upon the subject, and we know that it was Mademoiselle Alice had that thought command to leave before she could suspect that such things were. I think it would be wise if we consulted. Detective Sergeant Costello, Nora McInnes announced from the dining-room door. Ah, my friend, come in, de Grandin cried. You're in time to share a new discovery we have made. Costello had no answering smile for the little Frenchman's greeting. His eyes were set in something like a stare of horror, and his big, hard-shaven chin trembled slightly as he answered. "'And you're in time to share a discovery with me, sir, if you'll be good enough to step into the surgery a moment.' Agog with interest, we followed him into the surgery— watched him extract a paper parcel from his overcoat pocket and tear off the outer wrappings, disclosing a packet of oiled silk beneath. "'What is it? What have you found?' de Grandin questioned eagerly. "'This,' the Irishman returned. "'Look here!' He tore the silken folds apart and dumped their contents on the instrument table. A pair of little hands— crudely severed at the wrists, lay on the table's porcelain top. Jules de Grandin, The Pillar of Weird Tales, by Daryl Schweitzer For someone who played such an important role in the magazine's heyday, there is surprisingly little information about Seabury Quinn and his behind-the-scenes relationship with Weird Tales. Author and pulp magazine contributor E. Hoffman Price, among the memoirs in his Book of the Dead, Arkham House, 2001, profiles Quinn, but doesn't say much about him in connection to Weird Tales. Price also profiles W.T. editor Farnsworth Wright, but doesn't mention Quinn. Price could be an insightful biographer, and he esteemed both men highly, but given that Price regarded pulp writing as purely a trade, something done for the money, the same as carpentry or bricklaying, it isn't surprising that he skimps on the working details, which to him were unimportant. It is clear enough that Quinn, who lived in Brooklyn until mid-1937, when he lost his job as editor of the mortician's journal Casket and Sunnyside, and moved to Washington, D.C., was not a member of Wright's social circle. The Weird Tales office was in Chicago, so Quinn could hardly have been one of the varnished vultures, an informal club of writers, editors, and artists associated with the magazine who regularly met in Wright's apartment. Price was a member, or someone who stopped by on occasion to help read manuscripts. To my knowledge, Wright and Quinn never met. At least I've yet to find someone who can confirm they did. We do know that Quinn met H. P. Lovecraft on several occasions when Lovecraft was visiting New York. Lovecraft thought well of him, but not of his work, and it is not hard to find comments about him in the various volumes of Lovecraft's letters. For example, H. P. L. wrote the following to author J. Vernon Shea on July 30, 1931. 
I met Quinn twice during my stay in New York and find him exceedingly intelligent and likable. He is forty-four years old, but looks rather less than that, increasingly stocky, dark, with a closely clipped mustache. He is, first of all, a shrewd businessman, and freely affirms that he manufactures hokum to order for market demands. In contrast to the artist, who seeks sincere expression as the result of an obscure inward necessity. This was not the only time Lovecraft spoke poorly of Quinn's contributions to the magazine. To author Robert Bloch he wrote, in mid-November 1934, that De Grandin is merely a puppet molded according to cheap popular demand. He represents nothing of Quinn. To writer Natalie H. Woodley on November 22, 1934, he bemoaned the devolution of various writers, including Quinn, Price, Edmund Hamilton, A. Merritt, and many others, who succumbed to the insidious cheapness of the pulp magazine tradition, so that they lost their status as sincere writers and came across as mere herd caterers. And again to Block on May 9, 1934, he said, Quinn also has frankly sold his soul to mammon, but he could turn out magnificent stuff if he would, and so on in a similar vein. There is no need to quote any more. Since we tend to view the entire Weird Tales scene through a Lovecraftian lens, it has become perceived wisdom over the years that Quinn was a disinterested craftsman who just typed out his stories and sent them in, and Farnsworth Wright bought them like yard goods. No interaction, just pure business. What's wrong with this picture is that it is not entirely true. It is not even mostly true. Fortunately, we do get a glimpse from Quinn's point of view in a series of letters he wrote to the artist Virgil Finley between January and October of 1937. This correspondence takes up 32 pages in Fantasy Collector's Annual, 1975, edited and published by Jerry de la Rey. The personality revealed in the letters is not quite what we'd expect from the dignified figure we see in the few surviving photos of Quinn. He is informal, slangy, maybe even a little pushy. He uses words like feller and signs himself with his initials, always drawing little smiley faces inside the queue. He also has a fairly large ego. The correspondence is prefaced with a letter from Quinn to Farnsworth Wright, in which he extols the virtues of the Globe of Memories, one of his first non-de Grandin stories during the period in which he took a brief vacation from the mercurial Frenchman's adventures, in no uncertain terms. Dear Wright, Ambrose Bierce might have written the Globe of Memories, but he didn't. I did. He then asks that Finley be allowed to illustrate it at which point his correspondence with Finley ensues. The letters are full of revelations, about Quinn, Weird Tales, and de Gronda. For all Quinn claims, because of my inability to visualize my characters as pictures, I don't really know what de Gronda looks like. He most definitely does know, and later includes a drawing that looks like it was cut from a comic strip to specify exactly what his hero looks like, down to the right kind of mustache. Needle, not fishhook. In fact, Finley eventually found Quinn a little irritating and a micromanager. Sometimes Quinn says that Finley should follow his own imagination, but at other times he is specifying how many people are in a scene, in what poses, with what costumes, etc. What is very clear from these letters from the author is that de Gronda is more than the puppet Lovecraft supposed, caring quite a bit for how his characters were portrayed. Of course, Quinn did make a substantial amount of money from the adventures of de Gronda and Trowbridge. For that reason, if no other, I should be fond of them, he writes. But my liking goes deeper. I really regard them as personal friends, and it's sometimes a shock to me to realize that there is no Harrisonville, New Jersey, no Dr. Samuel Trowbridge, no Jules de Gronda. That doesn't sound like a mere hack writer, does it? Quinn was very pleased with the portraits of de Gronda and Trowbridge that Finley produced, which were used as a standard feature for most of the pair's later appearances in Weird Tales. He also acquired some of Finley's cover paintings and decorated his office with them. These he received from Wright as gifts, since in those days pulp artists sold their work to publishers outright, 
never imagining it would have any resale value. We learn some other intriguing details. While there is no evidence that Wright ever asked for revisions or worked with Quinn on the content of the de Grandin stories very much, we do learn that Frozen Beauty was originally entitled The Snow Queen, presumably as an allusion to the fairy tale. Wright changed that. He thought it was too highbrow. In one of the earlier letters, Quinn expresses more than passing interest in weird tales itself, repeating to Finley in detail what he must have previously written to Wright. He wanted to redesign the magazine entirely, transforming it into a quality digest on semi-glossy paper like Coronet or Reader's Digest, which would appeal to a more general audience. He had very exact ideas about what kinds of art should be used, how they should be placed, etc., there's no record of how Wright responded, but in any case most of Quinn's suggestions came to nothing. Weird Tales remained a pulp, its appearance, largely thanks to Finley, steadily improving in the late thirties, but another of Quinn's ideas did come to fruition. It was he who suggested to Wright that Finley should be given a full page each issue to illustrate a scene or image from famous fantastic or weird poems. Finley's poetry page soon became one of the most popular features in Weird Tales. Of course, one of the reasons Weird Tales never transcended the pulp category was lack of money. Quinn was fully aware of the privations the magazine had suffered in the depths of the Depression. It was, he explained to Finley, who was younger and had not been involved with the magazine at the time, a minor miracle that Wright and his associates were able to keep Weird Tales going at all. How Weird Tales survived this crisis is a particularly dramatic story, which Quinn didn't tell Finley. The details were only discovered recently and described in an essay by scholar Scott Connors, Weird Tales and the Great Depression, which was published in the Robert E. Howard Reader, an anthology I edited in 2010. It seems that, in order to pay printing bills as the magazine was struggling to establish itself, Publisher J.C. Henneberger sold the majority interest in Weird Tales to the printer, one B. Cornelius. The understanding was that once the magazine became profitable, Cornelius would be repaid and he would return the stock to Henneberger. Then the Depression hit. But believing the claims of then-President Herbert Hoover that prosperity was just around the corner, Henneberger and his editor, Farnsworth Wright, instead decided to double down launching a companion magazine, Oriental Stories, with its first issue dated October-November 1930. Customarily, distributors held back payments for three issues of a magazine, and so they wouldn't pay for any sales of Oriental Stories until a fourth issue was delivered. Until that fourth issue, Weird Tales would have to earn enough to support both itself and Oriental. Cornelius, the printer who had been sold a majority interest in Weird Tales, had been patient. Depression-era pulp printers often had to run on credit, because otherwise they might have nothing to print and not even the promise of income, and would have to let their employees go. But enough was enough, and sometime in late 1931, Cornelius ordered Henneberger and Wright to shut Weird Tales down. That could very well have been the end of the magazine, except that Wright was able to convince Cornelius that he had in inventory two serials strong enough to save the magazine. One was Tam, Son of Tiger, an imitation Tarzan novel by Otis Adelbert Klein, which in theory could draw some buyers away from Argosy, where that sort of thing usually happened. The other was The Devil's Bride by Seabury Quinn, easily the longest Jules de Grandin story ever written which was ultimately stretched out over six issues, February to July 1932. In Quinn's story was something reliably popular enough to keep weird tales going, and it eventually did make it through, if only barely, to the other side of the Great Depression. When you consider that Robert E. Howard still had his best weird tales material in front of him, the first Conan story, The Phoenix on the Sword, appeared in the December 1932 issue, and that all of the Weird Tales' work of C. L. Moore, Robert Block, and many others was yet to come, it is worth pausing to reflect on how much fantastic literature owes to Seabury Quinn's excitable Frenchman. The Devil's Bride is, of course, quintessential pulp fiction, 
Here Quinn pulls out all the stops. Yet another imperiled society girl, a standby in the De Grandin series, is kidnapped at her wedding rehearsal by a truly fiendish cult of Yezidis, Satanists, Communists, and who knows what else. There ensue gory murders, a raid on a black mass, and at the climax, a police and army raid on an even larger cult orgy in West Africa, which is conducted with such violence that it makes Inspector Lagrasse's adventure in the Louisiana swamp from Lovecraft's The Call of Cthulhu look like the issuance of a parking ticket. Don't forget the family curse. The girl in question is the descendant of a Yazidi promised to Satan. A family heirloom, a bridal girdle, is partially composed of human skin. Various young ladies end up unclad throughout the course of the story. Quinn certainly knew how to get his tales featured on the covers of Weird Tales, which in this period almost always featured nudes. What more could any pulp reader want? The Devil's Bride is lurid as all get out, containing weird cultism, thrilling action, kidnappings, escapes, a sinister wolf master, a naked lady found crucified in a convent garden, jungle adventure, massive slaughter, just about everything short of dinosaurs and a giant ape. There is also more characterization than usual. If we are to be in the company of Jules de Grandin for six issues, we must inevitably learn more about him, including the surprising tale of the lost love of his youth. It might not have been literature, but it was certainly what kept the customers coming back month after month. The Devil's Bride was an important expansion of the character's universe for readers, as well as a well-timed financial life-preserver for the magazine. The Jules de Grandin series in general was unquestionably one of the major pillars of weird tales, and new tales of the Frenchman appeared so frequently that he very much helped to define what weird tales was. Sibari Quinn was, of course, a professional writer. He did this for a living, particularly after he lost his casket and sunny side gig. Times were hard. We know that after the worst of the Depression, he, along with many other writers, took a pay cut and was sometimes paid late. He explained to Finley in 1937 that he was no longer enjoying the luxurious rates he had in 1928. He wrote for other magazines, too. Detective stories, jungle stories a few historicals for Golden Fleece in the late thirties, but it's clear that for Quinn, Weird Tales and Jules de Grandin were something special. They still are. That is why you are listening to this volume. This isn't throwaway writing. It has survived. 10. Wordless Answers De Grandin was the first to recover from the shock. The double background of long practice as a surgeon and years of service with the secret police had inured him to such sights as would break the nerve of one merely a doctor or policeman. Added to this was an insatiable curiosity which drove him to examine everything he saw, be it beautiful or hideous, with a touch as delicate as though he had been handling some frail work of woven glass, he took one of the little hands between his thumb and forefinger, held it up to the surgery light, and gazed at it with narrowed eyes and faintly pursed lips. Looking at him, one would have said he was about to whistle. A child's, I asked, shrinking from too close examination of the ghastly relic. A girl's, he answered thoughtfully. Young, scarcely more than an adolescent, I should say, and probably not well to do, though having inclination toward the niceties of life. Observe the nails. He turned the small hand over and presented it palm downward for my scrutiny. You will observe, he added, that they are nicely varnished and cut and filed to a point, though the shaping is not uniform, which tells us that the treatment was self-done, and not the work of a professional manicurist. Again, they are most scrupulously clean, which is an indication of the owner's character. But the cuticle is inexpertly trimmed, another proof of self-attention. Finally, he turned the hand palm up and tapped the balls of the fingers lightly. 
Though the digits are white and clean, they are slightly calloused at the sides and the fingertips, and the nail region are inlaid with the faintest lines of ineradicable soil. Occupational discoloration, which no amount of soap and scrubbing brush will quite remove. Only acid bleacher or pumice stone would erase them. And these she either did not know of, or realized that their continued use would irritate the friction skin. Enfin, we have here the very pretty hands of a young working girl, possessing wholesome self-respect, but forced to earn her daily bread by daily toil. A factory operative, possibly. Surely not a laundress or charwoman. There is too much work soil for the first, too little for the second. Again he held the hand up to the light. I am convinced that this was severed while she was alive, he declared. See, it is practically free of blood. Had death occurred some time before the severance, the blood would not have been sufficiently liquid to drain off. Though the operation might have been made a short time after death, he added thoughtfully. Have you anything to add, my friend? he asked Costello. No, sir. All we know is we found the hands. The Irishman replied. They was found laying side by side, with the fingers touching like they might have been clasped in prayer, but had fallen apart like, just outside the wall, a convent garden, sir. Nom d'un miracle du bon Dieu, exclaimed de Grandin, with that near blasphemous intimacy he affected for the deity. I had some other things in mind tonight, but this must take precedence. Come, let us go, rush, hasten, fly to where you found them. Then lay our course from there until she shall be found. The convent of the Sacred Heart stood on an elevation from which it overlooked surrounding territory, and in the hollow to the east lay the little settlement of Rupleyville, a neat but unpretentious place comprised for the most part of homes of thrifty Italians who had been graduated from section gangs upon the Lackawanna's right-of-way to small truck farming, huckstering, or fruit stand keeping. A general store, a bakery, a little church erected to St. Rocco, and a shop in which two glass globes filled with colored water and the sign Farmacia Italiana proclaiming its owner's calling were the principal edifices of the place. To the latter de Grandin led us, and introduced himself in a flood of voluble Italian. The little wrinkled pharmacist regarded him attentively, then replied torrentially waving his hands and elevating shoulders and eyebrows, till I felt sure both would be separated from their respective substructures. At length, Perfetto, eccellente, de Grandin cried, raising his hat ceremoniously. Many thanks, signor. We go at once. To us? Come, my friends, I think that we are on the trail at last. What did you find out, sir? Costello asked, as the little Frenchman led us hurriedly down the single street the hamlet boasted. Ah, but of course, I did forget you did not speak Italian, de Grandin answered contritely. When we had looked upon the spot where you did find the little hands, I told me, it are useless to stand here staring at the earth. Either the poor one from whom those hands were cut are living or dead. In any event, she are not here. If she are alive, she might have wandered off, though not far, for the bleeding from her severed wrists would be too extensive. If she are dead, she could not have moved herself. Yet, since she are not here, someone must have moved her. Jules de Grandin let us inquire, and so I led the way to this small village, and first of all I see the pharmacist's shop. Very good, I tell me. The druggist are somewhat of a doctor. Injured persons frequently appeal to him for help. Perhaps he will know something, and so I interrogate him. He knew nothing of a person suffering grievous hurt, but he informed me that a most respectable old woman living near had come to him some time ago in greatest haste, and implored that he would sell her opium, as well as something which would staunch the flow of blood. The woman was not suffering from an injury. The inference is, then, that she sought the remedies for someone else, n'est-ce pas? Of course, very well, it is to her house that we go all quickly. We halted at the small gate of a cottage garden. The paling fence was innocent of paint, but neatly whitewashed, as were the rough plank sidewalls of the house. An oil lamp burned dimly in the single room the cottage boasted, 
and by its feeble light we saw an old woman, very wrinkled but very clean, bending over a low bed which lay in shadow. De Grandin knocked imperatively on the whitewashed door, then, as no answer was forthcoming, pushed back the panels and stepped across the threshold. The room was nearly bare of furniture, the bed, a small table, and two rough unpainted chairs completing its equipment. The little kerosene lamp, a cheap alarm clock, and two gaily colored pictures of religious scenes were the sole attempts at ornament. The aged woman, scrupulously neat in smooth black gown and cheap jet brooch, straightened on her knees beside the bed as we came in, and raised a finger to her wrinkled lips. Quiet, please, she murmured. She is asleep. I have give. She sought the English word, then raised her shoulders in a shrug of impotence and finished in Italian. I give opio. De Grandin doffed his hat and bowed politely, then whispered quickly in Italian. The woman listened, nodded once or twice, then rose slowly and beckoned us to follow her across the room. Signori, she informed us in a whisper, I am a poor woman, me, but I have the means to live a little. At night, what you call him, see, scrub, I scrub floors in the bank at the city. Sometimes I come home by the bus at morning. Sometimes I walk for save the money. Last night, this morning, I walk. I pass the convento just when the dark is turning into light today, and I go for walk down hill to her, I hear somebody groan. Ooh, ah, like that. I go for see who are in trouble, and find this povera lying in the snow. Dio santo, what you think? Some devil, he have cut her arms off close by the hand. She is bleeding fast. I call to her, she try for answer, but no can. What you think some more? The devil have cut out her tongue, and blood run out her mouth when she try to speak. I go for look some more. Santissima Madonna, her eyes have been put out. Oh, I tell you, signore, it is the sight of sadness that I see. I think at first I run for a help. Then I think, no, while I am gone, she may die from bleeding. I take her with me. So I do. I am very strong, me. All my life in old country, in new country, I work very hard. Yes, sure. So I put her on my back, so, and make the run. Not a walk, a run, all way downhill to my house here. Then I put clothes upon her where her hands should be, and put her in my bed. Then I run all the way by the pharmacia for medicine. The drug man not like for sell me opio, but I beg him on my knee and tell him it is for save a life. Then he give it to me. I come back with a run and make soup of it, and from it feed her with a spoon. At first she spit it out again. But after time she swallow it, and now she not feel no more pain. She is asleep, and when she wake I give her more until her hurt all better. I know not who she is, signori, but I not like for see her suffer. She is so young, so pretty, so, uh, what you say, uh, Nisa? Yes, sure. De Grandin twisted his moustache and looked at her appreciatively. At length, Madame, you are truly one of God's good, noble women, he declared, and raised her gnarled and work-worn fingers to his lips, as though they had been the white-jeweled fingers of a countess. Now quick, my friends, he called to us. She must have careful nursing and a bed and rest and the best medical attendance. Call for an ambulance from the pharmacy, my sergeant. We shall await you here. Swiftly, speaking softly in Italian, he explained the need of expert nursing to the woman, adding that only in a hospital could we hope to revive the patient sufficiently to enable her to tell us something of her assailants. But no, the woman told him, that cannot be, signor. They have cut off her hands, they have cut out her tongue, they have put out her eyes. She cannot speak or write or recognize the ones who did it, even though you made them arrest and brought them to her. Me, I think, maybe it was the mafia did this, though they not do like this before. 
They kill, yes, but cut a woman up like this, no. Sicilians, very bad men, but not bad like that, I think. Ma mère, de Grandin answered, though all you say is true, nevertheless I shall find a way for her to talk and tell us who has done this thing, and how we best may find him. How I shall do it, I cannot tell, but that I shall succeed, I am assured. I am Jules de Grandin, and I do not fail. Most of my life has been devoted to the healing of the sick and tracking down the wicked. I may not heal her hurts, for only God's good self can grow new hands and replace her ruined eyes and tongue. But vengeance I can take on those who outraged her and all humanity when they did this shameful thing. And may Satan roast me on a spit and serve me hot in my own gravy with damned detestable turnips as a garnish if I do not. I swear it. She shall talk to me in hell's despite. May we, you must accept it he insisted, as he tendered her a bill and the woman made a gesture of refusal. Think of your ruined gown, your soiled bedclothing, and the trouble you have been to. It is your due, not a reward, my old one. She took the money reluctantly, but thankfully, and he turned impatiently to me. Stand by, my friend, he ordered. We must go with her when they have come for every moment is of preciousness. Me, I do not greatly like the looks of things, the brutal way in which her hands were amputated, the exposure to the cold, the well-meaning but unhygienic measures of assistance which the kindly one has taken. Infection may set in, and we must make her talk before it is too late. Make her talk? I echoed in amazement. You're raving, man. How can she talk without a tongue or... Ah, bah, he interrupted. Keep the eyes on Jules de Grandin, good friend Trowbridge. The devil and his servants may be clever, but he is cleverer. Yes, by damn much more so. The clanging ambulance arrived in a few minutes, for the call Costello sent was urgent, and a bored young intern, collegiate raccoon coat slipped on over his whites, entered the cottage, the stretcher bearers close behind him. Here you got a pretty bad case here he began, then straightened as he saw de Grandin. Oh, I didn't know you were in charge here, doctor, he finished. The little Frenchman, whose uncanny skill at surgery had made his name a byword in the local clinics, smiled amiably. Quickly, mon brave, he ordered. It is imperative that we should get her hence as rapidly as possible, a desire to converse with her. Okay, the youngster answered. What's wrong? He drew out his report card and poised a pencil over it. De Grandin nodded to the litter-bearers to begin their task as he replied. Both hands amputated by transverse cuts, including the pronator quadratus, the tongue clipped across the apex, both eyes blinded by transverse knife cuts across the cornea and striking through the anterior chamber and crystalline lens. You... she... has had all that done to her, and you're gonna converse with her? the boy asked incredulously. Don't you mean... I mean precisely what I say, mon vieux, de Grandin told him positively. I shall ask her certain questions, and she shall answer me. Come, make haste, or it may be too late. At the hospital, de Grandin, aided by a wandering nurse and intern, removed the old Italian woman's makeshift bandages from the girl's severed wrists applied a strong anodyne liniment of aconite, opium, and chloroform, and wound fresh wrappings on the stumps, with the speed and skill of one who served a long and strenuous apprenticeship in trench dressing stations and field hospitals. Some time elapsed before the strong narcotic soup administered by the old Italian lost its effect, but at length the patient showed slight signs of consciousness. Ma fille, de Grandin said, leaning forward till his lips were almost against the maimed girl's bandaged face. You are in great trouble. You are temporarily deprived of speech and sight, but it is necessary that you tell us what you can, that we may apprehend those who did this thing to you. At present you are in Mercy Hospital, and here you will be given every care. Attend me carefully, if you please. I shall ask you questions. You shall answer me by spelling, 
Thus, he seated himself at the foot of the bed and placed his hand lightly on the blanket where her feet lay. For A, you will move your foot once, for B twice, and so on through the alphabet, you understand? A pause, then a slight movement underneath the bedclothes, twenty-five twitches of the foot, then five, finally nineteen. Y, E, S. Très bon, let us start. Drawing a notebook from his pocket, he rested it upon his knee, then poised a stylographic pen above it. Leave us if you will, my friends, he ordered. We shall be better if alone. Now, ma pauvre. He turned toward the mutilated girl, ready to begin his interrogatory. Something like an hour later he emerged from the sick room, tears gleaming in his eyes and a taut hard look about his mouth. It is finished. Done. Completed, he announced, sinking wearily into a chair and, in defiance of every house rule, drawing out an evil-smelling French cigarette and setting it alight. What's finished? I demanded. Everything. All, he answered. My questioning, and the poor one, both together. Name of a miracle, I spoke truth when I told her that blonde lie, and said her loss of sight and speech was temporary. For now, she sees and sings in God's own paradise. The shock and loss of blood she suffered were too much. She is gone. He drew a handkerchief from his cuff and wiped his eyes, then. But not until she told me all did she depart, he added fiercely. Give me a little time to put my notes in order, and I shall read them to you. Three quarters of an hour later, he and I, Costello and Renoir, were closeted in the superintendent's office. Her name was Veronica Brady he began, referring to his transcript of the notes he had taken in the dead girl's room. And she lived beneath the hill the other side the convent. She was an operative in the Hamel factory, and was due at work at slightly after seven. In order to arrive in time, she had to take an early bus, and as the snow was deep, she set out early to meet the vehicle on the highway. As she was toiling up the hill this morning, she was attracted by a group of people skirting the convent wall. A woman and three men. The woman was enveloped in some sort of long garment. It seemed to her like a blanket draped round her, and seemed struggling weakly and pleading with the men, two of whom pushed and drove her onward like a beast to slaughter, while the third one walked ahead and seemed to take no notice of the others. They reached the convent wall, and one of the men climbed upon another's shoulders, seized the woman and dragged her up, then leaped the wall. The second man, mounted on the third one's shoulders, reached the wall crest, then leaned down and assisted his companion up. As the last one paused a moment on the summit of the wall, preparatory to leaping over into the garden, he spied Mademoiselle Veronica, jumped down and seized her, then called to his companions. They bade him bring her, and he dragged her to the wall, and forced her up to the villain waiting at the top. Thereafter they drew her to the garden gagged her with handkerchiefs, and ripped her stockings off, binding her hands and feet with them. Then, while she sat propped against the wall, she witnessed the whole vile scene. The base miscreants removed the effigy of Christ from the crucifix and broke it into pieces. Then, with railway spikes, they nailed the woman on the cross, and thrust a crown of barbed wire on her head, and set an inscription over her. This done, they stood away and cursed her with all manner of vile oaths, and pilted her with snowballs while she hung and died in torment. At length the coming of the dawn warned them their time was short, and so they gave attention to their second victim, explaining that the one whom they had crucified had paid the penalty of talking. They then informed poor Mademoiselle Veronica that they would save her from such fate by making it impossible that she should betray them. And then they took the bindings from her wrists and ankles, made her resume her stockings, and walk with them until they reached the wall. Across the wall they carried her, then in the snow outside they bade her kneel and clasp her hands in prayer, while she looked her last upon the world. The poor child thought they meant to kill her, how little could she estimate their vileness? 
for as she folded her hands in supplication, Zick! A sudden knife-stroke hit her wrists, and scarcely realizing what she did, she found herself looking down at two small clasped hands, while from her wrists there spurted streams of blood. The blow was quick and the knife sharp. She scarcely felt the stroke, she told me, for it was more like a heavy blow with a fist or club than a severing cut which deprived her of her hands. But before she realized what had befallen her, she felt her throat seized by rough hands, and she was choked until her tongue protruded. A sudden searing pain, as though a glowing iron had been thrust into her mouth, was followed by a blaze of flashing light. Then darkness, utter, impenetrable darkness, such as she had never known before, fell on her, and in the snow she writhed in agony of mind and body shut off from every trace of light, and with her own blood choking back the screams for help she tried to give, in her ears was echoed the laughter of her tormentors. The next she knew she was lifted from the snow and borne on someone's shoulders to a house. Bandages were wound about her wrists and eyes, and anon a biting, bitter mixture was poured into her tortured mouth. Then merciful oblivion until she woke to find herself in Mercy Hospital with Jules de Grandin questioning her. Ah, it was pitiful to make her tell this story, with her feet, my friends, and very pitiful it was to see her die. But far rather would I have done so than know that she must live a maimed and blinded creature. Ah, but I have not done. No, she told me of the men who did this sacre dastard thing. Their leader was a monstrous-looking creature. A person with an old and wrinkled face, not ugly, not even wicked, but rather sad and thoughtful, and in his wrinkled face there burned a pair of ageless eyes, all but void of expression, and his body was the lithe, well-formed body of a youth. His voice, too, was gentle, like his eyes, but gentle with the terrible gentleness of the hissing serpent, and though he dressed like us, Upon his head was set a scarlet turban, ornamented with a great greenish-yellow stone which shone and flickered, even in the half-light of the morning, like the evil eye of a ferocious tiger. His companions were similar in dress, although the turbans on their heads were black. One was tall, the other taller. Both were swarthy of complexion, and both were bearded. By their complexions and their beards, and especially by their noses, she thought them Jewish. The poor one erred most terribly and slandered a most great and noble race. We know them for what they truly were, my friends, Kurdish Hellions, Yezidi followers, and worshippers of Satan's unclean self. He finished his recital and lit another cigarette. The net of evidence is woven he declared. Our task is now to cast it over them. You're right there, sir. Did right, Costello agreed. But how are we going to do it? De Grandin looked at him a moment, then started, as one who suddenly recalls a duty unperformed. By blue, he cried. We must at once to monsieur the coroner's. We must secure those photographs before it is too late. THE LOST LADY 1. THE STRANGER FROM CAMBODIA Four miles away, where Hopkins Point Light thrust its thin rapier of luminance into the relentless advance of the sea mist, a foghorn hooted with dolorous persistence. Half a mile out, rising and falling rhythmically with the undulation of an ocean which crept forward with a flat, oily swell, a bell buoy sounded a warning mournful as a funeral toll. Clank a clang, clank a clang, it repeated endlessly. Monine MacDougall glanced at the fog obscured window, half in annoyance, half in what seemed nervous agitation. I wish it would stop, she exclaimed petulantly. That everlasting clang clang is getting on my nerves. A storm would be preferable to that slow, never ending tolling. I can't stand it. She shook her narrow shoulders in a shudder of repugnance. Her big husband smiled tolerantly. Don't let it get you, old dear, he counseled. We'll have a cup full of wind before morning. That'll change the tempo for you. 
This fog won't last, never does this time of year. To us, he added in explanation, Monine's all hot and bothered tonight. Her colored boyfriend, Dougal, his wife cut in sharply. I tell you, he wasn't a Negro. He was a Chinaman, an Oriental of some kind, at any rate. Ugh! She trembled at the recollection. He sickened me. Turning to me, she continued, I drove into Harrisonville this afternoon, Dr. Trowbridge, and just as I was leaving Brownstein's, he stepped up to me. I felt something pawing at my elbow without realizing what it was. Then a hand gripped my arm, and I turned around. A tall, thin man with a perfect death's head face was bending forward, grinning right into my eyes. I started back, and he tightened his grip on my arm with one hand and reached the other out to stroke my face. Then I screamed. I couldn't help it, for the touch of those long, bony fingers fairly sickened me. Fortunately, the doorman happened to notice us just then, and came running to my assistance. The strange man leaned over and whispered something I couldn't understand in my ear, then made off through the crowd of shoppers before the doorman could lay hold of him. Brr! She shuddered again. I can't get the memory of that face out of my mind. It was too dreadful. No, oh, he was probably just some harmless nut, Dougal MacDougall consoled with a laugh. You should feel complimented, my dear. Cheerio, Christmas is coming. Lick her up. He poured himself a glass of Napoleon brandy and raised it toward us with a complimentary gesture. Jules de Grandin replaced his demitasse on the low tabaret of Indian mahogany and decanted less than a thimbleful of the brandy into a tiny crystal goblet. Ixki, he pronounced, passing the little glass beneath his narrow nostrils, savoring the ruby liquor's bouquet as a languishing poet might inhale a rose from his lady-love's girdle. C'est son comparaison, madame, monsieur, to you. May you have a truly joyeux Noël. He inclined his head toward our hostess and host in turn, then drained his glass with ritualistic solemnity. Oh, but it won't be Christmas for three whole days yet, Dr. de Grandin, Monine protested. And Dougal, the horrid old thing, won't tell me what my gift's to be. Night after tomorrow is la veille de Noël, de Grandin reminded with a smile as he refilled his glass. And we cannot be too forehanded with good wishes, madame. Dougal MacDougall and his bride sat opposite each other across the resined logs that blazed in the wide, marble-mantled fireplace. The cunningly modernized fireplace from a vandalized French chateau. He, tall, long-limbed, handsome in a dark, bleak, discontented fashion, a trick of nature and heredity, for by temperament he was neither. She, a small, slight wisp of womanhood, the white, creamy complexion of some long-forgotten Norse ancestor combining charm with her Celtic black hair and pansy eyes, clad in a scanty Odenil garment, swinging one boyishly slim leg to display its perfection of cobweb silken sheath and Paris slipper. The big opulent living room matched both of them. Electric lamps under painted shades spilled pools of light on bizarre little tables littered with unconsidered trifles, cigarette boxes, bridge markers, ultra-modern magazines, the deep mahogany bookshelves occupying recesses each side of the mantelpieces hoarded current bestsellers and standard works of poetry indiscriminately. A grand piano stood in the deep oriel window's bay, the radio was cunningly camouflaged in a charming old cabinet of Chinese Chippendale. Here and there showed the blurred blue, mulberry and red of priceless old china and the dwarfed perfection of exquisitely chosen miniatures in frames of carved and heavily gilded wood. The room was obviously the shrine of these two, bodying forth their community of treasures, tastes and personalities. Give me a cigarette, darling. Monine, curled up in her deep chair like a Persian kitten on its cushion, extended a bare, scented arm toward her big, handsome husband. Dougal MacDougall proffered her a hammered silver tray of deities, while de Grandin, not to be outdone in gallantry, leaped nimbly to his feet, snapped his silver pocket lighter into flame, and held the blue blazing wick out to her till she set her cigarette aglow. Beg pardon, sir. Tompkins, MacDougall's irreproachable butler, 
bowed deferentially from the arched doorway. "'There's a gentleman here, a foreign gentleman, who insists on seeing Dr. de Grandin at once. He won't give his name, sir.' Quick steps pounded on the polished floor of the hall, and an undersized individual shouldered the butler aside with a lack of ceremony I should never have essayed, then glanced menacingly about the room. On second glance— I realized my impression of the visitor's diminutive stature was an error. Rather, he was a giant in miniature. His very lack of height gave the impression of material equilibrium and tremendous physical force. His shoulders were unusually broad and his chest abnormally deep. One felt instinctively that the fuse of his arms were massive as those of a gladiator, and his torso sheathed in muscle like that of a professional wrestler. A mop of iron-gray hair was brushed back in a pompadour from his wide brow, and a curling white mustache adorned his upper lip, while a wisp of white imperial depended from his sharply pointed chin. But the most startling thing about him was his cold, pale face, a face with the pallor of a statue, from which there burned a pair of big, deep-set, dark eyes beneath horizontal parentheses of intensely black and bushy brows. Once more the stranger gazed threateningly about. Then, as his glowing eyes rested on de Grandin, he announced ominously, "'I am here!' Jules de Grandin's face went blank with amazement, almost with dismay, then lit up with an expression of diabolical savagery. "'Morbleu! It is the assassin!' he exclaimed incredulously, leaping from his seat and putting himself in a posture of defence. A bash! The stranger ground the insult between strong white teeth which flashed with animal-like ferocity. Stealer of superannuated horses! De Grandin countered, advancing a threatening step toward the other. Pickpocket! Burglar! Highwayman! Cutthroat! Everything which is execrable! shouted the intruder, with a furious scowl as he shook clenched fists in De Grandin's face. Embrasse moi they cried in chorus, and flung themselves into each other's arms like sweethearts reunited after long parting. For a moment they embraced, kissing each other's cheeks, pounding each other's shoulders with affectionate fists, exchanging the deadliest insults in gamin French. Then, remembering himself, de Grandin put the other from him and turned to us with a ceremonious bow. Monsieur and Madame MacDougall, Dr. Trowbridge, he announced with stilted formality. I have the very great honor to present Monsieur Georges Jean Joseph Marie Renoir, Inspecteur de Service du Sûreté Générale, and the cleverest man in all the world, except myself. Georges, abominable stealer of blind men's sous that you are, permit that I introduce Monsieur and Madame Dougal MacDougall, my host and hostess, and Dr. Samuel Trowbridge. Skilled physician, and as noble a fellow as ever did honour to the sacred name of friend. It is with him I have lived since coming to this country. Inspector Renoir bent forward in a jackknife bow as he raised Monin's hand to his lips, bowed again to MacDougall, then took my hand in a grip which nearly paralysed the muscle of my forearm. I am delight, he assured us. Monsieur Trowbridge, your taste in permitting this one to reside beneath your roof is execrable, no less, but he is clever, almost as clever as I, and doubtless he has imposed on you to make you think him an honest fellow. Eh bien, I have arrived at last like nemesis to spoil his little game. Me, I shall show him in his true colours, no less. Having thus unburdened himself, he lapsed into a seat upon the divan accepted a liqueur, folded his large white hands demurely in his lap, and gazed from one of us to the other, with a quick bird-like glance which seemed to take minute inventory of everything it fell upon. "'And what fortunate wind blows you here, mon brave?' de Grandin asked at length. "'Well, I know it is no peaceful mission you travel on, for you were ever the stormy petrol. Tell me, is excitement promised?' I grow weary of this so uneventful American life. Tiens, Renoir laughed. I think we shall soon see much excitement, plenty, mon petit coq. As yet, 
I have not recovered my land legs after travelling clear about the earth in search of one who is the devil's other self. But tomorrow the hunt begins afresh. And then? Who knows? Yes, certainly. He nodded gravely to us in turn. Then? Clear from Cambodia I come, my friend, upon the trail of the cleverest and wickedest of clever, wicked fellows. And a lady. A lady? De Grandin's blue eyes lit up with interest. You amaze me. Prepare for more amazement then, mon vieux. She is a runaway lady, young, beautiful, ravissante. He gathered his fingers at his lips and wafted a kiss gently toward the ceiling. A runaway bayadere from the great temple of Angkor, no less. Mon Dieu, you excite me. What has she done? Run away? Decamped? Skipped? Precisément, great stupid head. But why should you, an inspector of the secret police, pursue her? She ran away from the temple, Renoir began again, and... Bet, repeat that so senseless statement but one more time, and I shall give myself the pleasure of twisting your entirely empty head from off your deformed shoulders, de Grandin broke in furiously. And he whom I seek ran after her, his colleague continued imperturbably. Voilà tout. It is once again a case of chercher la femme. Oh, how interesting, Monine exclaimed. Won't you tell us more, Inspector Renoir? Frenchmen are seldom importuned in vain by pretty women. The inspector was no exception. Do you know Cambodia by any unhappy chance? he asked, flashing his gleaming eyes appreciatively at the length of silk-sheathed leg Monine displayed as she sat one foot doubled under her, the other hanging toward the floor. We shook our heads, and he continued. It is the hottest spot upon the earth, mes amis, hot and wet. Always the humidity hovers near one hundred per cent. Your clothes are soaked with perspiration in a few minutes, and will not dry out overnight. Sheets and bedding are useless for the same reason, and one learns to sleep on tightly stretched matting on bare boards. Clothing mildews and wounds never heal. It is the only land where snakes large enough to kill by constriction are also venomous, and its spider's bites make that of the tarantula seem harmless by comparison. The natives sleep all day and emerge at night like bats, cats, and owls. It is a land unfit for white men. But this temple dancer, this oriental girl, Manin insisted, why do you follow her here? She is no oriental, madame. She too is white. White? A temple dancing girl? How? The inspector lit a cigarette before replying. The Angkor Temple is the great cathedral of Buddhism in southern Asia. But it is a Buddhism gone to seed and overgrown with strange rites, even as the Lamist Buddhism of Tibet is bastardized. Very well. This temple of Angkor is a vast stone structure with sculpted terraces, fountains and houses for the priests and sacred dancers. All ceremonies are held outdoors, the terraces being the scene of the rites. The debased Buddhism is a religion of the dance. Its services are largely composed of most beautiful and extremely intricate dances, which often last for days on end. Nor are they meaningless or merely ritualistic, by no means. Like those of the devil dancers of the North, these ceremonies of the South have meaning, definite meaning. Every movement of arms, legs, head, eye, and lips, down to the very angle of hands and feet, conveys a word or phrase or sentence to those who watch, and understand as clearly as the soldier's semaphore flags convey a meaning to the military observer. It is kind of stenography of motion. Now, it can easily be imagined that such skill is not acquired overnight. No, the dancers are trained almost from the cradle. They are under the absolute control of the priests. The smallest infraction of a temple rule or even the whim of a holy man, and sentence is forthwith passed and the unfortunate dancer dies slowly and in circumstances of great elaboration and discomfort. So much by way of prologue. Now for this runaway young lady. 
Twenty years ago, a young and earnest man from your country named Joseph Crownshield came to Cambodia to preach the word of God as expounded by authority of the Mennonite Church to the benighted followers of Buddha. Alas, while his zeal was great, his judgment was small. He committed two great errors, first in coming to Cambodia at all, second in having with him his young wife. The priests of Angkor did not relish the things which this Monsieur Crownshield said. They relished even less what he did, for he was earnest and began to convert the natives, and gifts for the great temple were less plentiful. The young man died. A snake bit him as he was about to enter his bath. Snakes have no business in the bathroom, but his household servants were, of course, Cambodians and the priesthood numbered expert snake charmers among its personnel. At any rate, he died. Misfortunes seldom come singly. Two days later the church and parsonage burned down, and in the smoking ruins was found the body of a woman. Madame Crownshield? Perhaps, who can say? At all events the body was interred beside the missionaries, and life went on as usual. But sixteen years later came rumours to the French gendarmerie of a dancer in the temple, a girl who danced like a flame in the wind, like a moonbeam on flowing water, like the twinkling of a star at midnight. And, rumour said, though her hair was black, it was fine as split silk, not coarse like that of the native women, and her skin was fair as milk, and her eyes blue as violets in springtime. Devotees of the temple are not supposed to speak to outsiders. The penalty of an unguarded tongue is lingering death. But the ear of the Sûreté is keen, and its arm is very long. We learned that rumour was well founded. Within the temple there was such a one, and she was even as rumour described her. Though she never emerged from her dwelling place within the sacred edifice, her presence there was definitely established. Unquestionably, she was white. Equally beyond question, she had no business where she was. But... He paused, spreading his hands and puffing out his cheeks. It is not wise to trifle with the religion of the natives, he ended simply. But who was she? Monin asked. Parbleu, I would give my tongue to the cat if I could answer you, the inspector returned. The Sûreté found itself against a wall of stone more stubborn than that of which the temple was composed. In that God-detested land we learn much. If one fasts long enough, he will hear voices and see visions. The poisons of certain drugs and the toxins of certain fevers have the same effect. Occasionally the spirit of Buddha permeates the soul of a white man, more frequently a white woman, in the tropics. The accumulated toxic effect of the climate leads him, or her, to give up the materialistic, cleanly civilization of the West and retire to a life of squalor, filth and contemplation as a devotee of some Eastern faith. Had this happened here? Was this girl self-devoted as a dancer in the temple? Had her mother, perhaps, devoted herself years ago, and had the child been born and reared in the shadow of the temple idols? One wonders. But surely you investigated, Monin pursued. But naturally, madame. I am Renoir. I do not do things by the half, no. To the Angkor temple I went and demanded sight of her. There is no such person here, I was assured. You lie, I answered courteously. And unless you bring her to me forthwith, I shall come in for her. Eh bien, monsieur, he turned to us with a chuckle. The Frenchman... He's logical. He harbors no illusions about the love of subject peoples, nor does he seek to conciliate them. Love him they may not, but fear and respect him they must. My hint was sufficient, especially as two platoons of gendarmerie, a howitzer, and machine guns were there to give it point. The lady whose existence had been denied so vehemently a moment before was straightway brought to me. Beyond doubt she was pure European. Her hair was black and gently waved. Her skin was white as curdled cream. Her eyes were blue as... Pas bleu, madame. 
He gazed at Monine MacDougall with wide-open eyes, as though he saw her for the first time. She was much like you. I thought I saw a shiver of terror ripple through Monine's lithe form, but her husband's hearty laugh relieved the tension. Well, who was she? he asked. Le bon Dieu knows, Renoir returned. Although I made the ape-faced priests retire so that we might converse unheard, they had either terrified the girl that she dared not speak, or she was actually unable to inform me. I spoke to her in every language that I know, and there are many, but only the lingo of the Khmer could she understand or speak. Her name, she said, was Thiba. She was a sacred dancer in the temple, and she remembered no other world. She had always lived there. Of her parentage she could not speak, for father or mother she had never known. And at the end she joined hands together, palm to palm, the fingers pointing downward, which is the symbol of submission, and begged I would permit her to go back to her place among the temple women. Sacre nom! What is one to do in such circumstances? Nothing. That is what I did. I retired in chagrin, and she returned to her cell within the temple. Bien oui. De Grandin tweaked the needle points of his little blonde moustache and grinned impishly at the inspector. But a tale half told is poorly told, my friend. What of this other one, this so clever devilish fellow whom you trail while he trails the runaway lady, eh? Huh? Renoir joined his square-tipped fingers end to end and pursed his lips judicially. Oui, da, he admitted. That is the other half of the tale, indeed. Very well. Regardez-moi bien. In Cochin, China, in the days before the Great War, there lived a certain gentleman named Sun Apoi. He was, as you may gather from his name, Chinese, but his family had been resident in Saigon for generations. The Sun family is so numerous in China that to bear the name means little more than for a Frenchman to be called Dupont, or an Englishman Smith, or an Irishman Murphy. Nevertheless, all these names have had their famous representatives, as you will recall when you think of your great colonizer, Captain John Smith, and the illustrious Albert of the present generation. Also, you will remember China's first president was Dr. Sun Yat-sen. This Sun Apoi was no shopkeeping son of a coolie father. He was an educated gentleman, a man of great wealth, taught by private tutors in the learning of the East and holding a diploma from the Sorbonne. His influence with the native population was phenomenal, and his opinions were eagerly sought and highly regarded by the Conseil Privé. He wore the ribbon of the Legion of Honor for distinguished service to the Republic. This, then, was the man who, a few days before the armistice, went up-country to supervise an elephant hunt. A savage old tusker had been roped between two trained beasts, and was being led into the stockade when, without warning, he broke his fetters and charged. The elephant on which Dr. Sun was seated was directly in the maddened brute's path. In a moment the runaway beast had seized the unfortunate man in his trunk, snatched him from his saddle, and hurled him forty feet through the air, crashing him into the wall of the stockade. Medicine and surgery did their best. Sonapoi lived, alas. When he rose from his hospital bed it was with body and mind hopelessly crippled. The physical injury was apparent to all. The mental ailment we were to find out to our cost. Insubordination broke out among the natives. French officers were openly disobeyed. Criminals were permitted to escape from prison. Laborers on the public works were assaulted and beaten, sometimes killed. The process of criminal jurisprudence broke down completely, for witnesses could not be made to testify. Gendarmes went forth to make arrests and came back feet first. Examining magistrates, who prosecuted investigations with honest thoroughness, died mysteriously. And most opportunely for the criminals, official records of the police disappeared from their files overnight. It was all too obvious that outlawry had raised its red standard and hurled defiance at authority. 
In Paris this would have been bad. In Asia it was unspeakable, for the white man must keep his prestige at all costs. Once he loses face, his power over the natives is gone. What was he to do? At length, like men of sound discretion, the government put the case in my charge. I considered it. From all angles I viewed it. What did I see? A single dominating intelligence seemed guiding all the lawlessness, an intelligence which knew beforehand what plans government made. I cast about for suspects, and my eye fell on three, Sun Apoi, and two others. He seemed least likely of the three, but he enjoyed our confidence, and it lay within his power to thwart our plans, if he so desired. Therefore I laid my trap. I called three councils of war, to each of which a different suspect was invited. At these councils I outlined my plans for raiding certain known centers of the criminal elements. The first two raids were successful. We caught our game red-handed. The third was a glorious failure. Only a brightly glowing campfire and a deserted encampment waited for the gendarme. It was of this raid I had spoken to Dr. Sun. Proof? Not in English courts, nor American, but this was under French jurisdiction. We do not let the guilty escape through fear of affronting the possibly innocent. No, I issued a warrant for Dr. Sun's apprehension. That evening, as I sat within my cabinet, I heard a clicking scratching on the matting-covered floor. Sapristi! Toward me there charged full tilt a giant tarantula, the greatest, most revolting-looking spider I had ever seen. Now it is seldom that these brutes attack a man who does not annoy them, that they should deliberately attack an inoffensive, passive person is almost beyond experience. Yet though I sat quiescent at my table, this one made for me as though he had a personal feud to settle. Fortunately for me, I was wearing my belt, and with a single motion I leaped upon the table, drew my pistol, and fired. My bullet crushed the creature, and I breathed again. But that night, as I rode home to my quarters, a second poison spider dropped from a tree bough into my rickshaw. I struck it with my walking stick and killed it, but my escape was of the narrowest. When I went into my bathroom, I found a small but very venomous serpent coiled ready to receive me. It struck. I leaped. Grand Dieu, I leaped like a monkey on a stick, and came down with my heels upon its head. I triumphed, but my nerves were badly shaken. My men returned. Son Apoy was nowhere to be found. He had decamped. Who warned him? My native clerk? Perhaps. The tentacles of this octopus I sought to catch stretched far and into the most unexpected places. I walked in constant terror. Everywhere I went I carried my revolver ready. Even in my house I went about with a heavy cane in my hand, for I knew not what instant silent death would come striking at my feet or dropping on me from the ceiling. At length my spies reported progress. A new priest... A crippled man was in the Angkor temple. He was enamoured of the white dancer, they said. It was well. Where the lioness lairs, the lion will surely linger. I went to take him, nor did I confide my plans to any but Frenchmen. Alas, the love which makes the world to move also spoiled my coup. The Khmer are an effeminate, lascivious, well-nigh beardless race. All traces of virility have vanished from them, and craft had replaced strength in their dealings. Thibak, the white girl dancer, had lived her life within the confines of the temple, and except myself, I doubt that she had seen a single white man in her whole existence, till Monsieur Archibald Hildebrand appeared. He was young, handsome, vigorous, moustached, all that the men she knew were not. Moreover, he was of her race, and like calls to like in Cambodia, as in other places. How he met her I do not know, nor how he made himself understood, for she spoke no English, he no Khmer. But a gold key unbars all doors, and the young man from America had gold in plenty. Also, 
Love makes mock of lexicons and speaks its own language. And they had love, these two. Enfin, they met, they loved, they eloped. It may seem strange that this could be, for the whole world knows that temple women of the East are well nigh as carefully guarded as inmates of the Zanana. Elsewhere, yes, but in Cambodia, no. There, night is day and day is night. In the torrid, steaming heat of day, the population sleeps or tries to, and only fleeing criminals and foreigners unaccustomed to the land are abroad. One might mount the temple terraces and steal the head from off a carven Buddha and never find a temple guard to say him nay, provided he went by daylight. So it was here. Thiba the dancer had but to creep forth from her cell on soft stepping unshod feet, meet her lover in the sunlight, and go away. Two days before I arrived at Angkor with handcuffs already warmed to fit the wrists of him I sought, Monsieur Hildebrand and this Thiba set sail from Saigon on a messagerie maritime steamship. One day later, Dr. Sun Apoi shook the dust of Cochin China from his feet. He did it swiftly, silently. He dropped down the Saigon River in a sampan, was transferred to a junk at sea, and vanished. Where? Whither? Here? we asked in breathless chorus. Where else? The man is crazed with love, or passion, or whatever you may choose to call it. He is fabulously rich, infinitely resourceful, diabolically wicked, and inordinately vain, as all such criminal lunatics are. Where the moth of his desire flutters, this spider will not long be absent. Although he did not travel as quickly as the fleeing lovers, he will soon arrive. When he does, I have grave fears for the health of Monsieur Hildebrand and his entire family. They are thorough, these men from the East, and their blood feuds visit the sins of the sons upon the ancestors onto the third and fourth generation. Can that be our Archie Hildebrand, Dr. Trowbridge? Monine asked. Inspector Renoir drew forth a small black leather notebook and consulted it. Monsieur Archibald van Buren Hildebrand, son of Monsieur van Rensselaer Hildebrand, he read. Address of house, 1937 Rue Passaillet, he pronounced it Passaillet, Harrisonville, New Jersey, E.U.A. Why, that is Archie, Monine exclaimed. Oh, I hope nothing happens to— Nonsense, dear, her husband cut in brusquely. What could happen here? This is America, not Cochin, China. The police. Tia, monsieur, de Grandin reminded frigidly. They also have police in Cambodia. Oh, yes, of course, but I hope you are correct, the little Frenchman interrupted. Me, I do not discount anything which Inspector Renoir may say. He is no alarmist, as I very well know. Eh bien, you may be right, but in the meantime a little preparedness can do no harm. 3. A Lost Lady The day dawned crisp and cold, with a tang of frost and hint of snow in the air. My guests were in high spirits, and did ample justice to the panned sole, waffles, and honey in the comb which Nora McGuinness had prepared for breakfast. Renoir particularly was in a happy mood, for the joy the born man-hunter takes in his work was fairly overflowing in him as he contemplated the game of hide-and-seek about to commence. First of all, he announced as he scraped the last remaining spot of honey from his plate, I shall call at the Prefecture de Police and present my credentials. They will help me, they will recognize me, yes. Undoubtedly they will recognize you, mon enfant, de Grandin agreed with a nod. None could fail to do so. Renoir beamed, but I discerned the hidden meaning of de Grandin's statement, and had all I could do to keep a sober face. Innate good taste, cosmopolitan experience, and a leaning toward the English school of tailoring marked Jules de Grandin simply as a more than ordinarily well-dressed man wherever he might be. Renoir, by contrast, could never be mistaken for other than what he was, an efficient officer of the gendarmerie out of uniform, 
and the trademark of his nationality was branded indelibly on him. His rather snugly fitting suit was that peculiarly horrible shade of blue, beloved of your true Frenchman. His shirt was striped with alternate bands of blue and white, his cravat was a thing to give a haberdasher a violent headache, and his patent leather boots, with their round rubber heels tapered to sharp and most uncomfortable-looking points. "'But of course,' he told us, "'I shall say to them, monsieur, if you have here a stout fellow capable of assisting me, I beg you will assign him to this case. I greatly desire the assistance of Sergeant Costello.' Nora McGuinness announced, as she appeared in the breakfast-room door, the big red-headed Irish detective towering behind her. "'Ah, welcome, mon vieux!' de Grandin cried, rising and extending a cordial hand to the caller. "'A merry Christmas to you! And the same to you, sir, and you too, gentlemen,' Costello returned, favouring Renoir and me with a rather sickly grin. "'How oh, now, you do not say it heartily!' de Grandin said, as he turned to introduce Renoir. "'You are in trouble? Good. Tell us, we shall undoubtedly be able to assist you.' Oh, "'I'm hoping so, sir,' the sergeant returned as he drew up a chair and accepted a cup of steaming coffee. "'I'm after needing help this morning. A robbery? A murder? Blackmail? Kidnapping?' de Grandin ran through the catalogue of crime. "'Which is it?' "'Or is it a happy combination of all?' "'Maybe so, sir. I'm not quite sure yet myself,' Costello replied. "'You see, twas early this morning it happened, and I ain't got organised yet, so to speak. It were like this, sir. A Miss Brindell come over to Harrisonville on the six o'clock train. She was coming to visit her sister, who lives down on the south shore, and they hadn't expected her so early. So there's no one there to meet her when she gets to the station.' She knows about where her brother-in-law's house is over to Mary's Landon, so she hops a taxi and starts there. Twere a twenty-mile drive, sir, but she's satisfied with the price, so the cabby don't argue none with her. Well, sirs, the taxi is hardly started from the depot when alongside runs another car, crowds him to the curb and dishes his wheel. The cabby ain't too well pleased with that, you may be sure so he starts to get down and express his opinion of the fellow he has done it, when wham! Something hits him on the cocoa and he goes down for the count. The count, Renoir interjected. Where was this nobleman and why should the chauffeur descend for him? Silence, mon brave, it is an American idiom. I will explain later, de Grandin bade. To Costello. Yes, my sergeant, and what then? Well, sir, the next thing the poor fellow knows... He's in casualty hospital with a bandage round his head, and his cab's on the way to the police pound. He tells us he had a second's look at the guy that crowned him, and— I protest, Renoir broke in. I understood you said he was struck with a massue. Now I am told he was crowned. It is most confuse— Imbecile, be silent, de Grandin ordered savagely. Because you speak the English is no reason for you to flatter yourself that you understand American. Later I shall instruct you. Meantime, keep fast hold upon your tongue while we talk. Proceed, Sergeant, if you please. He uh, got a glimpse of the filly that Kay owed him, sir, and he swore it were a Chinaman. We're holding him, sir, for his story seems fishy to me. I've been on the force, harness bull and fly cop, since the days when Teddy Roosevelt, God rest his noble soul, was president. And though we've a fair-sized Chinatown here, and the monks gets playful now and then, and shoots each other up or carves their initials in each other with meat cleavers, I've never known him to mix it with white folks, and never in me living days have I heard of him stealing white girls, sir. I know they tells some funny tales on em, but me personal experience has been that the white girls as goes with a Chinaman goes of their own free will and accord, and not because anybody steals em. So, what is it you say? She was kidnapped, de Grandin interrupted. Looks kind of that way, sir. We can't find hide nor hair of her, and... But you know her name, how is that? That's part of the funny business, sir. Her grips and even her handbag was all in the taxi when we went through it, and in them we found letters to identify her as Miss Avis Brindell, who'd come to visit her brother-in-law and sister, Mr. and Mrs. Dougal McDougal, at their house at Mary's Landing. So... 
Nom d'un chouffle. Do you tell me so? De Grandin gasped. Madame MacDougall's sister kidnapped by Orientals. How can it be possible? One wonders. What's that, sir? I think your taxi man is innocent, my friend, but I'm glad you have him readily available, de Grandin answered. Come, let us go interview him right away, immediately at once. Mr. Sylvester McCarty, driver of Purple Cab 188672, was in a far from happy frame of mind when we found him in the detention ward of Casualty Hospital. His day had started inauspiciously with the wreck of his machine, the loss of a more than usually large fare, considerable injury to his person, finally with the indignity of arrest. "'It's a weeping shame, that's what it is,' he told us, as he finished the recital of his woes. "'I'm an honest man, sir, and—' "'Agreed by all means,' de Grandin interrupted soothingly. "'That is why we come to you for help, my old one. "'Tell us, if you will, just what occurred this morning. "'Describe the cowardly miscreant who struck you down "'before you had a chance to voice your righteous indignation. "'I am sure we can arrange for your release from durance.' "'McCarty brightened. "'It's hard to tell you much about it, sir.' he answered. For it all happened so quick-like I hardly had time to get my bearings. After I'm crowded to the curb, and my wheels dished, I sees the other car is jammed right smack agin me. And just as I turns round I hears me fair holler, Leave me be, take your hands off of me. With that I jumps down and picks up my crank handle, for if there's going to be an argument, I figures on being prepared. I only gets one eye flash at em, though, sir. There's a queer-looking sort of gink sitting at the wheel of the other car. A brown-faced guy, not coloured, nor yet not quite like a Chinese, but more like some of them Filipinos you see round sometimes, you know. He's all muffled up in a fur coat, with the collar turned up round his chin and his cap pulled down over his eyes. So I can't get much of a slant on him. But just as I starts in to tell him what sort of people I think his family was, up pops another coffee and cream-coloured son of a gun, and Zingo lets me have a bop over the bean that makes me see all the stars there is right in broad daylight. I goes over like the kingpin when a feller rolls a strike, but just before I goes to sleep, I sees the guy that smacked me down, and another one hustling the young lady out of my cab into the other car. And then the chauffeur steps on her and rolls away, leaving me flatter in a pancake. Then I goes out like a light, and the next thing I knows I'm laying here in the horse spittle with a bandage round me dome, and the nurse is saying, sit up now and drink this. Um... De Grandin regarded him gravely. And did you notice the make of the car which fouled you? Not rightly, sir, but it was big and long, a limousine. I thought it was a Rolls, though it might have been a Renault or a Sorta. I don't think it was an American car. Very good, and one presumes it is too much to hope you had opportunity to note the number? I did that, sir. We gets camera-eyed in this racket, and the first thing we do when anyone fouls us is to look at his number. It's second nature. Ah, fine. Excellent. Parfait. Tell me. X-11-7734, sir. Jersey plates. Ah, my prince of chauffeurs, I salute you. Assuredly, it was nobly done. Sergeant, you will surely let him go now? Sure, Costello grunted. You can run along, feller, but don't try any hideaway business. We'll know where to get you and when we want you, don't forget. Sure you will, Mr. McCarty assured him earnestly. Right by the depot, chief. I'm there to meet all the trains. And now for the number, Costello chuckled. But, Dad, Dr. de Grandin, sir, this case is easier than I thought. I'm sorry I bothered you with it now. Not too fast, my friend, the Frenchman counseled. The prudent cat does not mistake all that is white for milk. Five minutes later, Costello returned from a telephone conversation with the license bureau. I reckon I was all wet, Dr. de Grandin, he admitted ruefully. X-11-7734 is the plate of Gleason's grocery car. It's a Ford delivery truck, and its plates were stolen last night while it was standing in front of the store. 4. Poltergeist? For a moment we stared at each other in blank consternation. Que diable, 
swore Renoir, grasping his tuft of beard and jerking it so violently that I feared for his chin. Looks that way. Costello nodded dismally, understanding the Frenchman's tone, if not his words. Sacre nom de dix mille sales cochons! de Grandin exclaimed. Why do we stand here looking ourselves out of countenance like a convention of petrified bullfrogs in the Musée de l'Histoire Naturelle? Let us be doing! Says you, Costello responded. Doing what, sir? Finding them, pardieu. Consider, their appearance was bizarre enough to be noted by the excellent Monsieur McCarty, even in the little minute between the collision of their vehicle and his and the blow which struck him senseless. Very well. Will not others notice them likewise? I think so. They have not been here long. There has been small time to acquire a base of operations, yet they must have one. They must have a house, probably not far from here. Very good, let us find the house, and we shall have found them and the missing lady as well. All right, I'll bite, Costello offered. What's the answer to that one? Oh, dear, it is so simple, even you should see it, the Frenchman retorted. It is like this. They have scarcely had time to consummate a purchase. Besides, that would be wasteful, for they require only a temporary abode. Very well, then. What have they done? Rented a house, n'est-ce pas? I think likely. We have, then, but to set a corps of energetic investigators to the task of soliciting the realty agents of the city, and when one tells us he has let a house to an oriental gentleman, voila, we have him in our net, certainly. Sure, it sounds okay, Costello agreed. But the only thing wrong with it is it won't work. Just because the assistant villains who kidnapped the poor little lady this morning was a lot of monkey-faced chinks is no sign the head of the gang's one, too. Tis more likely he's a white man using Chinese to do his dirty work so as he'll not be suspected, and— And it is entirely probable that pigs would fly like birds had they the necessary wings, de Grandin interrupted bitingly. I say, no. Me, I know, at least I damn suspect what all this devil's business means and I am sure an Oriental is not only the head, but the brains of this crew of Apache as well. Come, mon fils, do as I say. We shall succeed. We must succeed. Dubiously, Costello agreed, and two officers at headquarters were given copies of the classified telephone directory and bidden go down the list of real estate agents systematically, phoning each and inquiring whether he had rented a dwelling to a Chinese gentleman during the past week or ten days. Meantime, de Grandin smoked innumerable cigarettes and related endless risque stories to the great edification of the policeman lounging in the squad-room. I excused myself and hurried to the office, for consulting hours had come, and I could not neglect my practice. The seasonal number of Coriza cases presented themselves for treatment, and I was wondering whether I might cut short the consultation period, since no more applicants for Siler's solution and Dover's powder seemed imminent, when a young man hurried into the office. Tall, lean, sun-bitten till he almost resembled a Malay, he was the kind of chap one took to instantly. A scrubbed with cold water cleanliness and vigor showed in every line of his spare face and figure. His challenging, you be damned look was softened by the humorous curve of the wide, thin lipped mouth beneath his dark, close clipped mustache. Only the lines of habit showed humor now, however, for an expression of keen anxiety was on his features as he advanced toward me. I don't know whether you'll remember me or not, Dr. Trowbridge. He opened while still ten feet from me. But you're one of my earliest recollections. I'm Archie Hildebrand, my father. Why, surely I remember you, son, I returned. Though I don't know I'd have recognized you. We were talking about you last night. Were, eh? He answered grimly. Suppose you particularized concerning how many different kinds of a fool I've made of myself. Well, let me tell you, not at all. I cut in, as I noted the quick anger hardening in his eyes. A French gentleman from Saigon was out to MacDougall's last night, and he happened to mention your romance, and we were all greatly interested. He seemed to think— Was he a policeman? Archie interrupted eagerly. Why, uh, yes. I suppose you might call him that. 
He's an inspector in the Sûreté Générale, and, thank the Lord, maybe he'll be able to help us. But I need you first, sir. What's the matter? I began, but he literally dragged me toward the door. It's Tiba, my wife, sir. I met her in Cambodia and married her in France. No time to go into particulars now, but she... Uh, she's in a bad way, sir, and I wish you'd see her as soon as you can. It seems like some sort of eruption, and it's dreadfully painful. Won't you come now, right away? Mais certainement right away, immediately, de Grandin assured him, appearing with the abruptness of a phantom at the consulting-room door. We shall be most happy to place ourselves at the entire disposal of madame, your wife, young monsieur. As Hildebrand stared at him in open-mouthed astonishment, he explained, "'I have but just entered the house, and it was impossible for me not to overhear what you said to Dr. Trowbridge. I've had much experience with the obscure diseases of the Orient, whence Madame Hildebrand came, and I am sure I shall be of assistance to friend Trowbridge, if you do not object to my entering the case with him.' He paused on a questioning note, and regarded Archie with a frank, disarming smile. "'Delighted to have you,' I put in, before the younger man could express an opinion. "'I know you'll be glad of Dr. de Grandin's assistance, too, Archie,' I added. "'Certainly,' he agreed. "'Only hurry, please, gentlemen. She may be suffering another attack right now, and she's so lonely without me. I'm the only one who understands her, you see.' We nodded sympathetically as we left the house, and a moment later I had headed the car toward the Hildebrand mansion. "'Perhaps you can give us a description of Madame's malady?' de Grandin asked as we spun along. Archie flushed beneath his coat of tar. "'I'm afraid it'll be hard to tell you,' he returned slowly. "'You know—' He paused a moment, then continued in evident embarrassment— if such a thing were possible, I'd say she's the victim of a poltergeist. Eh, what is it you say? The Frenchman demanded sharply. The young man misunderstood his query. A poltergeist, he returned. I've seen what they declared to be their work in the Black Forest district of Germany, and I assure you it's very mystifying. A person, usually a child or a young woman, will become the victim of a malignant spirit, the peasants believe. And this pelting ghost, or poltergeist, as they call it in German, will follow the poor thing about, fling dishes and light articles of furniture at her, snatch the bedclothes off her while she sleeps, and bite, pinch, and scratch her. I've seen severe skin wounds inflicted on unfortunate children who'd been selected by a poltergeist as its victim, and the parents assured me the injuries appeared by magic, while others looked on in broad daylight yet no one could see the hand that inflicted the scratches or the teeth which bit the afflicted person. I set the whole business down as superstitious nonsense, but since I saw what happened to my wife this morning, I'm not so certain I wasn't laughing out of turn when I grinned at those German peasants. Say on, monsieur, I listen, de Grandin answered. My wife was dressing this morning when she suddenly let out a shrill scream and half fell across the bench before her vanity. I ran to her, and when I reached her, I saw across the white skin of her shoulders the distinct wail of a whip. I've seen just such marks on laborers in Cochin, China, when the overseer had lashed them. She was almost fainting when I got to her, and babbling something in Khmer which I couldn't understand. I picked her up and started to carry her toward the bed, and as I did so she emitted another cry, and crossing the first diagonal mark was a second wail so heavy this time that I could see the little spots of blood starting through the skin, where it had been bruised to the point of rupture. I laid her on the bed and ran into the bathroom to soak a towel in which Hazel to put across her shoulders. He paused a moment and looked challengingly at us. Please remember, she was lying on her back in bed, he continued with slow emphasis. Her shoulders were pressing directly on the sheet, Nothing, not even a bullet from a high-power rifle could have struck her from beneath, through the thick layers of cotton felt of the mattress. Yet even as I was crossing the room to her, she screamed a third time. And when I reached her, there was another whip mark crossing the first two at an angle on her shoulders. This happened just as I'm telling you, he concluded. 
then regarded us with an almost threatening glance as he awaited our expressions of polite incredulity. Mais oui, I believe you, my friend, de Grandin told him. It is entirely possible. Indeed, I am not at all surprised. No, on the contrary. Are we arrived? Good. We shall examine these so strange marks upon your poor lady and do what we can to relieve her suffering. By the way, he added, as we mounted the porch steps, at what time did this most unpleasant experience befall madame? Hildebrand considered a moment. About eight o'clock, as near as I can remember, he answered. We usually breakfast at eight, but we'd overslept this morning and were hurrying to get down to the dining room before Rumson, the cook, presented her resignation. She usually resigns if she has to wait a meal more than half an hour, and we were dressing with one eye on the clock when Thiba felt the first pain and the first mark showed on her skin. Eight o'clock, de Grandin repeated musingly. At six they take her. At eight the phenomenon is observed. Eh bien, they wasted little time, those ones. Yes, it all fits together admirably. I was sure before, now I am certain. What's that? Archie asked. I did but confirm my diagnosis, monsieur. It is seldom that I am mistaken. This time, it seems, I am less so than usual. Lead us to madame your wife, if you please. Why, I exclaimed as we entered the pleasant, chintz-hung room where young Mrs. Hildebrand lay, then stared at the girl in fatuous, hang-jawed amazement. Non d'un parapluie rose, de Grandin exclaimed softly. I suspected it, now I know. Yes, of course. Observe her, my friend. I did. I couldn't help it. I knew it could not be. Yet there on the bed before me lay Monine MacDougall, or her twin sister, and stared at us with the wide, hopeless gaze of a dumb thing taken in a trap and waiting in mute terror for the hunter's knife across its throat. Madame, de Grandin began softly, deferentially, we have heard of your trouble and are come to aid you. A tiny parenthesis of puzzled wrinkles formed between the girl's arched black brows, but no sign of understanding showed in her pale face. Madame, he essayed again. Je suis un médecin français. Still no sign of understanding in the wide, frightened gaze. He paused a moment, his little round blue eyes narrowed in concentrated thought then launched forth a series of queer-sounding sing-song words, which reminded me of gibberish with which Chinese laundrymen address each other. Instant recognition shone in her dark eyes, and she answered in a torrent of droning, oddly inflected phrases. He motioned me forward, still conversing in the outlandish dialect, and together we approached the bed, turned down the coverlet, and bent to examine her. Like most modern young women, she wore as her sole undergarment above the waist a knitted silk bandeau about her bosoms, and as she had dressed only in her lingerie when the curious illness overtook her, we had no difficulty in observing the lash marks across her cream satin shoulders. High, angry-looking wails they were, as though freshly laid on by a heavy whip in the hands of a brutally strong tormentor. Cher Dieu, de Grandin swore then bent to question her again, but stopped abruptly as she stiffened suddenly and gave a short, terrified exclamation, the sort a patient undergoing odontotropy might emit, and under our very eyes there rose across her shoulders another scourge mark, red, echimosed, swollen. It was as if the skin were inflated from beneath, for a mound like a miniature molehill rose as we watched, and the white skin turned bright, blood-sweating red. Again she trembled in our grasp, and again a red and angry welt showed on her shoulders. From scapula to scapula her back showed a wicked crisscross of ugly, livid wails. Quick, mon ami, your hypo and some morphine, if you please, he cried. This will continue intermittently until we must give her surcease of her pain at once. I prepared the mercy-bearing syringe with trembling hands, and drove the needle deep into her quivering arm, then shot the plunger home. And as the opiate took hold upon her tortured nerves, she relaxed from her rigid pose, and sank back slowly on the bed. 
but as she did so another lash track appeared on her shoulder, and now the fragile skin was broken through, and a stain of bright capillary blood spread on the linen bedclothes. Good heavens! What is it? Some obscure form of hemophilia? I asked. Neither obscure nor hemophilia, de Grandin answered grimly. It is devilment, my friend. But devilment we can do nothing to palliate until Costello finds the one we seek. Costello? I echoed in amazement. What has he to do with this poor child's— Everything, pardieu, the Frenchman interrupted. Now, if we do prepare a bandage pack and soak it well with lead water and laudanum, we shall have done all possible until— Until? I prompted, as he ceased speaking and proceeded to prepare the soothing dressing for the girl's lacerated back. "'Until the leaden-footed Costello bestirs himself,' he returned sharply. "'Have I not said it, certainly? Renew the dressing every hour, my friend,' he bade young Hildebrand as we prepared to leave. "'If her attacks return with frequency, administer these codeine tablets, but never more than one in each half-hour. Au revoir. We shall return, and when we do, she will have ceased to suffer. You mean she'll be— Archie choked, then stopped, afraid to name the dread eventuality. By no means, no, de Grandin cheered him. She will survive, mon vieux, nor will she suffer much meantime. But though we do our work away from here, you may be sure that we shall not be idle. As the young man looked at him, bewildered, he added, for ailments such as this, some laboratory work is necessary. Then smiled as a light of understanding broke in the tortured husband's face. The plausible explanation is always best, he murmured, as we entered my car and turned toward home. Have you really an idea what's wrong with her? I asked. It's the strangest case I've ever seen. But yes, my ideas are most certain, he returned. "'although I cannot set them forth in full just now. "'You are perhaps familiar with stigmata.' "'Only indirectly,' I answered. "'I've never seen a case of stigmata, "'but from what I've read I understand it's a physical manifestation "'of a condition of hysteria. "'Aren't certain religious fanatics supposed to work themselves "'into a state of ecstasy "'and then show marks approximating wounds on their hands and feet "'in simulation of the Saviour's crucifixion marks?' Precisément, he agreed with a nod. And hysteria is a condition of psychoneurosis. Normal inhibitions are broken down. The conscious mind is in abeyance. You have doubtless seen in psychological laboratories the hypnotist bid the blood leave the subject's hand, and thereupon have observed the hand in question go corpse pale as the vital fluid gradually receded. Of course, I answered. But what the deuce are you driving at, anyway? I formulate an hypothesis, and on we shall put it to the test, I hope. 5. Sympathetic Magic Detective Sergeant Jeremiah Costello was pacing gloomily back and forth across my study when we returned, a worried look in his blue eyes, a worried frown between his brows, his hands sunk elbow-deep in his trousers' pockets. "'What news, mon brave?' de Grandin asked eagerly as he espied the big Irishman. "'Plenty, sir, such as it is,' the detective returned. "'Mr. Dougal MacDougall's been down to headquarters, raising particular hell with everybody from the commissioner down. "'He's threatening to see the mayor and petition Congress and call out the Marines if we don't find his wife's sister before dark. "'Deet, and have you been successful in the search for the mysterious Oriental gentleman as yet?' "'De Grandin asked. "'No, sir. "'Twas a crack-brained idea you had there, "'if you'll excuse me saying so. "'We'd have no more chance of finding them that way "'than we'd have a meeting up with a needle in a haystack, "'as the fellow says, sir. "'Now, if twas me... "'Triomphe! Victoire! "'Je suis couronné de succès!' "'Inspector Renoir burst into the room, "'his dark eyes fairly blazing with excitement, "'his beard and moustaches bristling electrically. All the way from the prefecture I have run, as fast as a taximeter could carry me. Behold, we have found him. Those peerless realtors, Sullivan, Dorsch, and Durr, have but recently rented a mansion to one Chinese gentleman, 
a fine, large, furnished house with commodious garage attached. He particularly desired a garage, as he possessed an automobile of noble size, in which he drove to the house agent's office, accompanied by a chauffeur and footman, also orientals. Yes, of course, the gentlemen of real estate noticed this particularly, since such customers are of the rarest at their office. In lieu of references, he paid them three months' rent in cash, in golden louis. No, what is it the American gold coin is called? Uh, box? Yes, in golden box he paid one thousand berries, the gendarme at headquarters told me. How much in dollars is a thousand berries, my friend? He turned bright, inquiring eyes upon Costello. To hell with stopping to translate now. Let's get busy and find him, Costello roared. Are you with me, Dr. de Grandin, sir? Cordieu, when was I ever otherwise in such a case, mon vieux? The little Frenchman answered in a perfect fever of excitement. Quick, make haste, my friend. Of Renoir, he asked. And where may one find this so superbly furnished house and garage the Oriental gentleman rented, petit frère? At sixty-eight Hamilton Avenue of the West, the other returned, consulting his black leather pocket-book. Where is friend Costello? He has not yet computed the berries into dollars for me. Sergeant Costello had no time to explain the vagaries of American slang to the excited inspector. With tight-lipped mouth pressed close to the transmitter of my office telephone, he was giving directions to someone at police headquarters in a low and ominously calm voice. Yeah, he murmured. Tear bombs, that's what I said and a couple of choppers, and some fire-axes and riot-guns, and every man with his nightstick. Get me? Okay. Be round here pronto, and if anyone rings the bell or sounds the siren on the way, I'll beat him soft with me own two fists. Get that, too. Come on now, shake a leg. I'm waiting, but I ain't waiting long, see? The early December dark had descended, though the moon was not yet high enough to illuminate the streets as the police car set out for Hamilton Avenue. Obedient to Costello's fiercely whispered injunction, gong and siren were silent, and we slipped through the dusk as silently as a wraith. The house we sought stood well back on a quarter-acre plot of land planted with blue spruce, Japanese maples, and rhododendron. As far as we could see, the place was deserted, for no gleam of light showed anywhere and an atmosphere of that utterly dread silence which seems the peculiar property of tenantless buildings, wrapped it like a blanket. Spooky, Costello declared, as he brought the car to a halt halfway down the block and marshaled his forces. Gilligan, you and Schultz take the back, he ordered. See no one gets out that way, and put the nippers on anyone that tries to make a break. Sullivan, you and Esposito get posted by the front, Take cover behind some bushes, and hit the first head that shows itself out the front door. I'm leaving you the job of seeing no one gets out that way. Norton, cover the garage. No one's to go in there till I give the word. Get it? The men nodded assent, and— All right, he continued. Hornsby, you and Patansky bring the choppers and come with us. Already, gentlemen. He swept Renoir, de Grandin, and me with an inquiring glance. More than ready, mon brave. We are impatient, de Grandin answered. Lead on, we come. From a shoulder holster slung beneath his left armpit, Inspector Renoir drew a French army revolver almost as large as a field gun and spun its cylinder appraisingly. Bien, he murmured. Let us go. The two patrolmen with their vicious little submachine guns fell in on either side of us and we advanced across the lawn at a run. "'I've got the warrant here,' Costello whispered as we paused before the veranda. "'Think I'd better knock, and—' "'By no means,' de Grandin cut in. "'Let us enter at once. "'If our presence is protested, the warrant will give it validity. "'Meantime, there is much value in surprise, "'for each moment of delay threatens death for two unfortunate ladies.' Two women?' Costello asked in wonder. "'How do you figure—' Zit! Action now, my friend! Explanations can wait. Permettez-moi, he added, as Costello drew back to thrust his shoulder at the door. This is better, I think. He felt quickly in his pocket, producing a ring on which half a dozen keys dangled, 
and sinking to his knees began trying first one, then another in the door. The first three trials were failures, but the fourth key sprung the lock, and with a muttered exclamation of satisfaction he swung back the door and motioned us in. Bedad, what an elegant burglar was spoilt when you decided to go straight, Costello commented admiringly as we stepped across the threshold. Thick rugs ate up the sound of our footfalls as we entered the darkened hall, and a blackness almost tangible surrounded us while we paused to take our bearings. Shall I give him a call? the sergeant whispered. Not at all, de Grandin denied. If we advertise our presence, we have assuredly lost what advantage we have thus far gained, and— Somewhere, faint and far away seeming, as though strained through several tight locked doors, there came to us a faint, shrill, eerie note, a piping, quavering cry, like the calling of a screech-owl heard a long way off, and answering it, subtly, like an echo, another wail. Holy mother, what's that? Costello asked. Which way did it come from? From under us, I think, de Grandin answered. And it is devilment of the most devilish sort, my friend. Come, let us hasten. There is no time to waste. We tiptoed down the hall, guided by an occasional flash from Costello's pocket light, crept softly through the kitchen, paused a moment at the basement door to reassure ourselves we followed the right track, then swung the white enameled door back and passed quietly down the stairs. At the turn of the stairway we paused, fairly petrified by the scene below us. Draperies of heavy silk had been hung at all the basement windows, effectively cutting off all tell-tale gleams of light to the outside world. A heavy Chinese rug, gorgeous with tones of blue and gold and deep rust red, was spread upon the floor and at its four corners stood tall vases with perforated tops, through which there slowly drifted writhing gray coils of heavy incense. Robed in yellow, a parody of a man squatted cross-legged in the center of the rug, and it needed no second glance to see he was terribly deformed. One arm was a mere shriveled relic of its former self. One shoulder was a full half-foot higher than the other. His spine was dreadfully contorted, and his round buffer head thrust forward, like that of a vulture contemplating a feast of carrion. His cheeks were sunken, eye sockets so depressed that they appeared mere hollow caverns, and the yellow skin was drawn drum tight over his skull, so that the lips were retracted from the uneven, discolored teeth studding his gums. A very death's head of a face, I thought. But this bizarre, uncanny figure, squatting between the incense pots, was but a stage property of the show. Nude and fainting, a young girl was lashed face forward to a pillar in the floor. Her feet were raised a foot or more above the cement, and round the pillar and her ankles was passed turn after turn of finely knit silken cord, knotting her immovably to the beam, and forcing her entire weight upon the thongs which bit so cruelly into her white and shrinking flesh. Her arms were drawn around the post, the wrists crossed and tied at the farther side, but this did little to relieve the strain upon the cords encircling her ankles. As we came to pause at the turning of the stairs, a short and slender brown-skinned man, clad in a sort of apron of yellow silk, but otherwise quite naked, stepped forward from the shadows, raised his right hand, and swung a scourge of plaited leather mercilessly, dragging the lash diagonally across the girl's defenseless back. She screamed and trembled, and drew herself convulsively closer to the post to which she was bound, as though she sought to gain protection from her tormentor by forcing her body into the very substance of the pillar. And at her trembling scream... The seated monstrosity laughed silently, and from her other side another yellow-aproned man stepped forth and struck her with a leather lash, and as she screamed again a third attendant who squatted on the floor lifted a reed flute to his lips, and with the cunning fidelity of a phonograph mocked her agonized cry with a trilling, quavering note. As such things will flash through the mind unbidden in times of stress, 
I could not help comparing her despairing cry and the mockery of the flute to that composition called Le Roitelet, in which a coloratura soprano sings a series of runs, trills, and diversions, while a flute accompaniment blends so perfectly with the voice that the listener could hardly say which is human note and which the note of woodwind instrument. But my random thought was quickly dissipated by de Grandin's sharp whisper to Renoir. The one at the right for you, the other one for me, my friend. Their weapons spoke in unison, and once again the noises harmonized, for the deep roar of Renoir's revolver was complemented by the spiteful, whip-like crack of de Grandin's automatic as a tenor complements a bass, and the two whip-wielding torturers pitched forward on the gorgeous rug, as though an unseen giant had pushed them from behind. The flutist half rose from his seat on the floor, but crumpled impotently in the grasp of one of the policemen, while Inspector Renoir fairly hurled himself upon the deformed man and bore him backward. Ah, ah, you pig swine, I have you now, he cried exultantly. You would kill my men and mock the laws of France, and run off to the temple and think you hid successfully from me. You would follow those escaping lovers to America, and put snakes and spiders where they could bite me to death, eh? You would torture this poor one here, until she screamed for mercy, while your so detestable musician made mockery of her suffering. Very well. You have had your laugh. Now comes mine, Pablo. I think my laugh is best. He rose, dragging the other with him, and we saw the gleam of steel upon the cripple's wrists. Sun Apoi, he announced formally. I arrest you for willful murder, for sedition and subordination of sedition, and for stirring up rebellion against the Republic of France. He is your prisoner, Sergeant, he added to Costello. Look well to him, and on tomorrow morning I shall begin the extradition proceedings. Costello nodded curtly. Take him out, Hornsby he ordered, with a gesture towards Son and the other prisoner. Tell Sullivan and Esposito to ring for the van and run them down to headquarters, and call the other boys in. We're going through this joint. He motioned to the other patrolmen to precede him up the stairs, then turned to us. Anything I can do, gentlemen? he asked, and I realized the innate delicacy of the man as I noticed how he conscientiously kept his glance averted from the nude, limp form which de Grandin cut down from the pillar of torture. "'I think not,' the little Frenchman answered, looking up from his task with a quick, friendly smile. "'We will join you upstairs anon, mon brave.' Together we bent above the unconscious girl. Her white back showed a latticework of crossed whip-welts, and in several places the skin had ruptured, letting out the blood where the lash-marks crossed. At de Grandin's mute command I gathered her in my arms and bore her up the stairs to a bedroom, laid her under the covers, then went to help him search the bathroom for boric acid. It is not much use, he admitted, as we applied the powder to her ugly-looking bruises, but it must do till we can secure opium wash at your house, my friend. Headed by Costello and Renoir, the police searched the house from foundation to ridgepole, but no sign of other occupants could be found, and the sergeant went to the telephone to tell the city morgue of the bodies lying in the basement. "'Will you be after coming along now, sirs?' he asked, halting in the doorway to the room where we treated Avis Brindell's hurts. "'But certainly,' de Grandin agreed, taking a blanket from the bed and wrapping the girl in it. "'Will you set us down at Dr. Trowbridge's, please? We must give this poor one further attention.' With the girl's injured back well rubbed with soothing medicine and carefully bandaged, a powerful hypnotic administered to assure her several hours' restful sleep, de Grandin and I joined Costello and Renoir in the study. "'She will do nicely,' he pronounced. "'By tomorrow morning the hurt will have vanished from her bruises. Christmas night she will assuredly be able to attend her sister's dinner party.' though it will be some time before she may again wear décolleté gowns without some slight embarrassment. However, he raised eyebrows and shoulders in an expressive shrug, things might have been much worse, n'est-ce pas? Sergeant, mon brave camarade, he looked affectionately at Costello, 
I would suggest you telephone Monsieur and Madame MacDougall and tell them the lost lady has been found. He helped himself to a cigar and smoked in thoughtful silence while the big Irishman went to make his report. She much resembles her so charming sister, this Madame Avis, does she not? He asked apropos of nothing, as Detective Sergeant Costello rejoined us. Yes, I agreed. The resemblance is remarkable. Indeed, I never recall seeing three women looking more alike than— Precisément, he interrupted. It is there the explanation lies. When first the possibilities of this case appealed to me was when Inspector Renoir told Madame MacDougall that this Thiba, the missing temple dancer, resembled her, he added. Remember, friend Trowbridge, Madame's nerves were all on edge last night because a strange man, a skull-faced Oriental, had accosted her in the streets of Harrisonville? That are outrageous, I told me. But I thought no more about it, until the good Renoir pops up like a jack-in-the-box from Cambodia and tells us this story of the runaways from the Angkor Temple. When he informs Madame MacDougall that the missing Thiba resembles her, something goes Click in this so clever brain of mine. I begin to foresee complications. I also damn suspect why this Oriental with a face like a skeleton's has taken special note of a strange lady in an American city. Yes, Jules de Grandin is like that. Now, as you know, I too have sojourned in Cambodia. The secrets of that land are not strange to me, by no means. Of the ways of her people I have inquired deeply, and this I have learned. Should a slave run off from those who own him, or a lady leave her lawful wedded spouse, or the man who claims her without the benefit of clergy, for that matter, the deserted one will seek to find the fugitive. But if he cannot do so, he will resort to sympathetic magic to compel the runaway's return. You know how in the ancient days, and more recent times, too, the wizards and the witches were wont to make a waxen image of one whom they desired to be rid of, then place the figurine before the fire so it would slowly melt, and as it melted the original would slowly pine away and die? Of course. Occasionally they would vary their technique by thrusting pins through the image in a vital spot. And as they did so, the poor unfortunate whose effigy the image was, was seized with insupportable pains in the same region as that through which the pin was thrust. It does sound childish, I admit, he told us with a smile. But magic is a most real thing, especially if it be believed in, and there is quite reliable evidence that deaths have actually been caused thus. Now, the Cambodians have a somewhat similar practice, though it entails double suffering. They procure some person who bears a real or fancied resemblance to the runaway, and thereupon they treat him most discourteously. Sometimes they beat the substitute. That is the usual manner of beginning. If that mild treatment fails, they progress to branding with white-hot irons, to cutting off fingers and toes, hands and feet, ears, nose, breast and tongue, with dull knives. Then comes the interesting process of gouging out the eyes with iron hooks. Finally, complete evisceration, while the unfortunate one still lives and breathes. Preposterous? Not necessarily. I myself have seen Cambodians' hands wither as though with leprosy for no apparent reason. I have seen feet become useless, and seen eyes grow dim and blind. I sought to find some medical explanation, and was told there was none. It was simply that some enemy was working sympathetic magic somewhere at a place unknown, and somewhere another poor unfortunate was undergoing excruciating torture that the hated one might also suffer. Remember, my friends, the Cambodians believe this to be possible, believe it implicitly. That makes a world of difference. So it was with Tiba, she who is now Madame Hildebrand. For all of her short life she had been subject to those monkey-faced priests. She was taught to believe in their fell powers— that they might not be able to do all they claimed had never once been entertained in her thought. Undoubtedly she had seen such cases in the past, had seen unfortunate women tortured that some fugitive might suffer, had seen other unfortunates grow crippled, despair and die, because somewhere an enemy worked magic on them. 
When we heard Mademoiselle Avis had been kidnapped and that she was Madame MacDougall's sister, the reason for the crime at once leaped to my eye. That she bore family resemblance to her sister, who had been said to much resemble Tiba, I made no doubt. What this so amiable Dr. Son would do in the circumstances, I also could assume without great trouble. Therefore we set about finding him, and finding him in haste, lest harm befall his unfortunate, involuntary guest. I was on the point of asking friend Trowbridge to accompany to Monsieur Hildebrand's to interview his bride, when the young man saved me the trouble by appearing so opportunely. Alors, to his house we went. There we beheld his young and pretty wife, and saw the whip-scars take form upon her back, even as we looked. These scars were psychic force, physically manifested, of course, but they were none the less painful for that reason. Also, Mademoiselle Brindel, who served as substitute for her, whom Dr. Sun would have liked to torment in person, was no less tortured, because she suffered through no fault of hers. There is the answer and the explanation, my friends. But, uh, I began, excusez-moi, he broke in, I must inquire after Madame Hildebrand. And she rests easily, he asked, when his connection had been made and Archie had reported favorably. Très bien. Ha, do you tell me so? Excellent, monsieur. I am most happy. Monsieur Archie reports, he told us as he replaced the receiver in the hook, that madame his wife not only rests easily, but that the whip marks have almost entirely disappeared. A miraculously quick cure for bruises such as we observed this afternoon, n'est-ce pas, friend Trowbridge? It certainly is, I agreed. Uh, but, and the day after tomorrow, we dine with monsieur and madame MacDougall. "'And the so charming Mademoiselle Avis,' he interrupted. "'Sergeant, you must go too. "'The party would be dismal without you. "'Me, I devoutly hope they have procured a turkey of noble proportions. "'At present I could eat one as great as an elephant.' "'Again he faced us with one of his quick elfin smiles. "'Sergeant, friend Trowbridge, "'will you be good enough to excuse Inspector Renoir and me "'for the remainder of the evening?' he asked. Come, Renoir, mon petit singe, we must do that which we have not done together since the days of the war. Qu'est-ce que c'est? demanded the inspector. But the anticipatory gleam in his bright dark eyes gave me the cue, even before de Grandin answered. What? You ask me what? What indeed, except to get most vilely and abominably drunk, mon copain? <laughs> 